Any more questions? This hearing will begin momentarily. We're waiting on the arrival of the administration. Was, was the commissioner, the, was that the commissioner? Okay, she's coming. Yeah. The commissioner's coming. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'd like to thank Councilmember Torres, Chair of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations, and other members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings and Oversight and Investigation for joining this oversight hearing on the third party transfer process. The third party transfer program established by local law in 1996 was created in an effort to remedy the widespread problem of landlords abandoning distressed properties and a subsequent burden on the city to take ownership and rehabilitate those properties. The goal of the third party transfer is to target the absolute worst properties and to restore them to well-managed, financially sound buildings. By 1994, the city owned and managed over 5,000 properties, many of which were dilapidated multifamily units requiring costly repairs. Through the third party transfer process, the city would foreclose on properties with outstanding tax liens and subsequently transfer them to third parties who would then complete the rehabilitation. After rehabilitation, tenants would be given either the opportunity to collectively purchase the properties or, alternatively, rent regulated leases. If the property was a shareholder owned HDFC cooperative, the HDFC shareholders would lose their equity and become renters. Any equity held by the property owner would also be lost. The Department of HPD selects properties for TPT that are statutorily distressed meaning that they are subject to tax liens that have a lien to value ratio of 15% and that have an average of five or more hazardous or immediate hazardous violations per dwelling unit or subject to tax liens of $1,000 or more. The process for redeeming a property can be convoluted. During the TPT process, for the time a property is selected for inclusion until four months after a foreclosure judgment has been entered, the owner can pay the full amount of taxes owed or enter into a payment plan. Confusingly, tax liens can include water bills. Payment for outstanding tax bills are paid to the Department of Finance, while water bills are paid to the Department of Environmental Protection. Therefore, homeowners can pay an outstanding tax bill to the Department of Finance without understanding that the unpaid water bill could lead to the foreclosure of their property. Since 1996, the city has completed 10 rounds of TPT. Round 10 in particular was problematic. During this round, the city selected 420 properties, a number of which were in my district, that were worth significantly more than the amounts owed to the city, which were otherwise well-maintained and which did not appear to meet the definition of statutorily distressed. The properties selected for inclusion were primarily located in gentrifying areas of the city, many owned by people of color, where property taxes, and, I mean, where property values had increased many fold from the date of purchase. In one particular egregious case, my constituent, a retired nurse named Norlene Saunders, who owned a well-maintained, fully paid off $2 million brownstone in Crown Heights, had her property transferred from underneath her because she owed DEP $3,792.20 in water bill charges. Ms. Saunders received a notice from the city that her property was in danger of foreclosure, but when she sought assistance from the Department of Finance, she was told to ignore the notice because they believed that it may be a scam. Her son paid the outstanding water bill, but the property was transferred nonetheless. At this afternoon's hearing, we hope to re receive testimony that will shed light on what went wrong during round 10 of the third party transfer program and to prevent future occurrences that will further lead to the displacement of people of color in gentrifying parts of this city. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members today and I'd like to now hear from my colleague and, and chair of oversight and investigations, Chair Richie Torres. 
Thank you, Council Member. Uh, good morning, I'm City Council Member Richie Torres and I chair the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. The third party transfer program, although conceived in 1996, is the product of hard lessons learned from the 1970s. Arson and abandonment back then became so widespread that by 1979, the city of New York had foreclosed upon and taken ownership of 100,000 units of housing. Those in-rem units of housing, so poorly managed and maintained by HPD, fell into ever deeper disrepair. After failing as a landlord, the city in 1996 founded the third party transfer program as an alternative to directly owning and operating in-rem housing. What began as a focused anti-abandonment initiative forged in the aftermath of 1970s New York has become something far more expansive, far more excessive, and far more entangled with America's treacherous history of race and home ownership. In the post-war era when the federal government began subsidizing home ownership on a mass scale, communities of color were left behind. The practice of redlining systematically excluded people of color from honing homes and building wealth that could be passed down from one generation to the next. It is hardly accidental that black and brown wealth are vanishingly rare in America. Nor is it accidental that the racial wealth gap is far wider than the racial income gap. The post-war loss of intergenerational wealth has done communities of color great harm. The consequences have been long and lasting. Both our city and our country continue to be haunted by the specter of redlining. Given this history of racial exclusion from home ownership, we must subject to the strictest scrutiny any public policy that strips away intergener intergenerational black and brown wealth. The cruel irony of the third party transfer program is that a program whose purpose is preservation has come to represent in the minds of many the destruction of home ownership in communities of color. We are here to examine TPT's impact on communities of color, HDFCs, and small family homes like that of Maureen Saunders. Equally important, we will examine in detail the lack of accountability, consistency, and transparency surrounding HPD's process of selecting properties for third party transfer, especially in round 10. TPT can indeed be a powerful tool for rescuing properties from a spiral of debt and disrepair, but it also can be a blunt instrument when applied too broadly and carelessly. The weaponization of TPT against intergenerational black and brown wealth is an outcome that we will not and cannot accept here in the City Council. Not now, not ever, the time for reform is long overdue. I'm gonna take this opportunity to hear directly and get some remarks from uh, public advocate, uh, Jermani Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Jermani Williams, and I have the pleasure of serving as a newly elected public advocate for the city of New York. Before I get into my remarks, just wanna thank uh, Chairs Robert Carnegie Jr. and Richie Torres for calling this hearing. I also wanna thank all of you in the room, committee members and fellow New Yorkers, here to testify for your participation on the most important issue facing New Yorkers' affordable housing. I'm thankful the council has called this hearing to discuss the findings of the investigation to New York City's Department of Housing Preservation Development Third Party Transfer Program. Look forward to discussing the findings and charting the best course of action. Before serving as an elected official, I was a tenant organizer working to improve housing affordability. I know firsthand the monumental challenges associated with finding and keeping a place to live. Just owning a home in Brooklyn today costs over $1 million on average. Very proud of the work we did in succeeding for the Senate to pass the strongest protectors of tenant rights in decades as well. These reforms must extend to our housing programs in the city, specifically TPT. According to HPD, this program was created 20 years ago to preserve quality affordable housing and enforce tax payment. Since it began, however, However, TPT has taken more, over more than 500 buildings made up of more than 6,500 units for mostly female-headed households and senior citizens. In 2018, reports emerged showing that over 60 properties of black and brown homeowners in lower-income neighborhoods had placed in, were placed in TPT, often without the homeowner's knowledge. 
the program has evolved into uh, what appears to be a gentrification scheme that makes equity, takes equity away from the very people the program is intended to help. Because of the method TPT uses to identify distressed clusters of neighborhoods are targeted for potential seizures simultaneously. It has helped catalyze gentrification in areas like Canarsie in East New York, where black and Hispanic New Yorkers have disproportionately lost their homes. New Yorkers deserve a government that fights to keep a roof over their head, not one that benefits from take, taking it away. Nearly two years ago, I introduced legislation to immediately halt TPT and conduct a thorough review and information gathering process. Intro 1315 would impose a two-year moratorium on TPT and require quarterly reporting. Preserving, preserving home ownership in low income, female headed and senior communities of more color is essential to preserving equity and diversity in New York City. Home ownership is one of the most important ways for a family to build and transfer wealth from one generation to the next. A single foreclosure can lead to homelessness and the loss of generations worth of wealth for a family. No family in New York should have to endure this and no family should have their home, take, home ownership taken away. I urge the committees and the council to hold HPD and others accountable to their mandate to preserve and quality affordable housing for every New Yorker, especially including those who need it the most. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, public advocate. Uh, at this time, we're going to ask uh, to hear testimony from uh, Marlene Saunders uh, in, the in the presence of her son, uh, Paul Saunders. If you would just join us at the podium. Uh, so I realize that it's unorthodox to not hear from the administration before testimony, uh, but I think it's important to see and hear uh, from a family who was adversely affected by the third party transfer program um, first. Hello, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, members of the city council. My name is Paul Saunders. I'm the son of Marlene Saunders. I was born and uh, raised in Brooklyn. My dad is over there as well. Um, um, the property has been in our home for about 40 years. So I got involved in this uh, by chance. Uh, normally I, I go down to the Department of, of Finance just to make sure the taxes are current and paid for um, to keep the property out of any types of uh, uh, problems. Um, so actually in, the, in April I went down to double check on the taxes and made a payment that should bring everything current. Um, so I thought everything was fine until about a month or so later I started receiving um, random notices on the door. Um, it was simply like a page that was affixed to the door that said, you know, uh, tenant notice of upcoming building inspection, uh, a chance that you might be in foreclosure. Um, so once I saw that notice, I immediately went back down to the Department of Finance on Geralman, and I went to the rep and I said, look, you know, I received this notice on my door. Uh, here's a receipt of the uh, payment I made for the taxes and tried to see what was going on. Um, Unbeknownst to me, the payment that I made via check uh, was deducted from the checking account, but was never applied to the actual account in the Department of Finance. So there was still a balance that was showing, even though the money was deducted from the account, uh, which we found out to be uh, rather odd. So there was a back and forth process of um, talking to the rep to see what was going on. The email uh, pinged around through different um, members in the uh, Department of Finance just to figure out why the payment has, wasn't accepted. Then they told me about a, um, a in-rem process. Um, and so they said, look, you know, um, contact uh, the water department to see, um, you know, what's going on. You know, we see that your taxes, you know, have been, uh, we see that you've made a payment because of the receipt. Um, so I uh, went to the Department of Water and I said, look, you know, we're at uh, Department of Finance. And they said, to come over here, there might be a, well, not, might be there's uh, potentially a uh, water bill that's old. I said, you know, I'd like to pay it. She said, look, you can make a payment. I said, they're, they're saying that there's uh, a room process of what's going on, but they didn't really know, uh, they didn't really have any details because on the water department's uh, computer, it looked like it was a, a account that had a balance that was in no means of being uh, taken or foreclosed or anything like that. So the computer systems didn't show that there was anything that was a problem. Um, so. Fast forward a little bit after that, uh, going to both departments, um, everything kind of really um, culminated after speaking to um, uh, HPD because I wanted to figure out what was happening next. So uh, I spoke to HPD about the problem and they said, look, you know, we see that there's no um, particular issue with your property taxes, but check on your water. 
So uh, then again, there was no data if you have to check by a certain day or time or this is what can happen to you. They said, just check the water. So once uh, DEP uh, told me that there was no problems, that I was just planning to make normal payments just to uh, is, uh, extinguish the debt to the Department of Water. Um, so around uh, September, I believe around September 5th, I wound up seeing a notice on the door that said that, you know, notice to residents of the property, the building has been transferred and the new property manager is uh, Bridge Street and there's a document that literally was affixed to the door and it even looked like official, it looked fake. So once again, I went back to um, the department. I said, look, you know, this, this is the notice that I received and like they really had no clue about TBT. So I had to do my own investigating about the TBT program, uh, which was labeled on the note. And it basically stated that um, there was very limited information on, the, on New York City's website about TPT or the process. You couldn't discover anything. And then literally the only thing that I found was just a simple, um, a simple one page of a few sentences that said, you know, HPD's third party transfer program um, designates, uh, designates qualified sponsors to purchase and re rehabilitate distressed vacant and occupied multifamily properties in order to improve and preserve housing affordable to low to moderate income households. It was a very broad statement and I was just curious of why the property actually got into the program. I had no notice before. Um, the property hasn't been, it's not distressed, it's well maintained. Everything is current. Um, we've had uh, no formal complaints. Uh, for over 30 years. Um, so literally, like, nothing's happened over the time. So we were just really curious about the process of the property going into this third-party transfer program. So during that time, my mother and my dad were stressed. I mean, my mother's heart pressure. We went to the doctor's office. I mean, literally, like, the thought of just losing a house for, you know, a, a, a water bill of r roughly $3,000 was just, like, something that was just, I mean, the state of depression and the state of list, like, physical like harm that put my parents in was really devastating to me. So during that time, we, we just really tried to mobilize. We, we went to our council member's office, went to Councilman Carnegie's office to say, look, this is what's happening. And then literally it was like a whirlwind of approach. Like, I think that um, one of the issues I have with the program is that it, it feels like it targets uh, elders. And if my mom didn't have me around to actually do the work to go to HPD or go to DEP or send an email. Oh, you actually have the email trail of the communication with HPD. Just to understand email, to understand how to use technology to be a, to be a, in a support system, it would be very difficult for mostly any senior that has to deal with this program or the process or even trying to retrieve it. Um, the energy that it took just to even be able to take time off from work to actually go through this process. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't even be able to have that luxury to take the time to fight or to gather support. So through, um, my mom has been a nurse for years and like sh to me it would be the last person that it can, it can happen to just because of just being diligent and trying to take care of things. But yeah, we, you know, we fell behind on the water but we never thought that you know, this process would ever happen because of the lack of information. Um, the other thing that was so interesting was that um, no one really knew what TPT was. Like in many offices, like there was a scarce meaning of it or like an understanding and the guidelines seemed like it was, you know, it didn't really have a precise guideline or, or rules of saying this will, can, this will qualify, this will doesn't, um, and what's the pros, like it was, a, it was so scarce, I really had a problem identifying why this property fell into the program in the first place. Um, what I think many people in this uh, room have as well. Um, excuse my voice, I feel like I'm cracking a little bit, sorry. Uh, it's my first time being in this. Uh, <laughs> Being here, is this called the chambers? All right. Okay, being in the chambers. Oh, sorry. Um, the other thing that I discovered um, when we uh, spoke to the attorney was that uh, when she looked at the the houses that was in this program, it seemed like most of the houses were like hyper focused on like communities of color, and just it seemed like it was hyper focused on elders. And that that was I, I, I don't know why, but it just the actual, if you dotted it out and put it on like a, a map, and it seems like there were certain neighborhoods that were really hyper-focused, and that was another concern to myself, and just understanding like my neighbors, like a lot of my neighbors next to the left and the right of me are all over 65, and most of the people that are on the block are like way over, they're, they're, they're seniors. Um, so I can, I can see this potentially happening to more people that really need to have um, proper notification. I think that 
there's um, just seeing at my at my mom's place, you get a lot of spam mail that says, you know, credit this, credit that, or um, we're looking to buy your home. We must get a letter a day about someone looking to buy your home. So and it's on generic uh, papers, and sometimes it's pasted to the door. So I think that the notification of the of this program or this process is is really not helpful to seniors who are very skeptical or very. I mean, I'm skeptical, and I, and I read the documents. So, like, it's it's very hard for them to to understand what's happening. I think the communication process has been has been off in terms of how to communicate proper documents to seniors and how to make sure that they're well informed or how to how to really reach them. Um, even though my mom had me, it was still difficult for us to really get this uh, problem to light. And I think the uh, some of the press has picked it up as well as the other uh, political leaders, Mr. Caldwell, as well, that's actually pushed to make this a, a topic of interest for everyone. But I mean, a lot of people have lost their homes and I will be so sad to see more people lose their homes. I mean, especially what my parents have worked hard for. Over 40 years, they, they purchased that home and they went through the trials and tribulations. I remember as a kid, not even being able to walk safely down that block and then to maintain something for all these years and decades to get to the point that it's flourishing and the neighborhood is prosperous and things are happening that you know people that have been here for the long haul should be able to uh, maintain that 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 cherished place of home as well as that asset to even pass on to future generations and to help the community thrive um, thank you so much and um, I just want this thing repealed you know it needs so, to be gone so Paul I want to thank you for your testimony I think that it was important to be able to put uh, to set the tone of the hearing by putting a name and a face and a circumstance to what we're going to explore here today um, I know your father's here. Uh, please tell your mother um, that we are working diligently. And I want to thank your family for a while. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you guys have received your deed back. Yes. And, you're, and you're out of uh, harm's way. But to continue to beat the drum for other people who may find themselves in this circumstance, I think is admirable uh, to both yourself and your family. So I want, I want to thank you not only for your testimony, but for continuing to fight to make sure that other people who find themselves in the same circumstance as your mom and dad uh, have a voice. Uh, and so, so thank you so much. Your, your, your mother is a tremendous advocate within the community, and you would think, like you said, that this wouldn't happen uh, to her in particular. Uh, yeah. But I, I want to thank you for uh, continuing to fight to make sure that other people are at least aware of what could potentially happen uh, in certain circumstances. Thank uh, you for your testimony. Thank you. I'm happy to have the, the deed back, and thank you to the councilman. Uh, Steve Witt, as well as everyone that's helped you, Mr. Caldwell. But we're happy to say we got it back, and we want others to get theirs back as well, because it's a very terrifying experience. Thank you. I have a few, just a quick few questions. Um, how long has the home been in your family? Uh, over 30 years. Over 30 years. Um, what's the, do you know the market value of your home? Um, two million or better, probably now, compar comparable sales on, a, on the block. And, and if I understood your testimony correctly, were it not for you, your mother would have lost Absolutely. She would not have the energy, I mean, to, to fight. Absolutely not. Thank you. Thanks. So at this time, we're going to ask the administration um, to be seated. Hmm? Uh, once you've been seated, we're going to ask you to be sworn in. If you could ad identify yourself for the record. Um, while you're taking your seat, um, I do want to just make a, a brief statement. You know, um, uh, for me, I feel like I've worked diligently with HPD uh, to give it latitude or the latitude it needed to explain itself. And I've wanted to provide a space for an impartial hearing. Um, given the facts, though, it's very difficult for me to stay uh, in that space. Some of these cases are so egregious, like the one we heard earlier, that it, that is very difficult uh, to remain tempered um, when the focus primarily has been in Brooklyn, in particular, in my district, which has the lion's share of third-party transfer in Northern Crown Heights, in particular. Um, so I am going to attempt, for the record, uh, to be, remain impartial, but it is incredibly difficult watching uh, the transfer, the potential transfer for wealth in communities of color, in particular, uh, the last bastion of black home ownership, uh, black political power, black ecumenical power, black entrepreneurship 
in the city uh, and the potential for the city to actually be culpable uh, potentially in removing some of that um, makes it difficult for me as the chair uh, to remain silent. So I'm going to ask you at this time to identify yourselves for the record and be sworn in, please. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie, Chair Torres, and other council members. My name is Louise Carroll, and I am the Commissioner of Housing Preservation and Development. And with me are some of my colleagues. Would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Kim Darga. I'm the Associate Commissioner for the Division of Preservation at HPD. And to my left. Lisa Talma. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Property Disposition and Finance. My name is Jeffrey Shear. I'm with the Department of Finance. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Treasury and Payment Services. Can you put your right hands up? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to the council member questions? Yes, yes. I, I do. do. Great. You, can, you can begin testimony at any time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie, Chair Torres, and members of the Council's Committee on Oversight and Investigations and Housing and Buildings. My name is Louise Carroll, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, better known as HPD. I'm joined by our Deputy Commissioner for Asset and Property Management, Anne-Marie Hendrickson, our Associate Commissioner for Preservation, Kim Daga, and Assistant Commissioner for Property Disposition and Finance, Lisa Thoma. Thank you for the invitation to testify on the City's Third Party Transfer Program, also known as TPT. I'd also like to thank Paul Saunders and his family for testifying and um, for giving their perspective on this program. The de Blasio administration has spent five years marshalling resources to build and preserve affordable housing across the city. And we have spent time and effort to increase enforcement and other protections to keep residents in their homes. We believe that anyone who wants to raise a family and work in the city should be able to live here. TPT plays a key role in this broader strategy by keeping people in their homes with rents that are affordable to them and providing improvements and improving conditions in tax delinquent properties at risk of unsafe conditions, eviction, or predatory loans. The third party transfer program was enacted in 1996 by the city council to collect municipal taxes and other charges while providing a mechanism to address the conditions in troubled residential properties with the goal of stabilizing their physical and financial health and keeping them safe, habitable, and affordable for residents. As you may know, the city conducts a tax lien sale each year, but by law, not all properties with arrears can be included. TPT has been focused on collecting taxes and preserving residential properties that were either excluded from the tax lien sale or those with signs of crisis. Eligible arrears to the city include outstanding residential and commercial property taxes with the Dep Department of Finance, water and sewer charges to the Department of Environmental Protection, or outstanding bills when HPD, through our emergency repair program or other programs, step in to address immediately hazardous conditions that put residents at risk. While, while a primary goal of TPT is for owners to either pay their taxes or enter into a full payment plan, we're able to assist most of the properties in the most recent round of TPT to do just that. But failure to do so ultimately results in foreclosure. The city has a fiscal responsibility to collect taxes. These taxes support critical city services for all properties. In TPT, unlike in REM foreclosure or foreclosures that can follow a lien sale, where residents can be displaced, properties are transferred to a third party, mission-driven affordable housing developer and residents remain in their homes with affordability and rent stabilization protections. Rent stabilization is one of the strongest tools we have to protect tenants, ensuring that residents currently in the building have the option to remain for as long as they want at rents that are affordable to them. And happily, such protections stand 
now to be more meaningful than they have ever been since the inception of the rent stabilization program, given the incredible reforms from Albany that last month that finally put the law on the side of tenants. The New York State Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019 will close loopholes that allow high rent increases end vacancy and luxury decontrol, and end the vacancy bonus, ensuring that tenants won't have to fight next year for another four years, um, f next year in another four years by making the law permanent. HPD has spent years fighting for these reforms, and we join New York City tenants and advocates in celebrating this historic legislation. For decades, TPT has been viewed as a critical tool to stabilize properties, improve housing conditions, protect tenants, and ultimately return properties to the tax rolls. Since TPT's inception, more than 6,000 homes in appro approximately 520 buildings have been rehabilitated, resulting in improved housing quality and greater stability for roughly 15,000 residents. Today, I would like to clarify a few points to clear up misinformation and misperceptions about TPT that we've become aware of in recent months. First, the issue of property selection. TPT does not target any specific neighborhood or community. It selects properties through a thoughtful process grounded in local law and focused on tax enforcement and rehabilitation for residential properties with municipal arrears. Knowing that HPD is mandated by law to include whole blocks, we look at blocks with single or multiple properties owing some of the highest amounts of money to the city, or that were included in our special enforcement program for poor living conditions. Ultimately, HPD focuses on multifamily buildings that would most benefit from city investment if they were unable or unwilling to address their rares. This is in line with our wider goal of housing and neighborhood stabilization. And in fact, most of the buildings with low amounts of tax arrears that were included in the in-rem action paid their debt and got out of the round, some almost immediately. On average, properties that were ultimately transferred had more than 800,000 in unpaid taxes and more than eight hazardous or immediately hazardous violations per unit. Many of these properties had additional indicators, indicators of physical issues. Five of the properties had been in HPD's alternative enforcement program for extensive code violations and HPD required work. And nine were in the 7A management requiring a court appointed administrator due to conditions that were dangerous to the resident's life, health, and safety. When the buildings transferred and a neighborhood restore was able to evaluate the full scope of conditions, they found a range of significant issues such as no heat or gas, compromised structures, illegal subdivision, and squatting. Second is the issue of notice. Owners of properties receive semi-annual or quarterly statements from DOF regarding property tax liens, as well as a minimum of annual statements and repeated robocalls from DEP. Information about property violations and outstanding emergency repair charges are always online. To enter TPT, owners must have outstanding arrears for a minimum of three years, or in the case of certain properties with four or more units, one year. By the time the last TPT round began in 2015, owners already had at least one year of notices of outstanding liens and ample opportunity to resolve their outstanding bills. Upon the launch of round 10, the city communicated with owners through a combination of mailings, calls, flyering, in many cases reaching out approximately 70 times from the 2015 to 2018 three-year period. HPD invited owners to property owner clinics to explain in depth the many resources available and offered eligible buildings the opportunity to apply for retroactive tax exemptions. We also work closely with local council members on numerous occasions throughout the process, 
briefing them about properties facing foreclosure in their districts, and encouraging them to assist in outreach to buildings to urge them to apply for tax exemptions and take other available steps to address arrears. These efforts worked. A majority of the 420 properties included in the last TPT round successfully responded and were removed from the foreclosure action, resulting in the collection of approximately $40 million in outstanding arrears thus far. For the remaining properties that were unwilling or unable to do so, that was not stayed from transfer by active litigation or bankruptcy proceedings prior to transfer, and were not removed from the round via local law, ownership was transferred to a not-for-profit intermediary, Neighborhood Restore. All transfers were reviewed by the City Council, which had the opportunity to disapprove. Owners will ownership will ultimately pass to local community-based affordable housing developers, many of which are long-standing not-for-profits, committed to serving their residents, and were previously selected through a request for qualifications. No property was transferred without review of the existing arrears, unaddressed violations, and or unaddressed violations, and without giving individual council members an opportunity to weigh in. Contrary to some news, none of the 62 properties that remain transferred were single family homes. However, while many of the buildings in the recent TPT round were rentals, often with negligent landlords, there were also numerous affordable housing cooperatives called HDFC co-ops. The HDFC co-ops that transferred in the most recent round, owed a recent round of TPT, owed $30.4 million, more than half of the total funds owed across all properties that were transferred. HDFC corps are excluded from the tax lien sale, leaving TPT the only tax enforcement mechanism for those in arrears. While HDFCs are critical home ownership opportunities, many such buildings did not function as genuine co-ops, often leasing units to tenants without rent stabilization, without regula regulated oversight of rent increases or other protections. 12 of the 25 HDFC co-ops that transferred, either all or most units were rental units. These residents deserve to live in quality housing as well. However, due to poor governance and neglect, many units remained vacant or in disrepair, and several co-op buildings were party to ongoing housing court litigation for lack of heat, water, gas, or other critical services. Significant municipal arrears or or significant, um, significant municipal arrears or significant rehabilitation needs left these HDFCs vulnerable to predatory lenders. This administration recognizes the importance of home ownership for the stability of families and neighborhoods and for the ability to grow equity that can be passed on to future generations. That is why, through Housing New York, we financed almost 23,000 affordable home ownership opportunities. We have also created new programs like Landlord's Ambassadors to offer technical assistance and emergency loans to small building owners. And we also partnered in the Home Ownership Help Desk to assist with foreclosure prevention, guidance on scam avoidance, and advice on home repair and other programs like weatherization loans. And this summer, we are pleased that we are launching Home Fix, a program to provide low-cost loans to struggling homeowners. These efforts are just a fraction of many, wide-ranging opportunities that, provides, that HPD uses to provide support for home ownership. All of the preceding not outstanding. The city has changed dramatically since the program was created more than 20 years ago, and it's time to take a fresh look. That is why we are now launching a working group in partnership with the council that includes a wide range of stakeholders to recommend changes to address concerns and further refine the program. We recognize that there have been concerns about the process and are prepared to revisit the eligibility and selection criteria. We're prepared to look at the type and the frequency of outreach and the resources and support that we offer owners. 
there's always room for improvement, and we're committed to making the process as transparent and effective as possible, and doing all we can to help own homeowners avoid the spiral of financial and physical problems that put their properties at risk in the first place. But ending TPT outright, or allowing buildings with bad management to retain ownership would be a disservice to tenants left to suffer the consequences when building owners do not address their property's financial and physical issues and undermine any owners and, and undermine any owner's responsibility to pay their taxes. The best part, part the best path forward for these properties is HPD invention through TPT which will ensure needed renovations are made for the safety of tenants and that affordability is guaranteed through rent stabilization and other regulatory protections. We would be abdicating our responsibilities if we didn't intervene in buildings falling into financial and physical trouble. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss the importance of TPT. I look forward to answering any questions you have at this time. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we're going to begin with uh, questions from my colleague, but I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Council Member Yeager, Cabrera, Jonai Powers, Lewis, Amphrey Samuel, Espinal Kalos, Chin Perkins, Ayella, Rivera, and Council Member Traeger. Waiting for the PowerPoint. Commissioner, thank you for your testimony. Um, just for the record, I'm, I'm in favor of reforming rather than abolishing TPT, but I suspect we have a disagreement about the best path forward. I, I, ha I see the value in TPT, but I have concerns about the breadth of HPD's authority under the third party transfer program. It seems to me HPD's authority to select properties for third party transfer is so broad that it can easily lend itself to an abuse of power. And for evidence, I would have you look no further than HPD's selection of properties in round 10 of third party transfer. I want to call your attention to exhibit two. In April 2018, uh, the associate commissioner said the following quote, TPT is specifically geared toward the city's most distressed properties. Even though HPD claims TPT specifically targets distressed properties, the selection of properties in round 10 appears to tell a fundamentally different story. Uh, exhibit 3A, in round 10, HPD selected 420 properties for third party transfer. The City Council's Oversight and Investigations Unit found that out of 420 properties, 210 of them had no financial distress. The legal threshold for financial distress is a 15% lean to value ratio. Those 210 properties had on average a 3% lean to value ratio. Exhibit 4A, the City Council's Oversight and Investigations Unit found that out of 420 properties, 155 of them appear to have neither financial nor physical distress. One legal threshold for physical distress is five B or C violations per unit. Those 155 properties had on average 1.05 B or C violations per unit. Now, Commissioner, a, a case could be made that third party transfer represents a uniquely draconian form of government seizure. Right? Under eminent domain, a property owner is entitled to just compensation. Under a standard foreclosure, a property owner is entitled to a share of the proceeds from a sale of the property. But under third party transfer, a property owner is for all intents and purposes entitled to nothing. Property owners can be fully divested of all the equity in their property. Exhibit 3B, the Council's Oversight and Investigations Unit did an analysis of the 200 and selected properties without distress in Route 10. Those properties ha have a market value of $152 million versus $4.6 million in tax arrears. So HPD claims to have the authority to divest New Yorkers of $152 million in equity based on $4.6 million in tax arrears. So my question is, does the divestment of $152 million in equity strike you as a proportional response to $4.6 million in tax arrears? Thank you for your question, council member. Um, so there, there are a lot of things here. <laughs> so, um, 
Notwithstanding what may have been said by one of my colleagues, I'd like to clarify the criteria for entering TPT. Um, the council passed this law in 1996. The law states that to enter the TPT program, a class two property has to owe $1,000 for over a year, for a year or more, and a class one property, $1,000 for three years or more. Um, that in, and in that is included properties that are not subject to the tax lien sale list, which HDFC co-ops are among them. Um, in addition, so the requirement for entering the TPT program has nothing to do with statutory distress. The, the, the two requirements for the program is owing the city arrears for the period of time that I just stated. In addition to that, Properties that are statutorily distressed are not subject to the tax lien sale list. So when, so when, we, when we select properties for the round, we, the, the criteria is that we look at the basic TPT criteria, and then we look at properties that are not subject to the tax lien sale list. So these are two different um, buckets that we put in the TPT round, but the TPT law itself does not deal with statutory distress. One of the things that happens is if a property enters the tax lien sale list, it can be sold to a third party. And um, however much you owe, that makes you subject to that requirement. And that third party can foreclose on that property. And the prop if the property owner is not able to pay that third, property, third party, they lose their property immediately. What we do in TPT is that we look at the 90-day tax lien sale list and we look at the properties that have the highest amounts owed to the city. Then we look at properties that are also statutory distressed. So we go to our 7A program, our AEP program, and we select those properties. Only once we select those properties in concert with DEP and DOF, um, we now ask DOF to go and pull these properties so that we can assist them to stabilize. But what happens is when, when we're looking at these properties that, that we feel has the most arrears and, and, is, and is in our 7A program, our AEP program, the law tells us you can't just take these properties. The law tells us that you must go back and pull every property on the block that meets the minimum requirements for TPT. Again, those minimum requirements are. But I'm, I'm actually asking your opinion as a policy matter. No, no, so I'm just no, saying. I don't. We follow. But my question was about unlike a standard foreclosure, TPT represents the complete divestment of one's equity in one's property. And so I'm asking, in your opinion, as a policy matter, do you think there's proportionality between the complete divestment of $152 million in equity versus? $4.6 million in tax arrears. Does that strike you as I'm proportional? I'm getting there because that's an, an inaccurate um, comparison. I'm getting there because okay. 420 properties entered the round. 62 were transferred. So as a tax collection tool, which is all TPT is, the, the majority of those properties paid their taxes, got out of the round. I, I just feel uh, that, the ones that, Commissioner, that, that is profoundly misleading. HPD has said consistently that the purpose of this program is to target distressed properties. So the council passed the law in 1996, I, and the law says it is a tax exemption tool. Okay. And that so, 62 so properties- Let's explore that claim. So let's explore the various claims that HPD have made about TPT in light of the council's investigative findings. HPD claims, let's go to exhibit seven. HPD claims it has the legal authority to transfer all residential properties in tax arrears for a specific, specified period of time, we found three properties in round 10 that had no tax arrears at all. So the selection of those properties appear to be inconsistent with the law. If, the three, if three of the selected properties had no tax arrears, what was the legal basis for selecting these properties for third party transfer? So again, I cannot account for what my colleagues might have said, but the law says I'm not, arrears, it's not, no, no, if you, not tax you, arrears, you selected, arrears. You selected three properties that, that, that had no arrears at all. So what was the legal basis? What could have been the legal basis for selecting those properties? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the criteria, and I can't speak in particular to these three properties unless I have the details in front of me, but the criteria is any I, arrears. I believe your folder contains the details. I understand, Council Member. My question is, 
um, did these buildings qualify at all for our 7A program? Were they in our AEP program? Um, I, I'd have to come back to you on the particulars if I'm seeing something for the first time. I, I don't think I can answer to it here, but I can always come back let, to you. Let's go to the second claim, go back, because HPD has said repeatedly the purpose of TPT is to target distressed properties. As we noted earlier, 210 of the selected properties had no financial distress, and 155 of them had neither financial nor physical distress. So how can HPD claim that the purpose of the program is to target distressed properties when half of them have no financial distress and a third of them have neither physical nor financial distress? That is inaccurate. TPT is not about financial distress properties. TPT no. is a tax collection pool to, according I, to the I'm law, passed in 1996 Commission, by the your, council. Com your, the policymakers at HPD have repeatedly said that this is a preservation initiative, an anti-abandonment initiative, we target distressed properties. We did not pluck these ideas out of thin air. We're quoting your own policymakers. So, as I said, there are benefits to TPT that include preservation. There are benefits to TPT that include stabilization. But TPT, as a tool, as the law passed in 90, the council passed in 1996, is a tax collection tool. And the basic minimum requirements for entering to TPT are, as I stated, in addition to those basic requirements, we have also looked at properties that have the definition of statutory distress. They're not all one or the other, and sometimes they're both in the round. And just let me stress but You've that. selected properties that have neither, but I, I wanna go to a point that you made earlier. You said that HPD, one of your claims is HPD is legal, and let's go to exhibit nine. HPD is required to select for third party transfer non-distressed properties that are co-located with a distressed property or properties on the same tax block, we found 83 of the selected non-distressed properties had no co-location with a distressed property. And so if 83 of the selected properties had neither distress nor co-location with a distressed property, what is HPD's policy basis for selecting them? What, what, what is the possible basis for threatening these owners with the complete loss of their equity? So the, the law says um, that when a property is selected that meets the criteria, we cannot cherry pick. We must pick every other property on the block that meets the initial criteria, even though they were not the properties we were looking at in the first place. No, but I'm referring to properties that have no co-location with a distressed property. Properties don't need to be statutorily distressed to enter TPT. They must meet the minimum requirement of owing $1,000 or more for either a year or three years. Once the properties are identified that, are, that for, for going into the program, the law requires that we pick everything else up. So even if HPD was looking at, and the other city agencies were really looking at the high, the properties that owed the most to the city. So for example, the 62 properties that were transferred, they owe $800,000 on average to the city and have an average of eight BNC violations. So even if we're looking to pick up those properties, the law says we must pick up every other property on the block that meets the minimum requirements. But of course, we get all those properties out of the round, right? So out of 420 properties, we've got all of these properties out of the round and we're left with the 62 properties that after three years of 300 owner clinics, 70 touch points, offering tax exemption programs and so, other so it programs seems like you're, you're, you're saying that your, your hands are tied with respect that the tax block requirement requires you to sweep up all the properties in, t in a tax block. Absolutely. So are, are you in favor of removing that requirement since it's such a problem for HPD? I'm in favor of looking at the program entirely. I'm no, but specifically the tax block requirement. Absolutely, because, everything's because, on the table. Because there is something arbitrary about targeting a property simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time, simply for being in the wrong tax block at the wrong time. And, 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 and here's the concern I have, and I'm gonna, Councilmember Cornegie is gonna present our findings 
relating to the racial and geographic disparities, right? But if, if you have concerns about the racial and geographic disparities in TPT, the tax block requirement is a multiplier effect. It multiplies the racial and geographic disparate impact of TPT. So it sounds like you're in favor of removing that requirement, if I heard you correctly. So we, everything is on the table. But are you in favor of removing that requirement? I just At this point, Council members, you are part of the working group. No. The law was passed in 1996 no. we, we have by our own the working council. group. It's the legislative process, but I want to know. I are, am, are, we are, are willing are, to discuss. Are you in favor, specifically, of removing the tax block requirement for the purpose of reducing racial and geographic disparities in TPT? We will discuss it all in the group, and as a group, that, we will come out with the right outcome. That, that's unfortunate, Commissioner. Uh, Robert? Thank you, Chair. Um, Commissioner, uh, on this, this idea of racial and ethnicity as being a component or targeted enforcement, which is what it seems like, uh, for round 10, Brooklyn had the most properties at 192, followed by the Bronx at 132. Um, I'd like to yeah, exhibit 10. Uh, and Manhattan had 86. Queens had only 10 properties, and Staten Island had zero. Are there really just 10 distressed properties in the entire borough of, of Queens? And zero properties on Staten Island were selected. Are there no distressed properties on Staten Island? Did you ever consider adding any of the properties on Staten Island that met the criteria? Because I can't imagine that there's no properties that meet the criteria as prescribed earlier. Could you please explain how, how that could not be seen as being, at the very least, racially insensitive. Thank you for that question, Council Member. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to answer. So um, we took out every single family home that came up in the process. So um, I, I can't um, account for what distress there is in Staten Island, but I'd like to say that distress is not the criteria for TPT. So there's no properties in Staten Island that have tax arrears of $1,000 or more? I can account for the numbers in the round, that the properties that we picked up correspond in area to the properties that the highest level of arrears that were owed to the city. Those were the properties we were going towards. The law then says, once you have identified properties that owe the city the most money, then you have to pick up everything on the block. And that's, that was our process. So I feel like I have to caution you that our findings suggest something totally different. And as this hearing goes on, I will be presenting that. So as you speak emphatically about the criteria, I feel as though I should give you a heads up that our, our information doesn't, doesn't correlate to anything that you're saying. And I'm gonna demonstrate that as we go forward. But why were so many properties concentrated in these particular neighborhoods, which are predominantly black and brown communities? So, council member, when we do the selection, we are not looking at racial data. All we are looking at is how much money is owed to the city. When you map these properties in those areas, these are properties that are, have high foreclosure risk. They have the highest number of list pendants, notices of, of foreclosure, and um, suffered greatly in 2008 in the mortgage crisis. So I can tell you categorically, we are not looking at racial data when we are choosing these properties. We are simply looking at the properties that are on the 90-day tax lien sale list and trying to pick the ones, not the ones that are $1,000, as the statute says. We're picking the ones that owe the most. And when we do that, we are forced by the statute to also pick up other properties around them that meet the minimum criteria. I can say that of the properties transferred, there were only 62 out of 420. Those properties owe an average of $800,000 to the city. So I'm gonna just give this some 
historical context. In the 70s, the city, along with the rest of the country, was in a recession, as you've mentioned. Many communities were filled with abandoned, dilapidated buildings, and residents de desperately needed safe, affordable housing. So the city foreclosed on and took over many multifamily buildings that were abandoned by homeowners. Housing Development Fund Corporation co-ops were created by the city so that the city could sell units in some of the buildings it owned to the tenants of those buildings and provide affordable home ownership opportunities to low-income New Yorkers. Residents of these buildings were able to purchase shares in the stock of their buildings at a reduced price in exchange for taking care of those properties, which were generally in awful condition. In the past round of TPD, the city selected 118 HDFCs. That represents a large increase from prior, prior rounds, correct? I'm not able to say, answer this question right now. I'll, I'll have to come back with but well, I can answer it for you. Yes, okay. it's true. In the past round of TPT, I'm sorry, for, from, from my perspective, it seems like the city was targeting the same properties that they once sold to economically vulnerable New Yorkers. So we compared the map, and we can go to Exhibit 14. So we compared, uh, uh, so we compared the map of selected properties for round 10 with the map of HDFCs in New York. These set of properties appear to mirror each other, correct? I mean, you can look at that. They're almost the exact same properties. For example, zero properties, as I mentioned before, were selected in Staten Island, which has zero HDFCs, and only 10 properties were selected in Queens, which has a small number of HDFCs, only one of which was selected for TPT. Did round 10 intentionally focus on HDFCs? So, no, round 10 did not intentionally focus on HDSCs. The city has created about 1,263 HDSCs. Of these HDSCs, only 3% have ever been transferred through TPT. That's 38 properties. Um, so we but it seems like the lion's share of those were in, the ten, in round 10. So while you're right, and the numbers bear that out, there's a disproportionate amount of HDSCs included in, the, in round 10. So my question stands, you know, did, was there a targeted process in HDFCs? No, there was not. There were about 115, 16 HDFCs in this round. 119. And, and 119, if you say, if, uh, if you say so. Of, okay. I will defer to your numbers. Of the ones who've transferred, there are only 25. And those 25 have owe at least $800,000 to the city and have other physical issues. Within those HDFCs, they're primarily renters in those 25 HDFCs, and there are many other living co conditions that are affecting the rent renters in those buildings, including the fact that they, some, a lot of them don't have leases. Were the HDFCs in the neighborhoods that the city considers, were, were these HDFCs in neighborhoods that the city considers blighted and targeted for improvements? I cannot speak to that. That is not a requirement of TPT. So I'm going to, as we move forward, that was actually a part of the website con con, uh, contained until very recently the MREM foreclosure process. This is, this is a, a snapshot from your website that was corrected and blighted was removed very recently from the description. Can you explain to me why blighted was removed very recently? The term blighted was a part of the description. Mm -hmm. So I, I am the Commissioner of Housing Preservation and Development. This is not my website. So I'm, I will turn to my colleagues at DOF because <laughs> the TPT does, is not a program directed towards blighted properties. It is a tax collection program with requirements pursuant to law. The shareholders in these HDFCs are lower income New Yorkers for whom these buildings likely represent their only opportunity at home ownership. Many of these stakeholders put in a substantial amount of time and money to rehabilitate these buildings when the city wanted nothing to do with them. Yet these shareholders stood to lose all of the equity in their apartments that they had accumulated post, post foreclosure, correct? And I know that's correct because my colleague already answered that question in a different form. So you don't have to take time answering that. That is absolutely correct. Was the city at all troubled by the idea of moving home ownership to rentals and losing equity? And we've already understand that in minority communities, one of the only ways 
to build and transfer wealth is through the accumulation of equity and properties. So there was no concern, and I know you're going to tell me what the statute, but we're all human beings. You can tell me what the statute allows, but there was no concern at any point that we would transfer that much equity and or wealth to zero in such a short period of time. And I'm asking as a human being, not as the, what the statute requires, so because these are people's lives. Council member, I absolutely agree. We value home ownership. As I said, of 1,265 HDFCs created, only 32 have ever been, 38 have ever been transferred through TPT. Of the, the 25 HDFC co-ops that are left, um, the lean to value ratio has pretty much wiped out um, equity in those properties. There is about a hundred and an average of 118% lean to value ratio. We're not of 420 properties that enter this round. I'd like to stress that the program has been successful in getting people to pay their taxes, in getting people to fix condition, living conditions that existed in those properties. But do we and really we have, have to hold over left. the head of people foreclosure? in order to get them to pay their taxes? Like that's the only thing that we can do? That's the only way that we can get people to comply with taxes is to threaten them with foreclosure and the loss of all of their equity and hard work? That seems a little bit harsh, quite frankly. So as it took, before this round in 2015, we hadn't had a round since 2000, 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have owed the city at least three years in arrears. In addition, we spent another three years of owner's nights, working with the council, asking for your help to get to properties in your districts to help them pay back. We had um, three, our, our uh, not-for-profit who we hire on an annual basis to provide support to these HDFCs, did about 300 trainings to people in order to get them out of the round. We have done owner's clinics, we've done flyering. Um, you know, I, we spent, three years trying to work with, with folks to get them out of this round. But and at the, we gave Article 11 tax exemptions, which can wipe out all of the taxes. So for an HDFC co-op, foreclosure is not the only answer. At HBD, we give Article 11 tax exemptions with the, which, with the council's approval, which could have wiped out all of the taxes, but we need a willing partner on the other end. And you know, while I apologize for whatever um, miscommunications may have happened with the Saunders family, the people who have been transferred, the 62 properties, did not take advantage of any of the assistance that this administration and this a these agencies here have tried to give them. We spent three years working with these people, and they could have had an Article, tax, article 11 tax exemption, which you would have given them, and they did not take it. So HPD uh, provided a memo, document to the council in 2017, and the memo stated, round, this, is, this is of grave concern to me in particular. Round 10 of the TPT program included about 100 HDFC co-ops. We anticipate that round 11 of TPT will include even more HDC, HDFC co-ops, as if that's even possible. So it seems to be a targeted focus. That, that's, your, that's your memo to us saying that you, you intend for that to increase. So while we're sitting here angry about the number and determining whether or not there was an a, 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 a intended focus on HDFCs, we're, we're ramping up as opposed to even providing more supports for HDFCs. Council member, this is my third month on the job. I assure you, we are, I, I, I No, I, I respect that, I respect yeah, uh -huh. that. I assure you, we are co-chairs of a working group that will look at this program completely, soup to nuts, and figure out what TPT should be for the future. So I, I, um, I'm not going to accept this statement. I did not make this statement, but I assure you as a co-chair of this committee that we are gonna work to figure out what the right criteria should be, what the right process should be, and what the city would like this program to look like going forward. Uh, the last question that I have right now in this particular time before I go back to uh, my co-chair is, uh, is HPD's Office of Asset and Property Management charged with monitoring the physical and financial stability of HDFCs? 
Office of Asset Management, it seems as though suggested in their title, they would have some monitoring of the physical and financial stability of HDFCs, and that seems to be where um, some progress could be made. Is that not the case? Yes, um, that is one of our responsibilities, and, and to assist us in that responsibility, we've also a contract with a not-for-profit, which is supposed to also provide training and counseling on a year-long year basis. Yes, it is one of our responsibilities. Right, so, so that's a little disturbing to me, because um, let me ask you the answer I already know, but how many people staff an office responsible for the large number of HDFCs uh, under your physical, um, your financial and physical stability. How many staff members staff that office? So, um, you know, I, I can turn to uh, my deputy commissioner, but I will say for the TPT program itself, there are 11 staff members. Um, it, that's not all of the staff members in the entire asset and property management program, but for TPT, there is a director, a deputy director, there are about six project managers and two analysts. So I don't, I don't wanna go to fact checking, but to our records and reports, there are only three people working with HDFCs. Not the third party transfer program, but working with HDFCs, there are three staff members assigned uh, for the physical and financial stability of all of the HDFCs, 118 that we just saw, and an increased amount for round 11. Is that true? Council member, I will have to get back to you. So at, at, the, at the very best, according to your testimony, it's 11. Our records show that it's three. In any event, I don't know how you could possibly claim to have done all that you've done in terms of support for HDFCs with that amount of staff. So thank you, council member, for that question because it gives me an opportunity to talk about our programs. So while there may be in asset and property management the number of project managers working on a particular property, um, our office has many programs to assist both rental property owners and homeowners. And in these programs, uh, they're staffed by project managers, assistant commissioners throughout the agency. So there are other resources in our agency once a property is identified in order to work with them. With the TPT round itself, I do want to stress that these 62 properties that of the 420 that did not manage to get out of the program were given the same 70 touch, about 70 touch points that the other properties got. I can say that, you know, um, there are 300 trainings and technical assistance that was provided by our not-for-profit. We had owner's nights, we had calls, um, automated calls to people. We had many, many notices sent from DEP and DOF to property owners. So I, I want to stress that we did a lot of work to get four, most of that 420 properties out and that there are 62 left of the whole round 10. So before I pass um, uh, to my co-chair, you, you, you apologize to Marlene Saunders' family uh, about the miscommunications in them and the aforementioned amount of times that you reached out. It seems more often than not, the cases are like Marlene Saunders in terms of outreach and in terms of communication. We've heard that countless times, even from HDFCs. Now she has a smaller building, which certainly doesn't rise to the level of an HDFC in terms of units. Um, uh, so we've heard everything from reaching out to board members of HDFCs who at addresses that are not that address. So we've uh, actually heard that HPD has done in its round of 70 or so touch points, actually sent correspondence to people who were listed as board members to addresses that were not the address of the HDFC. Is that true? Uh, council member, I appreciate that question. The addresses that we sent notices to are addresses provided to us yeah, but does, wouldn't members. that strike you as a little bit odd if the person is supposed to be a board member and is supposed to be getting a touch point at where their residence is, where they're a, a, a member of that HDFC that you would send it to another address, that would send up a red signal uh, for me or anybody else. So if that's counted as a touch point, that is a point of contention for myself and for other people that you would say, that somebody sitting there wouldn't go, why would we send it there if they're supposed to be there? That doesn't, that doesn't make 
But it the doesn't make much sense. The addresses come from the owner. So we send the addresses. Every, all property owners are required to register with HPD. Um, multiple dwellings are required to register with HPD every year. And we use that information that they provide to us every year in order to contact them. Same with DOF. And um, while I won't speak to everything that happened um, on uh, with the Sanders property, but if, if property owners either don't put the right account on the checks that they submit to the agency or they don't submit the right address to the agencies for correspondence, um, then we will use the addresses or the information that they submit to us in order to interact with them. Thank you. I have a few, few more questions, but I do want to give my colleagues an opportunity to weigh in. Um, as you know, Commissioner, the mayor has a plan to create and preserve 300,000 units of affordable housing over 12 years. Does the transfer of properties through TPT qualify as preservation under the mayor's housing plan? The transfer of properties in TPT um, ends a process of the city collecting taxes for properties that owe taxes to the city. But do you count those units as preservation? Not if a, if a property is simply transferred to neighborhood restore to wipe out the taxes, that, that is just a tax foreclosure. And what if the property undergoes rehab? Do you count it as preservation? If the city provides loans and subsidy to rehab a property, then in fact we are preserving that property. And suppose you had a transfer and a rehab of a conversion of, of an HDFC into a rental, both a transfer and a rehab. Uh, would, would you count that as preservation under the mayor's plan? If the city provides loans or subsidy to any property in order to complete a scope of work and provide rehab, then yes, we are preserving that property and we would count the money that we put towards preserving it as part of the plan. Now, affordable housing also includes affordable home ownership. Yes. And the conversion of an HDFC into a rental means the loss of affordable home ownership. So doesn't it strike you as odd that the destruction of home ownership can be counted as preservation under the mayor's plan? We do not take the loss of home ownership lightly. But you count it as preservation under the mayor's plan. When a, when a building is not able to keep up with its finances and where a building has significant financial and physical issues and the city steps in to provide safe, affordable housing to the tenants that live in that building, then yes, we count that to its up. I, I've never met a homeowner who would experience the loss of their sweat equity as, as, as preservation. Um, C Commissioner, one of my concerns is I've, I've heard a changing narrative about the purpose of TPT. I've heard that it's an anti-preservation initiative or it's a tax collection initiative or it's an anti-abandonment initiative. But I've also heard changing narratives about the criteria. At first, I was told by, by the Associate Commissioner that it was specifically geared toward distressed properties. Then you're telling me that, no, it's about tax collection, $1,000 in tax arrears. But then in a case, Dorse versus City of New York, the city's claiming that we don't need $1,000. Any level of tax arrears justifies TPT. So, so which one is it? Is it $1,000? Is it any level? Is it one cent in tax arrears? There's a lack of clarity about both the purpose and the criteria of the program. Thank you, Council Member, for that question. So the law says arrears owed to the city for a year in some cases or three years or more in other cases. Um, for the the criteria to get on the tax lien sale, which is every other property. So in the city, all properties are required to pay their taxes. You don't pay your taxes, you get on the tax lien sale list, it's sold to a third party, you don't pay that third party, you lost your property. And the criteria for getting on that sale list is $1,000. So while the law doesn't specify, um, we are basically equalizing the tax lien sale list requirement with the TPT requirement. Again, I have to stress, you can lose your property if you don't pay your taxes. You, well, I'm, just, I'm it, curious to know what's your interpretation of your own legal authority. Do you think you have the legal authority to transfer a property that has a dollar in tax arrears? So Is that theoretically possible? The law as passed by the council says arrears. It does not say how much. Okay. Is that something we should change? We should talk about it, council we should member. Change. And <laughs> one, one, one quick question. Obviously, one of the criteria for financial distress is lean to value ratio. Uh, when, you, when you speak of lean to value ratio, is it referring to assessed value or market value? So um, 
I would have to let my colleague from DOF talk about how they do valuations, whether it's assessed or market value. I would assume it's assessed, but DOF? Uh, and before you answer this question, I'm going to caution you as well that going forward, we have evidence of egregious undervalued properties that ultimately were forced into the TPT program. So you're looking at a loan to value on an undervalued property. So I just want to give you a heads up on that before you answer. Okay. Thank you for that. The, we use the, what we would call the DOF market value. So that is the market value that DOF comes up with based upon the constraints of state law, which determines how we can um, determine market value. And so by DOF market value, you mean assessed value? N no, I, I do not mean assessed value. Okay. So you're, I'm confused. What is DO, what's the DOF market value? So DOF is charged with coming up with both uh, a market value for all New York City properties and an assessed value for all New York City properties. Um, state law determines how DOF can come up with the market value. So um, the property division uses sources such as um, comparable sales for um, class one properties or income and expense statements for class two properties um, and formulas to come up with the market value. The market value um, that we can come up with may be less than the market value that you would see listed um, on Zillow or in the market. Can we uh, bring up an example of a property that appears to be undervalued? Yeah, we, we actually were going to that. So exhibit 16, I think we can start that process. But before we get there, I, I do have some, some lead up to that. So Yeah, but I just want to make one point. If 15% if, if lean to value ratio is one of the criteria for financial distress, if HPD undervalues a property, then it makes that property more susceptible to a third party transfer. And, and so that to me speaks to the arbitrariness of the program, that factors beyond your control, like where you're located in a tax block or, H or DOF's undervaluation, could make your properties more susceptible to a third party transfer. Is that, is that kind of arbitrariness a problem for you or? Uh, council member, uh, HPD does not value or assess I'm properties. referring to the city at large. So, so um, again, statutory. And quite frankly, there seems to be some complicitness in this. So you, you're saying that HPD is not responsible and the Department of Finance is responsible, no. but there seems to be uh, a, a, <laughs> like almost a working contingent on these targeted properties in black and brown communities. So thank you, council member, for that. For that um, I'm not blaming my colleagues. I'm just saying that we do not value properties. What we do at HPD is that we look at the tax lien sale list and we look at the properties that are on the 90-day tax lien sale list and we select the properties that owe the city the most money. And because when we select those properties, then by law we're required to pick other properties on the site. TPT is not about statutory of, or financial distress. We also include in the round properties that are in our 7A program and our AEP program and properties that are not eligible for the tax lien sale list. But the, but the basic program is not about financial but, or statutory but I just, distress. Commissioner, and I'll, I'll end it here. You're not transferring every property that has tax arrears, right? You're in theory prioritizing properties that have the most debt and the most distressed. And if you if, if a property has a lean to value ratio of 15% because of an undervaluation by DOF, is that fair in your opinion? Is it fair that that property is more susceptible to TPT, that that owner is more susceptible to a complete loss of their equity because DOF got the valuation wrong? I appreciate your question, Council Member. And I'll leave it so, up there. Um, DOF is following the law when they do their evaluation. I'm asking as a policy matter. I'm not questioning compliance I, with the law. I, 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 but as a policy matter. We're, I, we're, we're trying to reform this program. And so I'm asking if the lean to value ratio is based on an undervaluation, is that fair? That's, uh, but that's, I'm saying that the lean to value ratio, DOF does not do undervaluation. So I, I'd have to accept that my colleagues are undervaluing properties, and I, I cannot accept that. So it's incumbent upon me to demonstrate that, which I'll do in a minute. 
HPD provided us with data showing the values of the property selected for TPT round 10, and these values seem incredibly low. For instance, HPD says that a beautiful brownstone in my wonderful district was valued at $370,000 recently, when I know based on other sales in the neighborhood and comps that this brownstone is more likely worth upwards of $1.5 million. How does the city calculate the value of these properties, which I, I think your colleague attempted to answer, but I'm still confused. The city does not compensate homeowners when properties are foreclosed upon and a part of TPT in any way. I'm sorry, the city does not compensate homeowners whose properties are foreclosed upon as a part of TPT in any way, correct? When the city forecloses for the pay, lack of payment of taxes, no property owner is, is compensated. The lien is sold. Okay. So in other words, the homeowners lose all equity in their property upon foreclosure, right? All properties foreclosed by the city that owe taxes, um, the foreclosure process is that the lien is sold, and if the lien isn't paid, all property owners lose their property. Okay, so this is even when they have millions of dollars of equity in such properties outside of the small amount of taxes owed to the city, correct? In all over the city, if you're on the tax lien sale list, that's what happens to properties. It's about city collection of taxes, and if you don't pay the taxes, the lien is sold, and when the lien is sold, the property is also Even sold. if it's $1,000 and the property is worth $1.5 million? For any property around the city on the tax lien sale list, that is the process. So do you, are you okay with that? Like, as, a, as an agency and as a legislator, I'm sorry, as an agency, and an agency head, are you okay with that? That someone could lose a $1.5 million property, which we saw actually happen, for $1,000, I'm sorry, $3,000, $3,720.20, lose the entire equity, because that home was paid for in full? So all through the city, the legislature makes the law, and throughout the city, any property, and I don't mean the ones that go through TPT. The ones that go through TPT have years of working with us to give them assistance to get out, but for every other property, they do not have that benefit. For every other property that goes on the tax lien sale list, you do not pay that money. The lien is sold, and if the lien is foreclosed on by the, purchase who, the purchaser, people lose their properties throughout the city. TPT actually gives people three years of tradings, loans, exemptions of property. Commissioner, to the city touts, get. the city and the administration touts a healthy pathway to home ownership program and programs. HPD is responsible for those programs. This actually flies in the face of efforts that are being made on the administration's part to provide pathways to home ownership. You know, um, uh, uh, preservation shouldn't only be about rentals. You could preserve these properties very easily with the loan to value ratio that I'm going to demonstrate going forward. Yeah, please. No, I have no question. Just state for the record, Council Finance did an analysis and found that DOF's market value is on average one fifth of the sales price of a property. So, so we've discussed the city's efforts. I I'm sorry, before I go forward, I want to um, apologize to my colleagues who are waiting to, te to, to ask questions. Generally, as the chair, I wait and I allow my, co my colleagues to ask their questions because I know they have other hearings and other things to do. But today it's impossible for me to do that. So I'm asking your indulgence on some very tough questions that I have to ask. Uh, but I promise you very shortly we're going to get to um, questions from my colleagues. We've discussed how the city's efforts in the last TPT round were targeted at 11 concentrated neighborhoods comprised largely of minority families. One neighborhood in my district, Crown Heights North, had 32 properties on the TPT list alone. Do you understand that for many homeowners, equity held in their homes represents their only source of wealth, and that by taking such equity away from them, you're depriving them of the opportunity to pass any of that wealth onto their families? You're Sorry. Council member, I support equity and growth through housing, uh, through home ownership for, for all families, and um, I share your values in that. So why isn't preservation a priority as it relates to home ownership? It is a priority, council member. I can't tell. 
There's a mechanism in place for the return of homeowners. There is a mechanism in place for the return of homeowners equity when facing foreclosure upon TPT, correct? Could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. There is a mechanism in place for the return of homeowners equity when facing foreclosure under third party transfer, correct? I, um, council member. I'll, I'll answer it. The administrative code permits the owner of a property included in TPT who has more equity in their home than the amount of debt owed to the city to ask the court for additional time, one, to pay off their debt, or two, to sell their property in order to raise money to pay off their debt. That's correct. Did any homeowners avail themselves of this opportunity in the past third party transfer round? Yes, they, in, in the past, homeowners have. In, the, in, the, in this last third party round? Um, in round 10, um, just a second. I believe homeowners have done so in this round. I'll have to get those numbers. I would really like to get those numbers. And if so, I'd like to know how many, because there's a very large number. And I want to know what you did to educate third party transfer, um, people in third party transfer about the option of this. Did the Saunders family know that they had an option to do this? Did other families know that they had an option to go and petition the court for extra time to pay off their debt, no matter what the size of the debt was, or to sell their property to satisfy the debt, and then whatever proceeds from that property would still remain in their possession? I really need to know how many people were, were, able, were able to avail themselves of that program and what you did as HPD to notify people in third party transfer that they had that as an option. Because no one that I've talked to recognized that as an option. Thank you, council member, we'll get back to you. Let's now discuss some of the specific properties that were included in the last TPT round, which are also included in your folder. I'd like to go to um, exhibit 16. Data shown on these slides were provided by HPD to the council in March of 2019. Let me show you an example of a property that had zero in arrears. If you look at this particular property, which was grossly undervalued at $439,000 for two unit dwelling, had zero open BNC violations, zero open B BNC violations per unit, and zero DOF and DEP charges, and a lien to value ratio of 0%. Please tell me how this property was transferred under the program. Council member, I don't know which property this is, but of the 60, there are only 62 properties that are transferred. So when we select properties in the round, most properties get out right away um, by either paying or, or um, you know, showing the city why they don't belong in the round. Only 62 properties were actually transferred, and they owe an average of $800,000 a year. This a, is a transfer property. property, though. This is a and I, it wasn't. It was it was a selected property. I'm sorry, okay. and it wasn't transferred, but it was a select. It was on the list to be transferred. Let me let me not ask you every time. Let me just go to slide exhibit 17, which is in my district, Crown Heights, North Brooklyn a market value of $295,000 with nine dwelling units. It doesn't take a realtor to understand that that is grossly undervalued in the most gentrifying area in the city of New York at present. It had two open violations and 0.22 uh, open violations per dwelling unit and a total Department of Finance and DEP charges of $153 a 0.1% lean to value ratio. You don't have to say anything. Exhibit 18, again, Crown Heights North, Brooklyn. Market value $370,000 for seven units in a building. You can't get a one bedroom condo in the borough of Brooklyn, in particular Crown Heights for $370,000. Had nine violations and 1.29 uh, uh, per unit violations and had an open charges of $6,700 at a 1.8% lean to value ratio. Exhibit 19, Crown Heights, North Brooklyn again. 
39 units valued at $1.3 million with eight violations, 0.21 per dwelling unit with an outstanding charges of $2,389. I happen to know for a fact that that property probably will sell for $8 million on the open market. Exhibit 20, Ocean Hill, Brooklyn. Some of my colleagues here from Ocean Hill, Ocean Hill in the building. Here she is, Alika Amphrey Samuels, in your hood. $340,000 for a six unit dwelling building. 13, 13 open violations, 2.17 in, uh, uh, in, in violations per unit, $1,001 in open charges. 0.3% lean to value ratio. And I will just end with, because I don't think there's any necessity for me to go on with this. Exhibit 22, Crown Heights North again. 295, $295,000 uh, in valuation, according to the Department of Finance, nine dwelling units, one open violation, charges owed $1,790, at 0.6% loan to value ratio. So you can see where I'm going with this. These, <laughs> in the interest of time, I won't. I think I've um, uh, set this up pretty well. I'm gonna now pass on back to my colleague, Richie Torres. No, let's go to members. Has deferred to members. The first person, my first colleague who will be asking questions is Councilmember Kalos. Thank oh, before Councilmember Kalos uh, answers, I do want to say that Councilmember Kalos and I started this process many years ago working together on third party transfer, and I'd like to thank him for his continued support and advocacy around these issues, even though he represents Manhattan. <laughs> it's a problem in Manhattan, too. Uh, I want to thank the Housing and Buildings Chair Robert Carnegie for his leadership and partnership on third party transfer. In particular, I want to thank the Black and Latino and Asian Caucus co-chair Idanique Miller and their members for supporting our efforts to take on the third party transfer program as well as the Oversight and Investigations Chair Richie Torres. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our New York State Attorney General Tish James, Public Advocate Jamani Williams, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, Senator Brian Benjamin, Assemblymember Al Taylor, among many other elected officials throughout this state and city who have been calling attention to this issue. I want to thank Commissioner Luis Carroll for testifying today despite only recently starting at HPD. I pre appreciate your taking responsibility for your agency's mistakes. That being said, I'd like to direct my entire line of questioning to Kim Darga, your Associate Commissioner for HPD's Preservation and Finance Programs. Uh, Associate Commissioner Darga, did you appear before the Land Use Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and concessions on third party transfers round 10 in, on August 14th, 2018. Council member, may I interject? Um, as the HPD commissioner, I'm the one who's testifying. I will ask for Kim, Kim Darga's help. Did Kim Darga appear it. before my subcommittee on August 14th, 2018? I assume the answer is yes. Uh, on that day, under oath, did uh, Associate Commissioner Darga say that all the tenants in affected buildings received notices and even could have a uh, say in who was going to manage their buildings? I can't, I can't account for um, what Ms. Darga Associate said. Associate Commissioner D Darga is right there next to you, so it is a good thing that she can answer. Um, I'll let Ms. Darga answer. What was your question, Council Member? Uh, during the hearing, uh, was any concern raised relating to whether or not tenants received notices about the third party transfer program? I don't recall. I remember you asking a lot of questions, but I'm sure I explained that we did a lot of notice prior to transfer taking place. Um, on, in general, it's about 40 different attempts and including flyering buildings so residents knew what was going on and doing pre and post transfer meetings. And at the, so, so I, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Now that we have 2020 hindsight, do you feel that that notice was effective? 
Council Member, um, we believe our notice was effective because there were 420 properties that were selected and only 62 properties are now transferred. These properties have an average um, arrears to the city of $800,000 and about eight BNC violations. So we feel that our ability to get all those properties in and out of the process and paying their taxes and stabilizing is a success. Uh, may, may I have more time to continue? I, I would prefer not to go back to the chair's uh, exhibits, but clearly it, it was not effective. The other question I had during the August hearing was how were the people who were being given these buildings selected? Okay, so um, thank you, Council Member, for that question. The city selects um, not-for-profit owners, um, developers, and for-profit developers that have uh, a presence, a track record, and a presence in the communities where these buildings are through an RFQ process. So it's a request for qualifications. Um, they have to go through a review process, through the mocks through review process, Vendex wants a review, where the city looks at their track record, the buildings they own, and their ability to provide rehab and also maintain these um, properties as affordable housing. Are elected officials able to weigh in on uh, which vendors who are responding uh, can get a specific building? So, you know, the RFQ process is a fair, transparent process, but of course we always take into account council members' experiences with developers and their abilities to um, to perform in your districts. In an analysis, I found that a lot of the larger buildings went to for-profit developers and smaller buildings went to non-profit developers. Uh, did any of those for-profit developers make campaign contributions to uh, elected officials or people involved in city government or overseeing HPD? So, as I said, Council Member, our process is an RFQ process. It's fair and transparent. We do not use criteria such as campaign contributions to select developers. What we do is we select people who have a track record of building and providing safe, affordable housing through a transparent RFQ process. You kept, you've said the word transparent, which is actually my favorite word. Will HPD, right now, will you promise to make the HPD compliance packages w that were submitted as part of round 10 available to the city council and the public at large, the entire HPD compliance package, So, because you're transparent. So council members, um, I will go back to my, my office and see what we can provide by law and what we can't, but I'd like to say that 94% of buildings are uh, owned by not-for-profits in this TPT program. The, the last and final question, I appreciate the indulgence from the chairs. Uh, during the process, I asked why the third party transfer program was necessary in order to give Article 11 tax exemptions, uh, and why not just give the HDFCs themselves directly the Article 11? Why not abate the water bills? It was something that got brought up multiple times. I'll record, reflect there are a lot of people doing jazz hands in the audience. And I know that that happened multiple times in Councilmember Perkins' district. Uh, if somebody is in an HDFC, will you commit to making Article 11 available to them and making it retroactive so that it can go back 40 years and forward 40 years to obliterate all possible tax, uh, taxes that are owed? Council member, that is a brilliant question, and yes, Article 11 tax exemptions are available to all HDFCs, and we have tried throughout this process to get people to apply for these very Article 11 tax exemptions, and the properties that were able to do so did so, and the properties that where we did not have a working partner on the other end were not able to get through the process. But yes, we agree, um, you know, HDFCs can get an Article 11 tax exemption and um, f to, a bit to remove taxes, we cannot get rid of DEP charges through Article 11. I just want to acknowledge we were joined earlier by Councilmember Rosenthal and we were just joined by Councilmember Barron. Uh, in addition to Councilmember Carnegie, one of the council districts most affected is that of Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, who's our next question. 
Thank you so much. I want to commend both of the chairs. I've been in the council for 10 years, and this is one of the most uh, prepared hearings I have ever witnessed. So I commend uh, both of you and the staff. I have to tell you, Commissioner, you know how I feel about this. I am mad and live it, uh, especially to what happened uh, in my district, and in particular uh, to 1600 Nelson. I, I stood here, I sat here for the last two hours uh, listening about prevention. Uh, I have to tell you this, that all I have seen is epic failure at multiple levels. There is no prevention program that I have seen in my district. And I can't, I, and I have to tell you, the reason why you're hearing from so many council members is because this is not in particular to one district, this is systemic. The second thing, you mentioned that, uh, that distress is not a criteria based on the law, but that's exactly what your staff came to us selling on us. They, that was the sell point. Oh, these this properties are in distress, and so they painted this picture. We're not making this up. This is, the, this is a concerted voice that you keep hearing today, and I know you're new. You're inheriting uh, what was done before, and I hope that you take the leadership uh, to basically change the system and the structure that is literally robbing our people from their property. This is, this is, is inconceivable to me that I have to visit people in my district crying literally crying, having uh, building meetings where they are, they are stressed out. They are, there's a human component. I know we brought a lot of numbers here, but I have to tell you that these shareholders, they're not making st stuff up. They're not saying, you know, my, my shareholders, they're saying we never got any notices. Never got any notice. I think every shareholder in the building should get a certified mail. There should be ways to prove. And I have to tell you, let me finish. I've been waiting for two years. Thank you. I am speaking for you. Th thank you. I'm speaking for you. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, and you see, you see the distress. People, there's a level of anxiety to be able to lose. And let me tell you what I believe is the bottom line. Let me say what I, I haven't heard today being said. It is all about numbers. It's all about the numbers of reaching affordable housing units to be able to say, we did this many affordable housing units, but we cannot do it in the backs and the backs of shareholders that have been there, like the gentleman, Paul, that came here earlier, that have been there 30 years, some of them 40 years, 45 years, families from generation to generation. So I, I, I will hope uh, uh, to both of the chairs, and I know where your heart is at, that we'll be able, we'll be able to change the 1996 law with the best intentions that they had there back then, uh, that, that law is antiquated, it is not practical, it is not relevant to what our people are going through, and it's enough of, of literally, literally kicking people out out of their um, equity that they have and that they work so hard for. I literally have no questions because I said it all. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, council member. I, I'm just going to ask that I know that people are incredibly passionate about this issue, but in the effort to have everyone's voices heard, if you could try to contain your emotions, there is going to be an opportunity for testimony from, uh, from constituents, and we, we look forward to that. Um, please just try to contain yourself. I want everyone to be able to stay in the chambers to be heard but it's difficult to do that. The, the security here is responsible for maintaining some order, even though we're all incredibly passionate. If you could do that, we could get through this hearing and everyone could be heard. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move now to um, Council Member Carlina Rivera. I just wanna say that the uh, comments I made earlier about Manhattan did not mean that I don't include uh, the hard work of my colleagues in Manhattan and the Bronx around the third party transfer issue, Carlina Rivera being one of them.
Thank you, Chair Cornegie. And that brings me to my first point about the borough of Manhattan being where there is a very high concentration of HDFC. Um, thousands of families in my district are affected every single day because HPD, we understand you are trying to bring a program about preservation, but for many of us, it is too little too late, and that intervention should have been present and should have been accounted for years and years and years ago, and not just at the beginning of anyone's campaign. These are people who took over buildings in the 60s and 70s when no one wanted to live in these neighborhoods, where they rehabilitated these buildings in an urban homesteading movement that inspired the entire world that they use their sweat equity to not just rehab buildings, but clear out rubble and create gardens so they had open space so they could breathe right adjacent to their new homes. So there is a lot of investment here, and there are so many people just giving their time right now. And in April 2018, I sat right where Councilmember Torres was alongside Chair Cornegie. And for four and a half hours, we heard testimony from HDFC shareholders, and we looked at the third party transfer program. Four and a half hours of testimony. I never moved from that chair because every single person had a story. And so I just want to ask, and in that time, in a year, in, in three months, in four years, in 10 years, what, what have you learned? What, why is this the program that you continue to go back to? And I feel like, unfortunately, a symptom of this administration is a one-size-fits-all approach in many, many, many respects that is not working when our neighborhoods are so nuanced. So let me get more specific because I don't have a lot of time and there are a lot of people with questions, but I just want to add that people here, the reason why they're passionate, they feel confused, they feel disrespected, and they feel targeted. So when my former colleague in the city council and now public advocate Jamani Williams says that 500 buildings made up of 6,500 units from mostly female-headed households and senior citizens with reports emerging showing over 60 properties of black and brown homeowners and lower income neighborhoods being targeted, what do you say to, to, to those demographics? Do you keep them? Do you, are you looking at them and making sure that internally that we are not targeting these neighborhoods? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Um, I appreciate it. We are not targeting black and brown neighborhoods or families. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying that you're going in with this intention, but when you look at the data, and it happens again and again and again, there has to be some sort of self-reflection. You have to be looking at why is it in my neighborhood that has changed dramatically over the past couple decades, where are my black and brown families? They are in HDFCs, they are in public housing, they are in what's left of Michelama, and they are in rent stabilized units. So we are asking, what, what is it? Who's, you, you say in your testimony, several co-op buildings were party to ongoing housing court litigation for lack of heat, hot water, gas, or other critical services. Yes, I absolutely agree that there needs to be an educational component to every person who is going to be managing their own building. But, but what is that like? What are the types of clinics that you're even offering, and how often? So thank you, Council Member, for that question. Um, first, let me say, we share the same values, that of home ownership and safe, habitable housing. We also want to point out that we're, while we're focusing on, yes, there are issues, which is why we have a working group, which is why we welcome all the voices, which is why we're, we're, we're ready to sit down and, and figure out a way to change the program. In the meantime, we have the law as it is on the books. The second thing I'd like to point out is that of 420 properties, 62 properties are left in this process, and those 62 properties have a lot of financial issues. And so, you know, yes, what have we done? Well, um, you know, the city created these 1,260 something odd HDSCs, but we have a contract with a not for profit. It used to be you have, and um, now it's the, the, the neighborhood housing services, uh, housing services program, and they are on contract on a yearly basis. They are on contract so that any of, any of these HDFCs can go to them for training, advice, help, and issues. 
Um, I'd like to also say that in the three years since we started this round, we have made outreach. We've sent out letters to people. You know, the rental properties don't have an opportunity to get a tax exemption to get rid of all of the rares, but the HDFCs do. And we reached out to them. We sent them many letters telling them what the deadline was and what the process is in order for us to help them get a tax exemption. So I welcome us all sitting down in this working group and trying to figure out what is the best way of making sure that all of the resources that we have, and we have a lot of them in this agency for loans for small homeowners, et cetera, that why it's not getting through and why people aren't I understand, advantage. and I'll just say that I had a building that almost went through the TPT program on East 13th Street. I think that the educational component there of knowing that if that building had gone through the TPT program, they would have lost their rights as homeowners. So this is actually attributing to also the loss of home ownership opportunity, which is rare and infrequent in this city. So I'm, I'm okay with looking, you know, looking at um, how we can work together. I don't think anyone here is opposed to working together. I think Council Member Torres was very clear in saying that it needs reform, but it is too many people who are starting to all wonder why, why is it always them? Why are they always the ones that are being forced out? So uh, thank you for, for answering my questions. I don't, I don't have any more time. Um, I guess you know, we can always catch up at a later date. Thank you, Chairs, for, for being gracious in your time. Well, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ayala. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna blame H. I'm not gonna sit here and say that HPD is specifically targeting Black and Brown communities, even though that's what it looks like. However, what I would say is that considering that most of these buildings are in Black and Brown communities, and considering that these Black and Brown communities are rapidly gentrifying communities, and, and, and for the most part you would assume that HPD would assume a role where they would move mountains to protect and preserve this viable piece of housing stock. The fact that so many of our H, uh, DFCs reported to us that they had not heard from HPD when HPD was asserting that they had made over 70 points of contacts with these buildings is alarming, and it's one too many people. When one person says, I didn't hear back, maybe a letter got lost. When two people say, maybe, right, it's possible. But when you have this many individuals reporting that they never received anything, and if they did receive um, a piece of a document, it was towards the latter part of the process, that's alarming. We as elected officials could be helpful, right? If, if we were alerted in time, I think by the time that we, that I, I know specifically I'll speak for my district, by the time that I was told uh, that my buildings were being transferred, it was already, these buildings had already been selected. There was no conversation to be had. We were lucky because we were able to save a few of them and have them pulled out of the list, but had I not been paying attention, they would have potentially ended up being transferred. And so I, I would urge you to seriously consider creating some sort of mechanism that would raise a red flag for those buildings specifically that are in communities that are undergoing such significant change because for some of us, this is all we have left. And so we're gonna fight and we're gonna fight hard. And so I don't, again, you know, it's just, just a consideration. Do you know, uh, however, if, were there any individual people that went into the buildings that actually did door knocking? Yes. So um, for the majority of the HDFCs, if we were able to get, we did flyering, and if we were able to get in the building, we put a flyer under every door. Um, you know, I'll tell you, the issue we're having is the boards. So out of 118 or 19 HDFCs that got in, the 25 that are left with this huge amount of arrears, you know, has something to do with the governance of these properties, right? So if you don't have an effective board, and it's the board that we're communicating with because it's the legal entity that represents those properties. If they're not effective in following instructions and being a partner on the other end to get that Article 11 tax exemption, um, then that's a real issue for us. Well, I would, I would also consider, I would ask you to consider, as we are creating more and more community land trusts throughout the city, that that be 
an alternative for transferring over properties that need to be transferred. I'm not saying that every property needs to be transferred. I guess that's on a case-by-case -case basis, but I've had, you know, I've had buildings that are so distressed um, and you know, so poorly managed because the, the, the leadership has you know, um, either left or uh, become so elderly that they've asked that the buildings be transferred. But in, in those cases, I think if we're able to secure the, the property by transferring them over to a community land trust model, then it ensures that these shareholders remain shareholders and they're not losing the equity on their, on their units. Um, it's something that I've been thinking about and I've spoken to HPD in the past about, but I think that it needs to be given serious consideration. Absolutely, council member. Um, the community land trusts are eligible to take those properties and we will explore that. Thank you. Council member Jonai. Thank you, chairs. Um, this is an incredibly eye-opening hearing and I'm just very fortunate to be a part of it. But commissioner, um, so it's my understanding that this is all about using this as a tool for tax collecting and forcing property owners to make repairs. Is that correct? It is by law primarily a tax collection tool that's correct, but in addition, we add properties that are, that are statutorily distressed, mm -hmm. i.e. they have these violations, et cetera, and Great. force them to make repairs. So my only question is, how can we get this to apply to New York City's housing, NYCHA? Thank you, Council Don't Member. answer that. That's okay. <laughs> but it would be wonderful if we can have the same principles and same commitment to NYCHA residents as we hold our own property owners. I'm sorry, Council. I would. So, love by to the way, I just want to. Okay. Go I ahead. would love to answer that because um, before I got to HPD, I was at HDC mm -hmm. briefly, and I know that the administration is committed to NYCHA and that there is a plan, a housing 2.0, NYCHA 2.0 plan that HDC, that helps finance our projects at HBD, is lending their expertise to finance repairs for NYCHA projects. So I just want to touch on the, the incentives that we have for property owners to actually pay their real estate taxes, water and sewer and emergency repairs bills. It's called an 18% interest compounded they don't need more incentive. If they had the ability and aware wherewithal to pay, they would. And in most cases, it's not that they don't have, they're not aware. They pay off their mortgages. They don't realize that they, they're not accustomed to paying their own real estate taxes. They're not accustomed to when they inherit a house uh, where the bill goes to another address and they've changed their home address or billing address, that they're not aware that the real estate taxes are due and sometimes in my own experience, it takes Department of Finance more than a decade to correct the new address of the property owner. Um, I'm going to add that perhaps this is more in line, and I'm probably going to get blasted for this, but that's okay. And the mission that this administration really does not believe in property rights. That's what this comes down to. And I will quote this administration. What's been hardest in the way of our legal system is structured to favor private property. I think people all over the city of every background would like to have the city government be able to determine which building goes where, how high it will be, who gets to live in it, and what the rent will be. I think there's a socialistic impulse, which I hear every day in every kind of community, that they would like things to be planned in accordance to their needs. And I would like to, unfortunately, which stands in the way of this, is hundreds of years of history that have elevated property rights and wealth to the point that there is, that's the reality that calls for the tune of a lot of development. And if I had it my way, City government would determine every single plot of land, how development would proceed, and there would be very stringent requirements in around income levels and rents. That's a world I'd love to see, and I think what we have in this city at least are people who would, like, who would love to have the New Deal back on one level. They'd love to have every, the very powerful government involved in directly addressing their day-to-day -day reality. 
That is called communism and a taking of private property. So I guess unless we change the approach and respect property owners for what they are, we'll be the newest member to the Russian bloc, New York City. Thank you. Um, this is a pretty expensive, I didn't realize we were gonna cover Marxism, so. Sorry. Um, get, uh, I guess by default we have chairs, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Madam Commissioner, oh, good afternoon. I know uh, a number of my colleagues have asked this and you've, you've insisted uh, throughout your testimony on uh, focusing on the notion that primarily, I, I think that's the, the adjective you use, that this is a tax collection tool. Um, and you've been presented with a booklet uh, prepared by the Oversight Investigations Committee uh, that lists 10 examples of properties, and I recognize it's not fully inclusive, but I just want to list a couple of them. Um, Exhibit 16 has a property with no outstanding taxes, no violations, it's a two-family home. Exhibit 17 has a property with $153 in outstanding taxes, two violations. Exhibit 19 has a property with $2,389 in outstanding taxes, which while it may seem like a lot, is lower than a lot of rents in the city, it's lower than my rent, um, eight violations. Exhibit 20 has a property of $1,001, uh, which is $1 above the threshold that you, on the statute that you focus on, with 13 violations. Exhibit 22 has $1,790 in taxes with one violation. Exhibit 23, arguably uh, and admittedly, has uh, $11,918 in taxes, but it's a two-family home. And Exhibit 24 uh, has outstanding taxes of $1,233 and one violation. Um, the, you've, you've focused a lot of your testimony on the notion that the council, the council, the council, passed this law, passed this law, passed this law, but a quarter of a century ago under Mayor Giuliani. And I, I couldn't help but think throughout the entirety of your testimony and the questions from my colleagues that somewhere, some, some place in the bowels of the city's government is a person who reviews whatever information the computers have generated. I mean, there are not robots that figure this out. There are people. And would get a piece of paper in front of them saying, well, you know, a property with $153 in taxes and two violations, maybe not so much for this program. And I'm trying to understand where, and I haven't really heard you say that, and I recognize you've only been there for three months, so this is not a critique of you per se as much as it is of, of the agency's work. I'm trying to understand how we come to the point where there is no person or group of people in city government somewhere who gets a stack of papers uh, on their desk and says, well, no, this property is not going to be part of this program. So thank you, council member, for this question. Um, you know, my colleagues at HPD are public servants who are really sincere in the job that they do every day. And when they are selecting properties, they are actually selecting properties with the highest arrears. Um, can I, can I, I only, I, I appreciate that. I only have three minutes. You get, you don't get a clock, I do. <laughs> I, I, and I, I apologize for this, but I'm not gonna get a lot of time. At, at the end of the day, we're talking about a property with 150. I'm not asking you to speak to a specific property, mm -hmm. but there are clearly an example, a sampling within these 420 properties of properties with very, very low outstanding liabilities, one clearly identified as having none, and very, very low or relatively low outstanding violations. And I recognize that in your presentation there were pictures that I would not want to live in properties with those pictures, but I also have to recognize that I assume Mr. Saunders' property was not depicted in your presentation with photos. And I'm not saying that you, you ought to be able in a position to answer specifically to his or to any other property, but there are clearly a listing of properties in that booklet that you have in front of you that don't wouldn't, we wouldn't think would fit into a program like this. And without going into the notion of there are great people at HPD, people who took the same oath that you and I did, but something has failed there where they're not picking up and saying this property is not right for the program. What is that failure? That's so what I'm asking. So council member, it's the law. They're following the law. So once they've selected the properties that have the highest arrears, the law says that they have to pick up the other properties as well. But these properties get selected, they don't get transferred. So the properties that have the low violation amounts, they get selected but quickly exit the program. What we, where we are 
realize at the end of the program where there are only 62 properties left, and these properties have an average of $800,000 owed to the city per property, and that is the focus for us. So regardless of, we're, it's a three year long process, so if the law says you can't take this one without picking up that one, we get all of those properties out. And you're of saying the there's process. no discretion within the agency to simply look at a, a property that has a zero dollar tax lien, uh, tax liability, and zero violations, and is a two family house, and to say this property, notwithstanding what the law says, we have the discretion not to include that? So a property without, um, without having many violations that property would not qualify. So I cannot speak I'm, to the particular properties I'm looking properties at, at 1880, um, I don't want to read the address into the record, but I'm looking at Exhibit 16 in the booklet that we were given by the committee staff um, uh, in University Heights, Morris Heights in the Bronx, it's a two family home, looks lovely on the outside, has no violations, has zero dollars in owed money. Um, exhibit 17 in Councilman Cornegie's district, um, with the market value, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna get into the market value. I agree with you, by the way, that you have statutory restrictions on what constitutes a DOF market value versus a real-time market value, what you and I would pay on the market, and I understand that. But it has a market valuation based on DOF's records of $295,000, uh, nine dwelling units, two violations, and owes $153. Somewhere there has to be a guy doesn't have to be a guy, could be a woman too. Somewhere there's gotta be a city employee who gets this in front of them and says, well, this is not right. We have to do something and run it up the flagpole to the point where it gets looked at. Well, that property got out, right? So that property wasn't transferred. So I can But it got in before to, it got out. I can't speak to this particular property. Okay. But this but the, any property that does not qualify for the program or was able to exit the program because it resolved its issues got out. So we're talking about after a three year long process, we have 62 properties left. And my question is those 62 properties that owe $800,000 on average and have B and C violations on average of eight, that's what we're left with. B and C violations of eight are, uh, not, up a, to eight B are not a lot of a, are not a lot of violations, frankly. And if a building doesn't constitute, and, and, and the Supreme Court has talked about blight with regard to eminent domain and what government can do when it comes to a taking, and this is a taking. This is a taking, and I feel that way when I vote no on Landmarks Commission's takings as well, but this is an absolute taking without just compensation. It's, I'm not blaming you personally for it. I know it's not you, but it is the city. It is the city, and that may mean that this body as a whole, and maybe myself, are complicit in this, but there is a taking being done, and somebody, way before we learn about it, somebody in your agency there's got to be a person that you can identify who didn't realize or didn't identify or didn't flag a particular group of properties as being unfitting for, a, if not the letter of the law, but the intent of the law. Council Member, yeah, this is a great question. I'd like to say that um, not only was this property not transferred, so the process worked, the council has to pass a local law to actually transfer these properties. But we have to pass TPT. a law to take it to not transfer it. To not transfer That's the correct. property. That's correct. We have to That's affirmatively correct. act to do the reverse to stop you from doing something. So in that 45 day period that the council has to review all properties in their districts and decide whether these properties actually get transferred or not, we have done that with this body. So I say we have a working group. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at all of the unintended consequences. Let's take a look at what right. you'd my, like my, it to be. Commissioner, my time has long expired and the chairs have been very indulgent with me. I will say the following as a final point. Uh, my, my principal question going into this was, there's got to be a group of people somewhere in your agency that, that didn't do right. I'm not, saying that they, I'm not saying that they failed on their jobs, but they got a set of papers in front of them, they looked at things, and they didn't pick up that some properties are just not fitting with the intent of the 1996 council that adopted this law and three mayors ago that adopted this law. We are a quarter century later. It's $1,000. Some of these properties don't even hit the $1,000. The idea of what what the city looked like in terms of properties in 1996 is different from what the, pro the city looks like in 2015, 16, 17, and 18, and 19. We're in a different place. And somebody or a group of people in your agency 
didn't realize that something is wrong here, and I'm suggesting that that's a problem. Well, we have a working group, council member, we so we work. recognize that we need to all work together to make changes to okay. this program. I uh, yield back to the chair. Thank you very much. So I just want to follow up on a couple of things. One is the idea that, yes, we as a council uh, passed off on some, uh, signed off on some of these third party transfers. But as uh, Council Member Cabrera articulated, we were sold the idea that they were distressed properties. Now you're here today saying that distressed properties doesn't fit the criteria and there's taxes. Us as council members were clearly by staff at HPD told that these properties were, if not un you know, uninhabitable, they were certainly distressed properties. And the transfer was necessary so that people could have a quality of life that was consistent with being human beings. That was the language that was used to council members to get them to do that. Now, did every council member go to every um, third party transfer on the list in their district and visit them? No, because I'm the chair of housing the buildings, I did visit a couple, but there were so many on my list, it, was, it wasn't even humanly possible even in that period to visit them. So I don't want it to seem like we were, you know, that, that as members, we just signed off. That wasn't the case. We expect, we had a reasonable expectation that the administration in the, part of, in the party of HPD would be providing us with the necessary information for us to make an informed decision. And if some of that was, at the very least, um, uh, the communication wasn't up to par, I won't say that it was misleading, because I think that would be unfair to say, but my colleague did mention that the word distress was used several times, to my knowledge, even in the, 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 the process of the um, third party transfer that were in my district. And we then looked at some of them and was like, Ooh, just like my colleague has mentioned it, that doesn't sound like it should be in, and then did a further step in this. And then I also want to point out that while you're saying that some, that these egregious ones that we showed on the slides were taken out, Marlene Saunders was not. So that is tremendous concern to me that how many more of her are there than the intended people. If she didn't have her own advocacy, now we talked about her son, but she's quite capable herself to, to call, to make the necessary calls and put people to task. As a senior, there are seniors that are not. So my concern in my district is how many of these went through in prior rounds with nobody checked and nobody went hard for them. So while, you want to, while we want to talk about going forward, which is always the appropriate thing to do when we've recognized something is wrong, we're talking about the transfer of wealth, the, the accumulation and transfer of wealth in particular communities that don't have that option oftentimes. So while I'm willing to and looking forward to partnering with through the working group and going forward, I have to look in my rearview mirror a little bit because I know that there's at least one family that sits here that if they didn't have the advocacy and the gumption to do what they did, they would absolutely be without their property today. So how many others are there? Like, I, I, I don't know. So there, there are some that you're saying that were egregiously uh, on the list and were removed. How many, how many were not? And so this is a serious issue because what could you do with $1.5 million of equity? Could you buy more properties and become a landlord? Could you invest in a business? Could you send your children to college? Could you do all of the things that lift people out of poverty? Could happen. How many times did that not happen and the city is complicit in it, is my concern. So thank you, council member, for that question. Um, again, we share your values. I do want to point out that in the Saunders case, they put the wrong account on the check, and so the money was put. It was still on the three thousand dollars. I don't care where it went, and it was three thousand dollars loan to value on a one point five million dollar property. I, I don't know how I could possibly rationalize that. If this was the banking industry that did something like that, this would be a different kind of hearing. And, and, it, and it smells, and I've been careful not to use that word because I'm the chair, but, but the word taking, the word taking is a word that comes up again and again and again in particular communities, and it's of grave concern. If we're facing, in my district alone, third party transfer, plus deed theft and deed fraud, plus lien sales, that all feels like an assault on people's ability to build and transfer wealth. And if I'm complicit in that as a council member and a legislator, then I gotta be accountable for that. If the city and the agencies and the administration is complicit in that, they have to be accountable as well, is all I'm saying. 
Council Member Amphrey Samuel. Hi, so um, besides, besides um, looking like each other, Chair Carnegie, we usually have the same thoughts um, and everything that I just wanted to say is what um, Chair Carnegie just expressed. Um, I, I represent the district where Mr. Dorsey lives and throughout the slide presentation, um, that particular case was referenced several times. And when we were going through this process, Associate Commissioner Darky, uh, Darka can, can, can um, um, attest to this, when I was sitting in the meeting, I was overwhelmed with emotion and was so upset and furious as to um, the, the lack of responsible for me, the lack of um, empathy towards what was happening in my district and communities like my district. Um, I was so upset that I started to curse and that was outside of my character in a, in a professional setting. And um, Associate Commissioner Darga can, um, <laughs> that meeting didn't end well with us at all. Um, and that was last year. And so I just wanted to say on record that I'm thankful that um, Chair Torres and Chair Carnegie is having this hearing and this, um, like what's happening now and taking a look at it and the discussion around um, the work group because last year during that meeting, I was so angry and I felt like I was alone because the agency led me to believe that I was the only one that was so pissed off. And I was the only one that was just so angry and trying to do something on behalf of the homeowners in my community, in particular, Mr. Dorsey, who was losing his home. And so um, this for me is helpful to hear the, you know, I don't like to hear the level of frustration amongst my, amongst my colleagues, but to know that we're all going through this and you are working on making this right. And so I just wanted to say that, and I, I don't want to take up too much time because I do look forward to the testimony of Mr. Dorsey um, and the other advocates um, that are here today. So thank you. No question. Thank you, Councilman. Th thank you, Councilman. I want to I, I want to revisit some of the questions that Councilman Cornegie asked you because the geographic and racial disparities are so glaring. Mm -hmm. The fact that HVD selected 32 properties in a single neighborhood in Brooklyn, Crown Heights, but zero properties in Staten Island. And it had me wondering what accounts for those disparities. And earlier, can we pull up Exhibit 12? Uh, we pointed to DOF's website stating that a property could be subject to in-rem foreclosure if, quote, your property is in an area that the city considers to be blighted. And when I came across the word blighted on DOF's website, I was reminded of Robert Moses, who had the authority to declare a neighborhood blighted in, in a slum for the purpose of slum clearance and urban renewal. And, and so my question is, what exactly did that word mean? And who gets to decide what qualifies as a blighted area? We, we didn't actually, I didn't hear an answer to that question from DOF. All right, so thanks, thank you, Councilmember, for that question before I turn to DOF. Um, that is an unfortunate term because that term is not in the TPT law, right? It is not in the 1996 law as passed by the council. The requirements, I'd like to remind, because we it yeah. gets a little bit lost because of this, the last 62 properties that have been transferred, but the requirements according to law is that arrears are owed to the city for, a, for three years in some cases or more, or one year or more. And um, it just says arrears. There is a tax lien sale list that the city has where every property in this entire city that owes the city a thousand dollars. But it feels like there's a targeting of neighborhoods because there are there are surely tax delinquent properties in Staten Island. So and you're not targeting Staten Island, you're targeting communities of color. Thirty two properties in Crown Heights versus zero in the whole borough of Staten Island. Crown Ten Heights, by the in way, the whole borough of Queens. The highest, highest gentrifying areas at this particular moment in history. And it can't be coincidence. Thank you, Council Member. There are two issues going on, right? So one is that just because a property isn't in TPT doesn't mean that if it owes money, it's not on the city's tax lien sale list. So I just want to 
make sure that it's understood that there isn't a property that meets the requirements for being on the tax lien sale list where the city sells those liens regularly every year. Um, properties that owe the city money get on that list. And on that list, if your lien is sold to a third party and you don't pay it, you are displaced, you lose your home, and that is going on all over the city. In TPT, we tried, we looked at properties that were on the 90-day list that owed the most money. And unfortunately, um, when you look at the areas where these properties are, there is a high foreclosure risk in those areas. Um, they have the highest for notices of, of um, impending for list pendants from private from private banks. So I, I, I want to stress that we're not I, targeting I just feel like neighborhoods. Th this, is, this is the same, this feels like the same argument the NYPD made with stop and frisk, right? The NYPD would say, we go where the crime is. You're telling me you go where the distress and the debt is. But we demonstrated that there are properties that you've targeted that have neither debt nor distress. And even when you target those properties, just like with the NYPD with stop and frisk, we believe you've gone too far because there's no consistency in how you're applying your broad authority to select properties for TPT. But I want to get back to the blighted. If, if there's no legal basis for declaring a neighborhood blighted for the purposes of TPT, why did it appear in DOF's website in the first place? So I will, council member, I will let DOF answer this question. I do want to correct, I want to correct some things before we move on, which is a property that is not uh, does not meet the requirement for the program, should not be in the program. I, well, three I, of the selected properties had no tax arrears. So Four I'm of the properties had f less than $1,000. So whether I'm, the threshold is $1,000 or zero, we have found properties that violate, th whose selection violates the law. So of the 420 properties, I don't know these properties, but if they don't meet the requirement, they shouldn't be in the program. In any case, in three years, the staff has worked tirelessly to get these properties out of the program. This is our job, to make sure people who don't belong are out, people who belong but can take all of our help and resources to stabilize, get but, but out. The ends do not justify the means. The notion that the government can threaten to strip you of all your equity based on one cent in tax arrears is crazy. It's crazy. But, but I want to get back to the blighted. Why did, if that term has no legal basis in the administrative code, why did it appear on DOF's website? I have not heard an answer to that question yet. Yes, so the, the short answer is I don't know. We, so it just we, appeared there and no, no one knows. We, we became aware of that. Um, actually, we were notified that um, you might be an asking about the website. No, I notified zero. you about it, so I, but yes. I never got an answer you, as to. <laughs> you notified us, um, and so we looked at it. We saw that it was a mistake. It was wrong, yeah. and we fixed it. Uh, I do not know how it got there. Okay. Does anybody have any more questions? Yeah, so I'm curious as to do you understand why the council member and the council in general around the term blighted is so upset, and do you agree with its inclusion in a, de a Department of Finance website? Yes, we agree. We understand the concern. It should not have been there. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to end it here. Um, who was involved in the decision to select these 420 properties? So. It is, a, it is a joint decision, right? So we look, HPD looks at the tax lien sale list and picks the properties that have the highest arrears. We also look at our 7A, EP programs, or all of our programs for, no, the, for but properties. But I'm asking who are the decision makers beyond HPD? So it's a collective three agency effort. Once we pick the properties, we send the list to DEP and DOF so that they could confirm. And once DOF goes to pull the properties, everything that comes up on the block that meets the requirements then by law has to be pulled. So it is a joint agency, um, tri-agency effort. We, make, uh, we meet on a bi-weekly basis. So that's DOF, HPD, and what's the third agency? And DEP. And does City Hall have a role as well? Um, you know, all, um, 
parts of government, the council, uh, can pull properties out of the list, so p other agencies don't put properties no, on the, the list. The council had no role in the selection of those properties. Did and City, City Hall, Hall have a role no in the selection of those they properties? They have no role in the selection of the properties. Okay. You can pull properties as a council member who, who, who off the Who was the, the commissioner at the time of round 10, when those properties were selected for round 10? Former Commissioner Vicky Bean. And what position does Vicky Bean hold today? She is the deputy mayor of this. Uh, and so as deputy mayor, she oversees HPD and by extension, TPT, right? By extension, the council and also oversees right. but TPT. She, but you do, I can't fire you, but you directly report her in a way that you don't report to me or Robert Carnegie. So it seems to me if she was the chief policymaker on TPT during round 10, and if she is the chief policymaker on housing today, why is she not here explaining why those 420 properties were selected? So, council member, that is an excellent question. So, while a commissioner may be the head of the agency, there are excellent staff at the deputy commissioner level and the assistant and associate commissioner level who are responsible for their areas of um, their functioning areas. And so, even as commissioner today, I am not in the weeds with everything, everybody, the 2,500 people who work in my agency, so I would not be in the weeds on everything that everybody has done. I would have signed off if people have brought to me a reasonable, rational policy. So any, as, as you know, if you're the head of anything, yeah. right, you cannot possibly e Except be here the, the stakes are higher because it involves people's livelihoods and equity. And, so, and I just want to know for the record, we did extend an invite to the deputy mayor. So as the commissioner for HPD, it is appropriate that I appear yeah. before you to testify about my agency's actions. I, I will just say, and I'll end it here, if, if HPD is unwilling, because I, I don't see rhyme or rhythm in some of the, the properties that you selected, whether but it's the properties that have no distress or no arrears, and if HPD is not willing to explain to us the application of TPT to particular properties in particular cases, you leave us with no choice but to restrict your authority under the program. So, thank you, council member, for that. We are part of a group. We have agreed that TPT of 1996 may not be appropriate today, and we are willing to work with you. We have said that everything is on the table, and we have said that we're willing to look for changes in the future. We are aligned in that. That's the extent of my questioning. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Armin Kwamina, for the record's sake. And I must testify today, Mr. Jamani Williams has fought for me up to this day. I'm sitting here, and I know I'm going to win and get in my house that they just sell for one dollar. And I just bury my husband, 30, over 55 years of marriage, can't be in the house dead and gone and left me a widow and my house had no debt and yet have three three deeds and I still hold my deed where are the laws that this young woman speak of 
I'm certain she passed my house at 580 East 84th Street. And, and now, and now, I am without a house, I'm without a husband, I owe no debt, and I slept on couches, and the little thing I didn't enter into is Wait, hold, hold on, hold on one second. Let us, let us deal with the issue. Please help me. The pain is too much. Wait, I, I want you to take an opportunity just to relax for a second while they're clearing the courtroom. Yes, I, mean, the, I feel. The, the chambers, just, just take a deep breath. I feel. And we're going to come back to you. Can I get some water? Yeah, absolutely. In. Huh? No, we have we have the pain. No. Huh? Is anybody from HPD still here? Sergeant at arms, I'm asking for just a five minute recess. I want you to sit. This hearing is in a five minute recess. We will be resuming in five minutes. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. I couldn't sit no more. I had to sit before I collapsed. This is your time.
Right, let me call, let me speak to Robert. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to resume the hearing. A anyone, anyone who disrupts the proceedings will be asked to leave. We're going to resume the hearing. Okay. My colleague has made a request for HPD to return. They will be returning but I'd like to be able to hear everyone's voice, so I'm going to ask you for your indulgence. I know everyone is incredibly upset and passionate, but we are now going to hear from your voices. Please do not interrupt each other. It is very important that we as a council get to put names and faces to this travesty that's happening through third-party transfer. So if you could please indulge the rest of this testimonies and the rest of the hearing, we are here until we've heard everyone's voices. Sure, yeah. So. Let me let me conduct the hearing without interruption. Okay. Ma'am, do you want to? Do you want, ma'am? Do you want to finish your testimony? My name is Carmen Kwamina, C-A-R-M-E-N-Q-U-A-M-I-N-A. -E -E. Presently, I'm living in an apartment at 256 Herzl, H-E-R-Z-L, Herzl Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11212, apartment one. I don't know how long I would be there, and I couldn't take it today. I'm apologizing, I'm not this kind of person. I have five days the landlord gave me when I would be evicted for about the sixth or seven times since I own my property at 580 East 84th 4th Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11236. And as I'm speaking here, I own a deed in my hand, but several other people own deed to that same property. I hire two attorneys to help me with the confusion that went on in the courts. And instead of they investigate the case, get from the DA office all the documents that I have, a big box of documents like this are reported to the DA office. Because you see what? I went to school and I took a little law, and I know a little law when people were going the wrong way. And I know about driving. When you're going up the highway, you get more accident, but you drive on the surface lane, it is better. And I drove on the surface lane finding out why these people coming after my house. My mother took in and died. I had to fly to Guyana and bury her. My only hope was my husband, who I married for 55 years, that I just lost through the same kind of problem. He was choked to death in Brookdale Hospital by a nurse coming and gave him a cup of pills without no water. If my husband had a cup of water like this, he would have been in my bed to massage me every night. He died right in front of me. So the tragedy of my house stolen from me when I gone to bury my mother, the two lawyers call me back and say, you know what, Miss Kwamina, a predator is going after your property. I say, who is that? He 
His name is Jeffrey Myers. I say, I don't know that man. He say, he went to your house and tell the tenants, don't pay no rent. She is not the owner, I am. Not knowing he looked up in the computer those days in the 80s and so on. They were looking at computer and I heard this young lady talking, but she don't understand how predators work. I learned how the predators work. While you were sleeping, they're going through the neighborhood and going in the computers and looking for the homes that you see we see there and then they come after you and predator you. And I say, nobody can leave my house. I pay my last mortgage. I own nothing. My taxes. I got the city to send the water bill. I, I am on top. Why? So I'm a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I traveled all over, and I had no problems. So nobody could have take my house from me. I know. They say, no, you have to leave your mother, bury her. The next day, come back, your house is going to be gone. I had to fly back from Guyana quickly. And the way how I was losing the house, I had to take my little instinct and put bankruptcy to hold it while the lawyer fighting. Not knowing, I had a case with a very good lawyer who was taking up my rent. She said, we got to fight these people. Ma'am, ma'am, can you? And I took two lawyers, we, and I asked the two lawyers, please come in and help. Ma'am, we, we have 40 people who need to testify. Yeah, so I'm not you, going to be long, because I, I actually, if you can conclude, that's I, I, if I take 10, 10 minutes, it's long, because I already take half of the story. And I tell you now how the house gets for me. Now, the house now, I come, file the bankruptcy, they say, but lady, why do you file banks? You wait to your lawyer. I said, no, I'm stopping them from doing what they're doing while my lawyer is working. Not knowing that the two lawyers I hire was helping the predator to get my house. Okay. Angeline Johnson, which you all read in the papers from the Queen District, and Muriel Winnick, two big time lawyers, get up in the courthouse and concocted this malicious thing. But it's good thing I have all my documents. And I make certain I put all the documents in the DA office with Mr. Richard Farrell. All of them know my story. Where is Mr. Farrell? He did not come to help me. I had to be fighting. And now the two lawyers have got to be fighting. And now we've got to fight the predator, Huga. And now I was given no time, to, and I was evicted. I can't fight no more because the two lawyers who are supposed to represent me is the thieves. And they're concocting with the judges, with the lawyers. When I do investigate in the case, the judge said, no, you can't take this out from this woman. Ma'am, ma'am. I have the documents here. Ma'am, I, I will you have You are not going to go with this house. I am going to put this house on a... Um, ma'am, I... I, I am going to put this house. This lady is her house. I will give the keys. And you two lawyers... Ma'am, you, you have to conclude. I will give you the... I'm finishing ma you, it. you have to conclude. I'm finishing it. I'm giving you these keys to this lady house. Okay. She have won the case. You cannot prove that it's your own house, Mr. Jeffrey okay. Meyer. You two attorneys, she's paying you so much an hour. You haven't done your job. She's crying in the house here. I close the case and give the... The two attorneys with two hundred and forty something thousand dollars, a bank said no. Ma'am, you, ma you have to conclude. The gone with the two hundred and forty something thousand. I lost the house and yeah. all my furniture. I'm finishing it. I finish it. Finish it. All my I, furniture. I, I, the the Dan Hill. Um, the Dan Hill, I'm paying off for the furniture. I don't know where all my furniture is in the house gone. The, the two lawyers I just mentioned, the two... Ma'am, we two have 40 lawyers. people... Let me finish it off. Ma'am, we have 40 people who need to testify. I said if I stay longer than five minutes, I'm telling you, this is the end of my story. They gone with the 245,000. They gone with my Dan Hill thing. They gone with my... Let me m mention the things that I lost so no, I will be able to go and get them. 
the go on with my house, the go on with my money, and they go and I cannot get back my house. And now my house is selling for 900 and something thousand. Ma'am, ma ma we have to end your testimony. So thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your testimony. Let's, let's call up the new panel, please. I'm sending my chief of staff. She's going to sit with you. So this, this marks what I mentioned earlier, which there are three things that are happening in minority communities simultaneously. There's the third party transfer program, which we're here to try to dismantle. There is deed theft and deed fraud, which clearly there's an example uh, by her testimony of that today. And then there's the lien sale list, all of which are, di di are displacing black and brown families and stripping those families of their opportunity to build wealth. So I wanna thank you for your testimony. Um, as the chair of housing and buildings, going forward, we will be looking at hearings that directly address deed theft and deed fraud. Today, however, is centered around the third party transfer program. So um, I, feel, I feel her pain and I didn't wanna rush her, but she has an issue that may not be third party transfer. I think it's more deed theft and deed fraud and my staff is going to work with her while we continue this hearing. So thank you so much uh, for your testimony. I'd like, to call the, I'd like to call the next panel, Anthony Drummond, Mr. Dorsey, Stephanie Sosa, and Jason Wu. I'm sorry, and Caroline Nagy. Nagy, sorry. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask everyone if you have long statements Please try to make them concise, consolidate them. Um, we understand that there is a theory and theme around what's transpiring here today. Um, I believe that someone um, from the administration has remained to hear from you. But I have to ask that because there are so many people who are here who want to testify, that we want to hear their voices, if you could all be clear and concise, and if you hear someone echoing sentiments that are of your testimony, use those, please. No, I only call five. Yeah. So I ask that um, before you begin your testimony, just identify yourself for the record. You're gonna push the button that's in front of you when you see the light is uh, illuminated in red that allows you to be heard by the entire um, chamber. Good afternoon, my name is Yola Nicholson. I'm um, joined uh, on behalf of Mr. Dorsey by my colleagues uh, on the litigation, Matt Berman of Ballycane and Vagnini and Roy Dixon of Ropes and Gray. We are here with Mr. Dorsey, who not only has been referenced a number of times and has suffered um, in this matter, but is also the lead plaintiff in the action that has been referred to in the prior testimony and presentations by the council. Good afternoon. My name is uh, McConnell Dorsey. Uh, on uh, the building uh, and 373 Rockaway Parkway. I'm the owner. I don't even know about uh, HPD and uh, TPT. I want to pay uh, uh, my tax, and then they say I have to get a letter from HPD. So I, I say, why? They say you have to go to one, uh, 100 uh, Gold Street to get the, H, uh, the letter from HPD to bring to the finance department to get to pay the to pay the ten thousand dollars. I say okay, so I went there. So when I get there, uh, the security called the, the ninth floor, Miss Lauren Fisher. She's a supervisor on the ninth floor. And then uh, when she come down, she take me upstairs, and she say, "You got to bring uh, 
your deed, your copy of your license, and uh, the copy if you get the ten thousand dollars to pay to pay the HPD. I say fine. So she said you could come back tomorrow to bring those three notes, the license, the uh, the copy of uh, I mean, uh, the deed of the the house, and the, and the copy from the bank. I get the ten thousand dollar to pay. I say fine. So uh, the next day I bring. It. I bring the jeet, the copy uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the bank. I get the money plus, plus uh, the deal of uh, the house. She said, okay, so they will call me. I said, fine. So she said, come back the next week. The next week, coming back to HPD and 100 Gold Street, they say, you're not ready yet. When I asked her, when I have to come back? She said, come back by the end of the week. By Friday, Friday I get there. She said, "You're not ready yet." I said, "I don't understand. Well, even two weeks, you have to give me a letter to bring to the bank to pay my money." And then uh, she said, "You will receive a letter." After one week, I receive a letter. Say they've been transfer the debt to TPT program. They transfer my name. So what Mr. I just what, what Mr. Dorsey, um, it has been a very emotional time for him, and um, I just want to put a little perspective on it. If you would indulge us for a second, yeah. Mr. Dorsey, this story that he's accounting and it's been very stressful on him. He, he, this process began in 2018 in the summer when he went to pay his tax bill. He is a Haitian immigrant. He um, took pride in owning his building and you know um, bought it with cash had a small mortgage on it for different reasons over time, paid that off, and it was, if you, if he, when he tells you the story, it's always a sense of pride to go down and pay his, his bills. When he went down in June or July to pay his bills, he was, he was, he was given the runaround, and this is the account that he, gave, he gives. But the, what's interesting is that runaround went on over a course of m about two months without HPD or DOF or anyone at the city saying to him that his deed was previously seized in 2015. 17 in that round of 62 that the HPD commissioner seems to feel comfortable about describing and um, seized on like what she told you on an argument and a presentation that his and the other properties were not viable. So this is another basis that they haven't told you. The affidavit in court said the properties were not viable for um, continuing in the ownership of the previous owner. He had, it is still questionable whether his property ever met the definition of distress that, uh, as that you've asked. He's, it's unclear on what charges he owed to the city. He was currently in an installment plan. And curiously, his property value on Rockaway Avenue in the Councilwoman's District, which is, um, everyone knows Rockaway, right up from, a, from Brookdale, um, is, uh, was valued by DOF at $134,000 when they began the process in 2015. We are the attorneys who've brought the class action, so we don't intend to litigate it here or um, contradict HPD, but it's just very curious to us some of the rationale that's presented and the fact that they keep saying to you that the law says a lot of things that we as lawyers have not found a law to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Do you I don't know if you have any questions, but I think he's free. At the end. I bought the building. Uh... Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Jason Wu, and I'm a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society. I echo the sentiments and concerns that have been expressed earlier today. The testimony I've submitted provides a slightly different perspective regarding the benefits of the third party transfer program, specifically the opportunity to provide affordable home ownership opportunities for low income New Yorkers. At the Legal Aid Society, part of, the, part of our practice includes housing and, and part of that means that we represent tenant associations that are in TPT buildings converting to low, inco low income cooperatives. And since TPT's inception in 1996, we have successfully assisted in the conversion of numerous buildings to HDFC cooperatives. And we believe that um, the TPT cooperative conversion pipeline is an important 
tool to provide home ownership opportunities in low-income communities of color. That said, the TPT program has significant challenges for its cooperative conversion housing pipeline. And in our written testimony, we outline three broad categories. One is the delay and mismanagement in the cooperative conversion process, and there needs to be more accountability and better communication of HPD and the developers with the tenants. Two, inadequate training and resources, including language access issues. Three, permanent affordability for low-income New Yorkers, where the rents are restructured after rehabilitation of the buildings, and there are long-term affordability challenges with that. Uh, challenges with that. And I'll conclude by saying yeah. thank you for the opportunity to, to testify, and we look forward to working with the City Council. Thank you. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll wait. I got questions for Jason. Yeah. Um, good afternoon. My name is Anthony Drummond. I'm representing Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams' office, and um, Fortunately, he could not make it into this afternoon, so I'll be reading a prepared statement on behalf of the borough president. And I'll make sure to make it as brief as possible in the interest of time. Um, well, that's the okay. case. So good morning, my name is Eric L. Adams, and I am Brooklyn borough, I'm Brooklyn's borough president, representing of more than 2.6 million residents who call the borough home. I would like to thank City Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings, and Council Member Richard, Richie Torres, Chair of the City Council Committee on Oversight and Investigation, for convening this hearing on the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development's Third Party Transfer Program, a topic that Brooklyn Nice know all too well. The issue around the TPT program is all too real in Brooklyn, especially in the central Brooklyn neighborhoods of Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. As a property owner, I know firsthand of the struggles of maintaining your home and paying the taxes that come along with it. This program has predominantly affected our seniors who brought their property at a time when the neighborhoods they lived in were not sought after. Today, the strain of gentrification is impacting neighborhoods across New York City. In Brooklyn neighborhoods, home ownership means families can build equity while also benefiting from stable housing costs in a city that continues to see rapidly rising rents. According to a Center for NYC Neighborhood Study, Brooklyn has long been a borough where working class family can buy and own a home. Today, 29% of Brooklyn households are homeowners, and of them, just half, 53%, earn a low to moderate income. 15% are middle income, while 28% are high income. This trend is showing that the number of high income Brooklyn homeowners increased from 23% to 28% over the past decade, while a proportion of low, moderate, and middle income homeowners decreased. So I love the Brooklyn Borough President, but in the interest of time, we, I, we need to conclude. I got you. Unfortunately, the TPT program may be playing a role in defrauding homeowners of their properties. Residents continue to inform our office that their homes were never supposed to be part of the foreclosure list and that they have been foreclosed upon despite repaying or delinquent taxes in good standing and that several homes have actually been returned to homeowners because they were wrongly seized. Based on these complaints that continue to come to my office and the larger crisis of deed fraud that we are witnesses, I again renew my call for a forensic audit of the TPT program and an investigation on the federal, state, and city level into this issue. The proposed formation of a task force to examine the TPT program is long overdue given a cloud of obscurity around the city's seizures of property, but it must be accompanied by real oversight by the city council. In addition, I am in full support of public advocate Jemani Williams' legislation calling for a two-year moratorium on the TPT program. No one should be losing their home while the task force is doing its job. And finally, and I'll just conclude here, finally, we must do more to ensure that bad actors and government programs are not forcing low-income residents and seniors out of their homes in the face of a demographically and economically changing borough. These tactics are embedded in our local policies that must be reviewed and changed. More importantly, we must do what we can to ensure that we do not force our families who are paying their taxes and investing in our communities out of their properties because of, uh, because of government policy. I want to thank the committee and its members for hosting this hearing and allowing me to address you on this very important issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We look forward to working with the Borough President. So. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Caroline Nagy, and I am the Deputy Director for Policy and Research at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Um, thank you, Chair Cornegie and Torres and the rest of the uh, members and staff for holding this hearing. 
The Center for New York City Neighborhoods works to promote and protect affordable home ownership in New York so that middle and working class families are able to live in strong, thriving communities. I'm gonna skip my written um, testimony and um, just make a couple points. The first is um, the conversation today, the issues around um, TPT, tax delinquency, tax foreclosures, um, and deed theft are all part of a, a much bigger picture of broadening economic inequality in New York City and a racial wealth gap in home ownership that has only gotten worse in the last decade since the Great Recession and is, does not um, appear to have signed, uh, appear to be improving. We've had um, the lowest income homeowners in New York um, have seen their real incomes decrease over the last decade while property values um, and therefore property taxes have been increasing you know, regularly every year. So of course there's homeowners who aren't struggling to afford their uh, taxes. And I think um, I want to make a point about outreach. You know, what um, Mr. Sanders said earlier today, of course, you know, thinking about all of the junk um, and solicitations that the homeowners that we work with get, you know, we've, we've asked homeowners to collect what they get on a weekly basis. It's like a, it's, you know, mountains of paperwork, of solicitations, of scams. Of course, they're not going to be able to, you know, really tell what's, what's one of these 70 touches from the TPT program or anything else. And this is really where I think trusted institutions and nonprofit community-based organizations can play a role in doing person-to-person -person outreach, trying to talk to humans um, and using, you know, community institutions to really reach people. And so that's, you know, when it comes to deep theft, TPT, or uh, taxing foreclosures, it's all about, uh, I think there's a lot more education and outreach that can be done, and that's something that we look forward to partnering right. you with. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, oh, there's one more. Okay. You smuggled in, so. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Gornigi and Torres <clears throat> and members of the committee. My name is Stephanie Sosa, and I am the Senior Associate for Housing Development Policy at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, also known as ANHD. ANHD's mission is to advance equitable, flourishing neighborhoods for all New Yorkers as a coalition of 100 community-based affordable housing and equitable economic development organizations in New York City. We work at the intersection of organizing, policy advocacy, and capacity building. Our extensive network of mission-driven nonprofit developers have built over 130,000 units of affordable housing and currently manage over 30,000 units across the five boroughs. ANHD supports the third party transfer program, which has allowed qualified developers, many who are ANHD members, to preserve hundreds of buildings which were once in physical and financial disrepair. The TPT program does this by ridding them of tax liens, violations, and unlivable conditions. Um, and I'm gonna skip everything that I wrote, but I, I also wanna mention that we are facing a housing crisis and homeowners are definitely being impacted, renters are being impacted, and policies that were created in the 90s or even the early 2000s uh, don't always match up with the, the issues that we are facing now, particularly around speculation, which are increasing property taxes, uh, um, are, and then we think about HDFCs, we have to think about uh, the cost of living, we have to think about um, income to expense ratios and how those differs, differ, and also how buildings are depreciating. Um, and so we do have to think about um, how we're going to create policies in order to help homeowners, um, but also not completely put the blame on a program that has helped so many people rent homes and live in a better and live in better conditions. So um, I do support the program, but I also hope that City Council can work with HPD and a committee to help improve the program. Uh, thank you. I just had a question for Mr. Wu. Um, does legal aid have a particular separate division as dealing directly with families who find themselves in third party transfer? If there are buildings that are, that are um, HDFC cooperatives that are impacted, they can come to us. Our buildings practice and our community development project will work with buildings to help them negotiate review documents and provide potentially other uh, legal representation. That is something we could do. Thank you, and um, I, I want to echo kind of Ms. So Ms. Sosa's sentiments. Um, the, the pro I support the program in its intent. The, the way that it's been used has been incredibly detrimental. So the, the um, working group is going to be essential, 
but the working group and the outcomes will be reform, because I'm, I'm not signing on to a working group that doesn't have a focus on reform, right? So I'm willing not to abandon the program, mm -hmm. um, but there, has, there have to be reforms in a timely fashion, mm -hmm. um, and there has to be some retrospective as well as to what's transpired for homeowners in the past. So um, I, I, I didn't state that um, like my colleague did from the onset of the hearing, and I think it's important to hear on the record. Uh, that that's my stance. Yeah, I just want to make that clear. Um, if there is a slumlord who's abandoning his property mm -hmm. or chronically mismanaging his property and it's saddled with debt and disrepair, I think every member of the city council would agree that's a perfect candidate for TPT. Absolutely. Right? Our issue is when the program is applied to properties that have no significant debt and no significant disrepair. So I just want to be clear about that distinction. Well, thank you for your testimony. I'm going to call the next panel. I, I want to point out that my colleague Inez Barron was in the queue to uh, provide questions to the administration, who unfortunately has left, but I'd like to have her ask her questions on, um, on the record. So we're going to do that Thank now. Thank you to the chairs. I'm very disappointed that uh, the administration panel did not remain, and it's uh, disrespectful. Perhaps they don't know the protocols because she's new, what someone should have told her that you wait to be excused before you leave. And when I meet with her, I will impress that upon her. I just want to get these comments on the record and submit these points to the administration so they can respond to them. First, I do want to say that there were properties in my community that were on the list. And there was one property that's an HDFC with some shareholders and with some renters. And we were able to work with legal aid. They provided a lawyer who's working specifically with that HDFC. Uh, I was able to apply for an Article 11, and they have been granted an Article 11. And so now they're working on all the other pieces that go with making sure that they get off the list. So they're trying to get a loan so that they can do the repairs and, and all of the necessary requirements. But my question to uh, the administration is, if in fact they changed the policy that allowed HDFCs to release their deed for a period of time and then regain those deeds, I've been told the policy changed. I want to see it in writing, and I want to know when it changed. So that's a question for, for the uh, administration to answer. And in terms of uh, what is the requirement for HDFCs to be able to receive appropriate training so that they understand what's involved in managing a building or get a management company, and what is the responsibility of the management corporation to the HDFCs because there is one in particular that has not fulfilled the responsibility of reporting to the HDFC in a timely fashion and giving them access to the records for their finances. So the administration, I think, has an obligation to help these HDFCs in particular maintain their properties. And just to briefly talk about uh, distressed properties, how is it that the administration can decide that since they're doing a redevelopment on an empty lot, that they now want to declare the adjoining building on McDonough Street a distressed property when in fact it was not. So how do they abuse that right and pull in non-distressed properties to try to uh, have people lo lose that ownership? And finally, uh, as I said, there were three properties in my district that were in the TPT, one of which was a privately owned three-family home. And when we went, we did take the opportunity to go to all of the properties on the list and talk to the tenants or talk to the HDFCs or the homeowner and ascertain from them what had been their interaction with the administration, with the city, and this privately owned home. The woman said that she had had an agreement, she had had a lawyer, but it sort of fell off the track, and no one, no one had contacted her. So the uh, claims of reaching out without having any documentation to support what you say you did are very questionable. So my question, final, final question to the administration is, if in fact 
none of these TPTs are approved by the council member for that district, what does that mean for the TPT? Because I'm concerned that if they're not in the program, we don't then have an ability to interact with them, but they might just go to the general lien sale. Uh, so that's my question. If, in fact, council members decide no, I'm not approving it, as I did with properties on my list in my district. So if all council members decided on that, what would be the status for the TPTs going forward? And why can't they go back? Why can't we look at a community land trust type arrangement so that those other properties where there are renters would be able to invest and own their property? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And while those questions were asked on the record, um, if you could provide them for me, I will definitely get that uh, for you, a direct answer. Thank you. So I'm going to call the next panel, starting with Louise Clark, Scott Levert, or Laverl, I'm sorry, Blanca Vasquez, Dr. Raphael K. Works, uh, Beverly Curry, and Glorianne Kirstein. Again, I know that this is an opportunity and you've waited all patiently to be able to voice your opinions and or testimonies on the record. I ask in the instance that you can be clear and concise and consolidate, um, I would greatly appreciate it. We still have nine panels to go and everyone's voice is incredibly important. I wanna hear everyone's voice, even though we're getting a little long in the tooth as the evening goes on. Um, I ask that you will state your name for the record before your testimony, and you can begin at whatever end you like. I'm, I'm partial to women first, but that's me. Vasquez, Blanca Vasquez, I'm with the HCFC Coalition, the Anti-Foreclosure Committee. We've been working on helping buildings save themselves for two years now at least. Um, let me go right into the testimony. The past informs the present. I am really sorry she's left, because I'm gonna make reference to what the Commissioner Deborah Wright said in 1996 when this law was introduced to the City Council. Because she's rewriting history. <coughs> she said, Deborah Wright, that key to addressing housing needs in the city were the new features of this proposed law. A critical part of the answer, quote, was identifying troubled buildings at an earlier stage where intervention was likely to be successful and having the flexible tools necessary to prevent abandonment to the largest extent possible. Rather than allowing arrears to build up, make early interventions when debt was manageable. That's a no-brainer. So one, an early warning system was supposed to be a part of this program. Two, she said, HPD will work closely with DOF to identify properties that can benefit from a package of assistance more likely to lead to stabilization than tax foreclosure. This assistance may take the form of low interest loans, technical assistance, and mortgage debt restructuring. Finally, she recommended <laughs> that the provisions for installment payments provide reasonable opportunities for owners to pay arrears and retain ownership. She noted that the current system was set up to fail and that three or four such agreements ended in default. The new law was supposed to prevent the fault by early intervention, lower interest rates on payment plans, which is not happening now, for example, with water, uh, because, as you know, even with Article 11 applications, and we've helped a number of buildings to file, right, water penalties still continue to be onerous, right, um, and they don't cut deals. Um, we contend that the process that's being used now, uh, I'm sorry, we contend that the process of first preventing foreclosures envisioned in her intro for property owners is even more crucial for HDFCs whose owners, as you know, have invested decades of sweat and real equity and are primarily people of color and now senior citizens. I'm one of those people. I moved into a building in 1979, right, and we organized it. Um, 
and we're now all senior if, if, citizens. If you could right? sum it up. We have equity. We're not in trouble, but, but we're fighting for the buildings that got into trouble. Uh, <coughs> if you can sum it up. Okay. Whatever. One moratorium. We will support the idea of a moratorium on foreclosures until real assistance as envisioned in the original legislation is to put into place. Two, shareholders have to be a part of that process. We actually know these issues deeper than anybody, I think, that works at HPD. It's in the power of the City Council to do it, and I just want to end with urging you to use that power to save our homes. Thank you. Um, the next person. My name is Louise Clark. I'm a if you can speak into the microphone. Oh. Okay. I want to thank you. For, I want to thank you for having us, um, Torres and um, Carnegie. For one thing, I agree with everything you guys and you did your homework as far as the TPT, as far as the HDFCs, as far as the shareholders, and I agree 100. percent So I'm not going to. I'm just going to piggyback on that. But for one thing, I like to say that. Um, as I'm not in the TPT, I haven't been affected by the TPT, but I am a before. I am a building that's in stress in Brooklyn. I can honestly say that in my neighborhood that a billionaire has bought four buildings on Clifton Place in Brooklyn that um, has management, and I know that he is a billionaire because my S&J, where I get the oil from, the owner came out and I says, why are you out here? He said, oh, I just came to congratulate you. You should be very happy that you got the billionaire over here. Meanwhile, this billionaire has a management corporation that's managing it, and he is from um, Germany, and he bought four buildings. But what I want to say is, is that in the HDFC, as being the HDFC um, since 1996, well, um, the main things that we need is resources. Having the same resources that they offer, the TPT developers and the investors, the low interest loans, the um, resources, we need those resources. And uh, we need a legal system that works. One of the reasons why the building is in stress that I have right now is having, um, we had a fire, and in the fire, that person was a drug dealer, they sold drugs, they had male prostitution going on in there. We joined the FTAP program. They never came out to inspect the building. We did all these things. Now the city is putting, um, or have to go to court on the 26th, they putting down a special, what is it, a special um, to, to put a lien to make you do the building. You guys are welcome to come. The building is not falling apart. It's the apartment that they have that they're trying to get back in, and they want a special unit to fix it up where they're going to put a lien on the building where we already got out of the taxes, made an agreement with the, um, um, with the water. Now we're going to end up with liens from, from lack of repairs. All these things that, to me, is like HPD is working to get this property that we have. No matter what I do to try to get out, we can't get out. I can't sell because if you can just conclude you know but we just need your help and resources one of the resources is they should provide a, when they call in 311 for the hdfc co they should have a special unit a special legal unit a special court in the system that deals with hdfc that will understand the hdfcs and how they work to make the um, uh, responsible shareholders be responsible and know the rights of um, tenants and things of that nature that's basically what i have to say and also h the um, I like to say that um, having ownership for low income does work. I am a mother of four. I raised, and thank goodness for ownership and being in the HDFCs and being an opportunity to have this, because without that, I don't know where I would have been, and all four of my children are doing great. Four, they, I have they, the oldest one has a double master's work for the federal government. The other one works for Perth Eastman, which is an architect firm. The other one works in the Middle East. And my grandson is now serving. He was just deployed to Syria. So I can say um, the low income having these homes for parents, and I'm a single parent, like I said before, that raised four children with no child support, and all of my children being able to have a decent home where they wouldn't have to worry about being put out tomorrow and having a parent that can afford that, they was able to go to college, get um, um, tap and pell, not only that, scholarships to be able to be successful black children. And they are children that are coming back that won't even have a place to stay. The neighbor next door, her child came 
came from Morehouse, told him to go to school, graduate, you come back, you have a home. He can't even have a home when he comes back. He has to stay with his mother because he can't afford. On the our block, the two, that, bedroom, ma'am, two that, bedrooms, $4,500. Amazing story, um, and, and thank your son for his service. Um, grandson. Oh, grandson. Oh, see you. <laughs> Deceptively young you look, so. Yeah, I'm 61 years old. I was born in my age. God bless you. Next. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Raphael Works. I'm the chairman, CEO, and founder of the Veterans, Assault, Veterans Development Initiatives, and I'd like to thank the council, Chairman Cornegy, Chairman Torres, and the rest of the council members for allowing me to testify today. I'll try to be as brief as I possibly can in this juncture. As a resident and a business owner, my family and, and I has, has resided in Building 522 West 158th Street for more than 89 years since 1930. I for more than 50 years. I've always sought to have this building renovated and eventually passed over to tenants as an HDFC owners and in, in a brand new facility. These dreams apparently are fading from existence due to the capricious manner in which HPD has been advising tenants to oversee and particularly in ANCP, Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program. Our building requested to have a meeting with one of the representatives of the aforementioned roughly two weeks ago, which was almost about a month ago. They visited and attempted to explain how the program would work if the tenants decided to collectively join such a program. To my surprise, it appeared that most, if not all, of the information provided was a smokescreen to get our tenants to agree to a program based on false advertisement and information that would eventually bound them to exorbitant maintenance fees and a continuous rent increase each year. This was not explained and purposely left out as it would decimate funds that each member would rely on to sustain themselves and their families for the duration. I do, I do need you to summarize it, though. Okay. You're reading it. This, uh, this process has been an ongoing, ongoing issue that has apparently continued to provide a, a level of neglect, and especially in the TPT process of which we're discussing today, it really does not in any way help our building move forward. We've been in the TIL program for a very long time, approximately 17 years. Since December of 2002, nothing has happened. So we had somebody from the uh, ANCP project come in and actually speak to us, but never told us anything about the transfer, the TPT process, and what that would be, and what it entailed. It did, they didn't advise us of such, so it left us very, very uh, uh, scrutinizing of the information of which they delivered. So many of us have not taken any necessary uh, forward balance to actually say we're going to sign or move into the program at all because we need more information. We need more clarity and we need more information to actually get this program. But right now, from what I'm hearing since I've been here, uh, since 1 o'clock today, it seems as though I don't even think that this process is even an equitable process for anybody to actually get into at this point. So I think there's a lot of things that need to change. Changing it on you guys' hands as the city council members and HPD, I think it needs to be a collaborative effort, and I think we need to move forward starting there before we can actually try to ridicule and scorn all of these citizens that are actually put their hard-earned trust and money into having their own places and owning their own buildings and then losing them. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. You. Um, <clears throat> so not to underscore the importance of this issue, but I'm here on a different matter. Uh, mm. Chairman Torres, <clears throat> honorable members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I'm Scott Lavery, Director of Advocacy and Government Affairs with the AFED, Young Advocates for Fair Education. We're a nonprofit advocacy group devoted to ensuring that children in New York's uh, Hasidic and ultra-Orthodox yeshivas receive a substantially equivalent secular education as required by New York State law. <clears throat> 
This week is the four-year anniversary of our complaint with the New York City Department of Education, which under state law is responsible for all non-public schools within its jurisdiction. In response to our complaint, which named 39 non-public schools where graduates and parents allege little to no secular education was being taught, the DOE launched an investigation. It's been four years and the investigation is not concluded with only one update in August of 2018. Um, this investigation has been long and protracted and it's completely frustrating and unjustified. Chairman Torres, members of the committee, I hope that in the coming weeks and months you'll yeah. aggressively okay. seek answers as to why uh, the DOE so, investigating. So, so sir, your, your topic has no relevance to the subject of today's hearing, but, but it seems like you want me to follow up on the status of the Absolutely, Yeshiva sir. investigation. Absolutely. I will reach out to GOI. I will get you a status update. Absolutely. Do you need uh, contact information or anything? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Gloria Ann Hussey Kirstein. I am an HDFC shareholder for 25 years in a building where I lived for 37 years, West 106th Street in Manhattan Valley, Manhattan. I'm also part of the HDFC Coalition, a volunteer organization of HD, HDFC shareholders, which seeks to protect the HDFC community from policies oh, yeah. generated by the city that are harmful to HDFC shareholders. You are very right to focus on HDFC co-ops as being targeted by the TPT program. HDFC co-ops comprise only 1.5% of all apartment buildings in New York City, but comprised 44% of those buildings that were facing foreclosure, 1.5% versus 44%. Clearly, HDFC co-ops were overrepresented. Two years ago, we formed an anti-foreclosure committee in the coalition. We have been out to 34 HDFCs in three boroughs over a 20-month period, giving them technical assistance, having a tax expert work up the Article 11 application, of which 12 were done. We saved 18 HDFCs, 502 units, from foreclosure by collaborating with City Council and uh, negotiating with HPD to take them off the TPT list. We feel HPD is living on another planet because the 34 we went out to, they were not getting robocalls. They were not getting flyers under the doors or posts in the lobbies, except from the coalition. So at this point, I want to address two other issues very, very clearly. I but work but very quickly. Yes. I worked for HPD for 26 years in code enforcement. What HPD doesn't tell you about the violations of record are three things. Ancients that were generated under the old landlords and HPD itself. Number two, dupes. A lot of those violations are the same violation generated from one week to the next when the inspector goes back out, sees the same violation, writes it again. And third, revenge violations. When the board's doing due diligence, bringing non-paying residents to court, the first thing you do is call 311, let everyone in, and violations are written up the kazoo, even ones that the shareholder is responsible for. Given all of the experience that we in the HGFC Coalition have had, we did ask HPD August 1 of 2017 for a working group that would include the three main agencies, city council staff, HDFC advocates, to scrutinize the foreclosure and TPT programs, HPD turned us down flat. We're suggesting for this TPT task force that now HPD, two years later, because of your scrutiny, is saying they're going to establish, you must have HDFC advocacy uh, uh, advocacy organizations involved because HPD is not going to police themselves or reform themselves. And we don't want to repeat past mistakes. Nicely done. Uh, th thank you for your testimony. We want to call up the next panel. I'm Beverly Curry. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't, I always forget that. Excuse them. me. I, it was my mistake. I'm sorry. Beverly Curry from Brooklyn Coalition, HDFC. I worked in the field, door to door, rain, shine, sleet of snow, hot days, scorching days like today, day and night, going from door to door, telling the people about the foreclosure. People did not receive any foreclosure notice that I visited in the 18 uh, HDFCs in Brooklyn. Four families there recognized the fact that I was there to let them know that HDFC were being, their buildings were being foreclosed through our organization, which is a Brooklyn Coalition. Okay, now, in respect to that, we had four to come off the foreclosure list, four buildings to come off the foreclosure list. One of them were out in East New York with Representative Barron and his, um, and council, 
Oh, there's the bell again. You have five minutes, I have three minutes. I need to talk because people did not know, my final thing, that they were in foreclosure. And HD, HPD said, sat here and said, they put things under their door. They did not do that. They received what we put under the door. We put it on the outside of the door, the inside of the door, and we put hand put, and we invited them out to our meetings. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we'll call up the next panel. And Carlton Burroughs, Brenda Stokely, Ismani Spiliotis, M. E. Green Cohen and Thomas Winston. I just want to submit for the record the following comment from Council Member Farrah Lewis. Uh, declining home ownership is an incredibly prevalent issue in my district and overall within black and brown communities in New York City. The fact that homeowners felt they were disproportionately targeted for the third party transfer program is unconscionable. Beyond that, I'm incredibly outraged that some homes seem to have been arbitrarily targeted for the TPT program, whether or not they were considered distressed properties. I find it hard to believe both agencies do not have better steps and measures for tax collection that does not involve threatening homeowners with the loss of their home. Additionally, the very possibility of such a demonstrable discrepancy in valuations of properties is alarming. Accepting this discrepancy as true, how can the lean to value ratio ever be a fair criteria to enter homes into TPT? We are stewards of our great city, and it is unacceptable to continue to rob homeowners of equity, generational wealth, and being part of the American dream. This testimony from Councilmember Farrah Lewis is submitted for the record. I'd also like to invite up Annie Wilson Miguet. <coughs> is she still in attendance? In that case, uh, Siobhan Dolan. Rebecca Major as well, I'm sorry. Ms. Major. Um, I'm going to ask again that you um, state your name for the record and to the instance that you can, please try to be clear and concise with your testimony. You can begin at any time. Yes, ma'am, you have to press the uh, button and if you see the, right, the red light illuminated, okay. it signifies that you are ready to speak. Thank you. My name is Brenda Stokely. I'm one of the co-chairs, you heard from the other two, from Brooklyn Coalition of HDFCs. Um, We've also collaborated with all other groups that have been fighting hard to try to rectify this nonsense, and I have to call it just what it is, and the lies that were told today by the staff. Um, I'm here to basically suggest things that didn't just come from us, it came from all the people we spoke to. And unfortunately, it would have been helpful, and I know your time is stressed, but we work and we went to every single one of the HDFCs to speak to the people, as, as was said earlier. And I think it would have been very helpful if that had been uh, attempted by everyone else. Uh, on the, so you could really see what was going on and actually speak to the real people and find out that most of them are seniors, most of them are black and Latino women, most of them are on fixed incomes, and most of them have lived in the houses for almost 30 years, and the houses are, are over 100 years old for the most part. So you should just be able to see that there was going to be a problem, not because people are stupid and don't know how to handle their affairs, because you're getting 100 old buildings that were left in ill repair when they first came. They had um, violations that were supposed to be move, removed when HPD first started working with them to form co-ops, and they never removed them, so those are still hanging on the uh, place, and that was being used to discredit the people that were there. So one of the things that I think is very, very important 
is one is that we must honor and respect the people who are actually living in these places and learn from them what they need and what they can contribute. Number two, I think that we need, uh, whatever this group is, this working group, we need to be on that group. We, our say-so needs to be on that group because we're living in those places every single day. And we can tell you all of the things that we try to go through, people taking money out of their own uh, pockets, money out of their own pensions to help keep it alive. You need to know that because we're not sitting there being slouches and trying to get over on anybody. We're trying to live in housing that originally would have gone by the wayside if for not us living in them and doing the best to keep them going on all these decades. Secondly, those people who abandoned the building and didn't pay their taxes, they should have been put in jail. You want to find somebody to discredit, it should have been those people. Nothing happened to them. But now, in this period of time, when all this gentrification is co coming on, you're actually correct. Yes, it's identical to the places that were left abandoned or they either tried to burn down whole neighborhoods. So now these places, they want them back. It's very simple. It's not something magical. They want the buildings back and they want us out. That's what they want. And we need to fight like hell not to let them, let them do that. We need um, also all of the money that you can give the developers, all of the 8A loans you can give them, the J51 loans, the zero interest loans, if you have, this city has money to give it to rich people, they should have given it to the HDFC so they could repair their own houses, so they could be able to do the capital uh, improvements, so they could be able to fix places up and handle things in a better way because they have resources. S lastly, it is not, we cannot separate the deed theft from what's going on. That has to be part of the package because that same group that was mentioned by the elder sister, that same group was going around to all the HDFCs that were on the foreclosure list, they had the list, and they were telling, lying and saying they were from HPD when they were not. They were telling people to abandon the buildings and they were telling them that they would find them apartments and they would do all manner of things when they were all lie, lies. And they were also trying to get people's deeds and their shareholder certificates. So they're very, and they're still out here. They're still out here. They're going around still trying to co-opt people into dealing with them and also coming up with all manner of schemes to take over empty apartments in those buildings. So that is something that cannot be separated. We can't sleep on it because before we know it, they're going to be creating some, a whole a bunch of havoc in the HDF, HDFCs. In addition to can, this, we, we um, need, um, I have one more thing to say. Conclude, we need yeah. a clinic in every community, in every borough that is mandated to be able to assist HDFCs, not the neighborhood housing uh, services, not you have that actually stole a tenant's money under the belief that they were going to be able to get them insurance when they knew that they were not working under the contract with, with, uh, with the city anymore. So we need to have clinics that we that can be staffed by people to bring all the services that we need. We need a moratorium on foreclosures and on the TB. And I think the TBT needs to be thrown out, and I'm going to say why, because it was never intended for us. It was intended by law for private entities, not for us. And how it got over to be applied to us is a mystery that we need to break that mystery and find it out. It serves no purpose okay. except for to rob property okay. from us. And as far as I'm concerned, we're not going to have another Seneca village here around this place. We're not going to be moved, and we're not going to lose our homes, and we're not going to lose our equity. It's out and out theft that this agency is involved in and other people higher up and involved in. And also, the last thing I want to say is be strong and cor courageous, just like our sister Baron was. All of you could have stopped and said no. I'm not going to let you take these people. I'm going to check out and find out what's going with them. I'm going to see how I could help them. Then we wouldn't be sitting here having this discussion okay. in the first place. Thank you for your testimony. Next, please. 
Hello, my name is Rebecca Major. I am a, the secretary. I'm here to just describe the mis, uh, lack of proper like notification and information. Um, from my experience, I joined the board of my building at 499 West 158th Street um, uh, when we were served with a foreclosure notice, and um, whereas to this day we don't know if the former board did receive a notification. But we received a notification in the form of uh, um, the third party transfer notification on the door. And that caused a lot of alarm uh, in our uh, shareholders. After that, two other um, shareholders received letters um, after the fact, uh, as far as we know. So that was the beginning. And um, we were not aware of the redemption period and the discretionary period, which is a very important timeline. Um, we uh, got ourselves reorganized as a board and we, um, we submitted our Article 11 application within two months in November of 2017. Uh, we were in direct communication with HPD, henceforth. They knew us by face, they knew us by contact information at no point do they tell us of our rights on a very basic timeline terms about um, the redemption period or the discretionary period, which caused our building to make certain um, decisions. We decided that we, uh, as a drastic uh, last resort, to uh, begin a contract into a um, predatory loan to save our building as a last resort. We were days away and spent thousands of dollars to uh, get our building assessed and uh, lawyers' fees, and in the last moment we pulled out of the deal because we uh, it was just so bad. It was like I said, a, uh, a predatory loan. We shouldn't have gone through all that if we had just known our basic rights. Um, after that, we were in very high alert, and we decided that the best course of action would be to enter into a bankruptcy protection, which we are still in now. The bankruptcy protection has given us time to um, catch our breath and to uh, deal with just ongoing uh, management of the building. And, but the, it's an incredibly expensive uh, endeavor. The bankruptcy attorneys are more uh, expense costly than a normal housing attorney, for instance. That money would have been better spent paying back our debts to the city but they require 50% um, lump sum to enter a repayment program for taxes, unlike the DOF. So that was inhibitive. As I said, it's been a learning process, day by day, week by week, month by month. In fact, today I learned also that, um, as I mentioned, we had our property assessed as part of the um, process for getting a loan. I just learned today that we weren't uh, by, definition of the 15% ratio that we were not in financial distress all along. <laughs> but in any case, so thank you for um, uh, letting me be heard. Hello. Uh, my name is Siobhan Dolan, and I live in a secure HDFC, but I'm, I'm here to hear the stories of others who are in insecure HDFCs. Um, so I, I just want to say that I, I've been a nurse for a number of years working in the city shelter system. And one of the most basic of the hierarchy of a human being's needs is that of having air, food, clothing, and shelter. That is the most basic thing of the five hierarchies of need. If um, I, I have concerns, because I would see in the shelter system that if you came in being balanced mentally, you, you often had problems long before you left of depression and anxiety and all the difficulties of losing your home. So I have concerns for what hangs over a person's head in, in fear of, of foreclosure. So I, I want to say that I, I do feel very moved by all that's been said at these tables here, and it gives me hope. 
that with your intelligence and appreciation for humanity, <coughs> that we can move forward in the best way possible. Um, I also want to say that um, in, in hearing what some people of the Anti-Foreclosure Committee of the HDFC Coalition, what they have done in avoiding the foreclosure of 502 apartment units is, is really magnificent. And that's less than, than five people, two or three people carrying the heavy load of that work. <laughs> and it's very interesting to me that, as somebody pointed out here, that there's three people in HBD who are, who are doing the work. It's, it's clearly not enough. Um, let's see. Um, I, I guess, you know, I, I, I want to include at, in finishing that, um, and I, I, I'm not coming from a sarcastic point of view, but I, I, was, I was really shocked, overwhelmingly shocked, that the HPD group left with not hearing these stories. That, 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 that hurt me and, and worries me. But I, I have confidence in you. And um, I, I am sure that things can be changed. We, we can do it. And um, I, I, with all this, this word transfer has come up what, hundreds of times today. And I believe that we need a transfer, not coming from sarcasm, just reality, a transfer of an understanding of people's stories and listening and humanity amongst the HPD committee, you know, that is addressing this issue of of foreclosure. So uh, I'll, I'll just end with that and thank you very much. Walter. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carlton Burroughs and I'm living this nightmare of uh, the third party transfer program. I want to say thank you to Chair Carnegie, Chair uh, Richie Torres, especially to you, Richie. You took the time to listen to us and we appreciate that. And I, I'm not just speaking for uh, the building that I live in. I'm also speaking for the hundreds of uh, residents in other HDFCs who are suffering as a result of a program that was absolutely uh, designed to fail. This hearing is about oversight. And um, due to a lack of oversight in our situation, nothing about it is legal. The way we became a co a HDFC co-op was done on an absolute fraudulent basis. I handed folders to the council today uh, just highlighting our building. Due to a lack of oversight, um, there's fraudulent filings where they misrepresent what's actually being done in the alleged renovation. Say, for instance, our building, they borrowed $6 million without our input, did not do the work. The job is still open with the buildings department. Fraudulently filed the, um, the type of work that they were going to do, registered the total cost of the job or the estimated cost of the job at $180,000. Now this is direct evidence, and we have a series of buildings that are HDFCs that participated in the third party transfer program using the same contractor who did not bid on the job, he was selected for the job by HPD, did not go through the regular protocol as should anybody that tries to get a contract with uh, the city, the municipality, and any government money is involved. They did not follow that protocol. That's due to a lack of oversight. Due to a lack of oversight, the, the, the contractor that got the job for our building received a deposit of $3,912,000, where the job was at that time budgeted at $4 million. So he got 90% of the money up front and didn't do the work. But yet we're stuck with 10, I mean $6 million of debt where we didn't get what we were promised, and we're in foreclosure, where the bank never had standing. So how is this going unnoticed by, by New York City? 
We have examples, I mean, not examples, but factual evidence that shows that in another building, they borrowed $46 million on a partial renovation, didn't do the work, the building is still falling apart, and they just borrowed another $30 million. This is all taxpayers' money. And the part that, that's not coming up at this hearing is the criminality of it all. Yeah. HPD is absolutely a criminal organization. It makes way for, for these developers, these hand-selected, pre-selected developers, and just as she alluded to, all of these people were the previous landowners or building owners, they want their properties back. And what's the vehicle in which they use to get them back? HPD, because HPD does not care about these hybrid programs that they set up. What they care about is giving all the breaks to the private developer, their pre-selected friends, their, the people who make contributions to certain politicians' campaigns, because a lot of this stuff has been signed off on by politicians. Look at this bill that, that recently came to my mind is uh, Local Law 64. If you're concerned about Brooklyn, then you need to look at that bill and see that it's specifically tailor-made to target the, the, the brownstones in Brooklyn and wherever else in the city that there are valuable brownstones. In our case, HPD did not follow the law at all. Their criminal partners like you have, you have, there needs to be an investigation and there needs to be a moratorium okay. on the third party transfer program. Me personally, it needs to be done away with completely but I'm willing to work with some sensible folks who are in touch with the reality of what's going on that are living in these HDFCs because the people that are making the decisions for the HDFCs don't have a clue about what it is that we're going through. Who best to tell and come up with solutions than the people who live in it? Carlton, I need you, if you can conclude. Yeah, I'm concluded. Thank you. Uh, well, 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 great. Guess we'll call up the next panel. Uh-oh, I forgot. Just, oh, you can hear, okay. Thomas Winston, I'm Mary Elizabeth Green Cohen, his wife. I sent all my correspondence regarding all this um, controversy regarding our relationship with 938 St. Nicholas Avenue as M.E., also known as Mrs. Winston. Thomas has asked me to um, read his testimony, but I'll be very quick. Uh, he begins, quote, I, Thomas Winston, and my wife, Emmy Green Cohen, are the first shareholders residing at 938 St. Nicholas Avenue. On May 1st, 2000, I signed the lease for apartment 31 as, with the then 7A administrator, to lease apartment 31, which had been vacant for over 10 years. The 7A administrator did not have the funds to renovate and prepare the apartment for rental. The agreement between the parties entailed rent credits against the state at monthly lease while I conducted and paid for the renovation. We entered into this agreement because it was an affordable investment that would allow us to consolidate our two households and cease to live separately. The building was slated to become a cooperative and we thought that our money, time, and sweat equity investment would be re rewarded over time. In May 2001, the City of New York Commissioner of Finance conveyed 936, 938 St. Nicholas Avenue, the building, to Neighborhood Restore in exchange for the sum of $1. In December 2002, Neighborhood Restore conveyed the building to Shuhav HDFC in exchange for the sum of $1. In July 2002, Shuhav HDFC entered into an agreement with contractor Delwood Construction to perform work at the building. Delwood was given a deposit of $3,912,000 without scope of work compliance. During this period, I served as Sergeant at Arms of the 936-938 St. Nicholas Avenue Tenants Association. After receiving many complaints from tenants regarding shardy work, we formed a construction committee that I chaired to monitor the work progress. We lived happily, my wife and I lived happily <coughs> Uh, until we were forced out of apartment 31 for uh, re refurbishing renovation by Shuhab for a period, supposedly for a period of two to three months. 
Unfortunately, it ended up being 13 months due to SHUHAB's noncompliance with its um, own relocation agreement. In August 2005, we were informed by the HVD that a rent increase based on the cost of renovation mortgage would become effective. We informed HVD that the renovation was shoddy and incomplete and not deserving of a rent increase. We also informed public officials about our concerns regarding the misuse of public funds. In April 2006, the uh, tenant association to, okay, yeah. the tenant, we, we hired an engineer and a survey company to inform um, and accredit the fact that none of this, none of those repairs were done in the, in the proper manner. As a result, uh, attached to this, to his correspondence, is a complaint listing that began in September 2004. Nothing has been done. The conditions remain the same. We have been fighting and, and ex ex extrapolating for 15 years now. And the only comp answer that we've had is that HPD certified the work was complete, and you are, you are sentenced to disrepair prison for all this time. Um, something has to give. HPD um, uh, does not or should not, um, a city agency should not over, 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 oversee a state agency. We, we're, we, just because we're in an HDFC, we're not second-class citizens. We're still taxpayers. And because we live in an HDFC, it's like we are relegated to, from, into stereotypical thinking that we're not of value. And we are to suck and to, 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 to accept whatever we have been given because, quote, you got this. You got this a building, these apartments for little money, and so you should be happy. But on the other hand, we all would have been better off if we had remained rent stabilized tenants, and 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 as we did in apartment 31, we spent twenty thousand dollars in cash, twenty thousand dollars of our sweat equity to make that place livable. We could have hired an electrician and a plumber to do what they did that they claim they spent $120,000 per apartment for. It's full of fraud, and someone needs to go to jail. I have this uh, picture. And I, I, I do need you to conclude because okay, I'm going to we have conclude a few more panels. very quickly. This is Thomas and I in 2006. This is us now. We, people should not we shouldn't be suffering like this because we live in housing development companies. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, man. Thank you for your testimony. We're going to call the next panel. I'm sorry. Who's Sean Abbott. Sandra Erickson. Bobby Wells. Marie Matthew. Berman Castro. And Emily Kurtz. I will call it again Emily Kurtz, Furman Castro, Marie Matthew, Bobby Wells, Sandra Erickson, Sean Abbott. Who's going? Is, is Van still here? Van Walker? I think, I think we, can, we can begin now. Do, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah. I want to start with Nate. Which, which, uh, Theo Chin, I'm sorry. Is this live? My name is Sean Abbott. I would like to apologize to the chairman 
um, because I was extremely rude to the chairman prior to the meeting. Um, but uh, you are the boss of the place, so. Uh, uh, I, I want to commend the chairman um, and Mr. Torres especially for their interrogation of these terrible people who were here earlier and who fled the room in disgrace, in disgrace. And I do want to know, well, why didn't you call after them and say you must come back here and listen to the testimony of these people who are suffering in their homes? It's an outrage that they left, and they're not here to hear us. Now, I'm going to change the topic just slightly off of our very narrow focus on TPT, which doesn't need to exist at all. If we look at the ceiling, at that panel right there, George Washington said, our commercial policy should have an equal and impartial hand. Is that what that panel says on the ceiling right there? I believe it does. I believe I have read it properly. Now, what is going on here is very simply that we don't have any equality. The solution to our problems is not that we need to be more disciplined because we can't take care of our own buildings. The problem is that there are all these sweetheart deals and giveaway and, frankly, welfare for the corporations, the corporate landlords, the billionaires. What is the failure to tax the billionaires? What is this that I hear that 432 Park Avenue doesn't have to pay the taxes that I do in my HDFC for 12 years because of a little pocket park that they inserted next to their building where only billionaires live? Um, Mr. Torres said something that is very important and bears repeating. He talked about the weaponization of TPT also described it as uniquely draconian, but at the same time said, I find value in it. Now, over there in the corner at that time, there was the Daily News and the New York Post, and God knows if they'll cover this, but that's the sort of quote that they pick up, and then it seems like you're neutral on it, and they miss that you were interrogating these people, and they miss the fact that these people fled the meeting, and they should have stayed here. 30 0.4 million is owed by these HDFCs, get it from the billionaires. Figure out as a body that look up at the ceiling on occasion and read that quote. And for once, could we start by asking this question? Kui bono, who benefits from TPT? The landlords, the commercial landlords who abandoned these properties in the first place decades ago. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairs Carnegie and Torres and committee members for the opportunity to testify before you today. My name is Emily Kurtz, and I am the Vice President of Housing at Riseboro Community Partnership. I am here to share with you how very important the third party transfer program has been to Riseboro's neighborhood stabilization efforts in and around Bushwick. Riseboro has partnered with HPD and Neighborhood Restore on multiple rounds of the third party program. My very first development project when I joined Riseboro in 2004 was West Bushwick TPT. In my role as project manager, I met with tenants during the stabilization period of the program, often in their homes. During these visits, I witnessed families living in rented homes that had been abandoned by their owners, years of disinvestment, deplorable, unhealthy, and unlivable conditions. These tenants were distrustful of our interests, assured we were only there to provide promises that we would break and to take advantage and displace. I could not blame them, given the conditions in which they were forced to live, paying rent to a landlord who did nothing to maintain their homes. In time and with effort, the tenants in the West Bushwick TPT cluster came to trust our efforts to stabilize and improve their homes. We prioritized, we prioritized engagement and communication, we shared architectural plans and scope, and we found interim relocation apartments that caused as little disruption to daily life as possible. We made good on our promise to improve conditions in their original homes, which in most cases required gutting the apartments, reconfiguring layouts to better accommodate for family size, and bringing the buildings into compliance with current building codes. Through these efforts, we preserved 43 units of affordable housing in Bushwick, with rents affordable to the tenants who had for years put up with deplorable living conditions. We saved nine buildings in the heart of Bushwick, and those units remain affordable today. 25 of the units are still occupied by the household that moved in at construction completion nearly 15 years ago. TPT is a stabilizing factor in our community, the opposite of a displacement program. I know this has been a very controversial 
controversial afternoon. I just thought you should hear from someone from an organization, a neighborhood organization has you, that has worked with the TPT program to, to stabilize communities and, and has done well for, for the renters, providing them with stabilized leases. Um, and I'll leave the rest of my comments um, in your packet. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. My name is Sandra Erickson. I'm the president of my own firm, we do a real estate management firm licensed by New York State for over 35 years. We're a certified MWBE fir firm focused on the management, creation, and rehabilitation of affordable housing in the Bronx. I'm a longtime resident of the Bronx and deeply involved in the community, serving 20 years on Community Board 7, vice president of the Chamber of Commerce, and many other uh, community activities. My firm has participated in HPD's third-party transfer program back since 2005. Our first building we took over was the worst building in the neighborhood, uh, overrun with drug trafficking. We secured the property and took care of all emergency conditions. A plan to rehab the building was undertaken. All tenants were temporarily re relocated to facilitate the work. No resident was displaced and everyone now appreciates a beautiful new apartment and a rent-stabilized lease. Uh, our next cluster was very similar, four buildings. Uh, we took over in December of 2011, a broken heating system. The residents approved uh, a swift and kind attention we provided to these buildings. And uh, again, we, that building is successfully rehabbed. No tenants were displaced and previously no one had rent-stabilized leases, they all do now. The current round uh, are all former HDFCs uh, in Community District 16. We've worked closely with our local council member uh, in these buildings. They're in various states of disrepair, from poor to extremely poor condition. The roof leaks were some of the worst I've ever seen, cascading into vacant and occupied units. Heating systems in the largest building was badly leaking, in dire need of repair. Serious roof plumbing, brick pointing had to be handled. The same building's management was illegally collecting broker's fees, only repairing units for tenants they liked. And in another building, we're in the process of a full vacate due to extreme dilapidated conditions. Drug trafficking and squatter units in two of the three buildings necessitated legal holdover action. We've experienced the success of TPT and believe in the program, as do our residents and the community members the buildings are a part of. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bobby Wells. It's nice seeing all of you, besides seeing you on TV all the time. <laughs> How you guys doing? Okay. Um, I'm here to just point out about the TPT. That was my building, the first picture you showed up there, 1211. Uh, you can see from the picture that uh, uh, as the, the, when we was waiting for HPD, you know, I, w I was always calling them, you know, because I was left to, they told me to try to hang in there and uh, manage, the, you know, uh, maintain the building until help arrived, you know. So to me, TPT came, when they came, it was like a godsend, you know, really, because when they came along, the first day they came, as soon as they walked on the block, right away they started asking, uh, take them through the building, show them who's here, tenants, whatever problem. That and whatever you told them you needed to be done or they seen, they made calls and they had people come to work right then and there that same day, making all kind of emergency repairs. I mean, all through the night, the next day, whatever. So, and they, um, they place people, you know, and everybody's, everybody's happy they got the right, the guaranteed inviting to come back when the building is, is done. And all I can say is these people came and they did what they, they were supposed to do for everybody because that building was basically falling down on top of us. I, I wanna thank you for offering that perspective because that's a perspective that we hadn't heard today. Thank you for um, offering that. I think it's important to hear from everyone and that's why these hearings are important. Um, they're generally not one-sided 
And I was surprised that there wasn't someone who had come to spoke about some of the benefits of the third party transfer program. So thank you for offering that perspective. I think it's important for us to hear. You're very welcome. So as soon as I heard about they was trying to take the program, I said, I will go down there with you myself. Thank you. We're going to call the next panel. Anthony Cunningham, Isabel Adon, Frank Ramon Fuentes, uh, I can't pronounce the first name, I'm sorry, Antonio, last name, Jose Sanchez, and Karen Greenwood. If your name was called, please come up. If you have copies of any statements, we'll take them now. Uh, can I call two more people, please? James uh, Dukery and Cynthia Shepard. James Dukery, Cynthia Shepard. Cynthia Shepard. Deanne Rupert McDonald. Deanne and Rupert McDonald. and Kingsley Palmer. Again, I'll just remind you to um, speak directly into the microphone, state your name, uh, press the button, and when you see the red light illuminated, it means that it is your turn to speak. Uh, you can begin whenever you like. My name is Isabel Adon. I reside at 1600 Nelson Avenue which is a HDFC in the Bronx. I came to this country in 1978, just before entering adolescence. The Bronx as I know it now was not the Bronx that was then. My entire block was completely empty except for my building. The only building standing was my building and then another building two blocks away. I bought my apartment for $250 when I was 19 years old. And I had lived there since 1978. And I am probably one of the people who have lived there the shortest time. I actually submitted to the um, council member and to the investigation committee a list of the original shareholders. And out of those, there's a few that have passed on, but the majority of them remain there. I just want to say that today, in this moment, we stand in already stolen land. We stand in the land of the Lenape, the Rockaways, and the Canarsis. And that tradition of stealing land and stealing property still continues today, taking something away from those who have worked so hard to get the American dream. I wish that the people from HPD have given us the dignity to stay and listen to us. And by their leaving, it just confirmed what I already know. We do not matter. And we matter so little that they didn't even want to stay to listen to what we have to say. It didn't matter whether we agree or disagree with them or whether we support the program or we don't. But it does matter to me that today I really feel like I did not matter, that what I have to say was not important enough for them to stay. And I am so saddened by that because I stand here today knowing that we lost our case at the Supreme Court level with Judge um, Barbato. And we are going to appeal, but the HPD sat here and say that they came to our building. I don't know about anybody else's building, that, that they came to our building and notify us it's a lie. No one, no one has ever come to our building. No one has ever come to our rescue. You have, has never been in our building. There has never been anyone extending our hand to us. And that they sat here and lie, it is, un I cannot even conceive that. Um, I just wanna say, I wanna thank you 
Richie Torres, and I want to thank um, Cabrera. He already left, and Carnegie. But Mr. Cabrera, Fernando Cabrera, came to our building, and he can attest that our building is not in distress. I have two jobs so I could pay and maintain my building and raise my children. And I am probably the person who has invested the least in my apartment. And I have at least invested throughout those years at least $100,000. And that the city will come and take my sweat equity away without any kind of retribution is the same thing that they did to the African slave and to the African American community where there was no reparation, not even the 40 acres and a mule. And so I just want to say that, that to this day, the stealing property and taking away property continues. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for having us here. Um, I'm the board president of uh, an HDFC uh, 424 East 115th Street. And I had, um, sorry, my name is Frank Ramon Fuentes. And I had no idea uh, about the TPT, no, there was no information given to us, not directly, not through flyers, nothing. And so, um, by chance, I took it upon myself to, to go to Congressman, a council member Ayala's office on 116th Street, just to see if I can get uh, support. And, she heard, or at least the administration from the office heard me, and they were very, very, very helpful, and I'm very, extremely grateful to them to help us out, uh, to get us off of the TPT list. Not just them, but actually from them, they, uh, they veered us to uh, the wonderful HDFC uh, which coalition. coalition, who, help us in so many ways is it's really incredible. And so I just wanted to uh, make the testimony here to say that I'm very grateful uh, to them and to con uh, Council Member Ayala for everything and the administration as well. Thank you so much. So Council Member Ayala works incredibly hard. I'm gonna relay your message to her. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Kasaya Antonio. I'm an, I am a tenant at 1211 Washington Avenue, HDFC, in which my mother is, is Kalisha Antonio. She's a shareholder. I'm speaking on my mother's behalf in regards to an illegal third party transfer by Neighborhood Restore, and we are seeking an investigation into Neighborhood Restore because 1211 Washington HDSC was transferred to Neighborhood Restore without prior council approval. We ask for this matter to be reviewed before the city council and hope to get a favorable resolution in regard to maintaining 1211 Washington Avenue sometime in the near future. Pronounce, pronounce your name again? Kasaya. Sorry about that. Got you, it's all good. And I'm from the People's Committee. Karen Wee Greenwood, I'm from the People's Committee. Um, I'm here today to address about the fraud and foreclosure of my home by Chase Bank, not the original mortgager, and being defrauded by mortgage modification companies like Templeton Group that was indicted, and Homeowners Helpline, which is still on the air on 1190 AM, and I feel that these radio stations need to censor these, these organizations when they um, come on the air to advertise their programs because we have a lot of fraud programs right now on the radio. And people do get caught up believing that these programs they're introducing about helping you with modification programs actually work when they don't. 
I'm very um, disturbed to know that um, as a 9-11 victim, um, I had no other choice but to try to get modification because of my illness. And um, now, unfortunately, I'm in this position. And um, this, this judge by the name of Deer, uh, Michael Carlson Kennedy, the attorney, who is part of the modification scam program, is still in the courts. Um, my case is under investigation through the DA's office, and they responded to say to me that um, right now they can't tell me what's the update of my case. So at the same time, you're not telling me what's the update of my case. I am fighting for my case, fighting for my home, because I have no one out here to protect me. And so this is very stressful on me and my family. And we are asking for the moratorium. We need it right away. It's, it's really hurtful to see. At this time, 2019, we are suffering the way we are. And I'm asking you, in Jesus' name, to help us today. Please help us, because we need it. We have too many scammers out here, marshals, sheriffs, judges. And excuse me, any lawyers are here, but I'm saying it. Too many scammers. They have arrested our people illegally. And then they have a record. You push us to do modification and bankruptcy for what? When we are under investigation and we can prove our cases, it's just not fair. So where's the help? The nonprofit programs, they're not helping. They say they're putting $20 million in these programs. Where are they? They only limit to a certain amount of intake they're going to take. You're going to look at my income and tell me you can't help me, and then you limit to help me? That's not right. My taxpayer, I'm a taxpayer. I pay for assistance from the city, and I need it. So I'm asking everybody to look into these nonprofit programs who are supposedly supposed to be helping us. As we're going through the investigations with the DA office, which I'm not happy with, I'm not happy with, the D with um, Letitia James either. I need to know why isn't Como not signing this bill? Why we have to suffer? Every other bill has been signed in a second. And this one right here? We got five or six bills that need to be signed. Why isn't it signed? This could be over already. So I thank you for your time. I will not hold you up any longer. I'm just asking, please, when we leave here today, we need to feel re fulfilled, rejoice, knowing something's going to be done. Because we're tired of talking, we're tired of asking. We have been coming to too many hearings, and I'm not seeing nothing done. Please. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Deanne McDonald. I'm here with my senior citizen father, Rupert McDonald. Wave. Um, I was kidnapped out of my home. I paid for my home in full. I showed I was in foreclosure. All my taxes been paid. Uh, I've been in my home. We've been in our home since 2003. Uh, all the water bills are paid. We fix up our homes. And no matter what, uh, our home is stolen. Uh, we had an order to show cause to stop, to stay the sale of our home. And still, the fraudulent foreclosure sale went through auction. Uh, I reported no this and there's no lien on the property. I reported this to the DA. Of course, they don't want to deal with it. There's too much favoritism going on and too much on the, on the table. Uh, uh, yeah, the judges are not doing their jobs. They're ignoring it. Um, after all this, they sent us to housing court, brought us in there to take us out of our own home. Uh, they got a judgment against us. And I keep on showing them over and over. I have the last deed to the property. I, I showed them a certified race seal of the deed. And they totally ignored it. Um, 
I got so, had a lot of anxiety attacks because of it and sleepless nights. Um, at the hearing uh, in court, I needed to go to the bathroom and the judge refused to let me go. So eventually I just had to go and I got up and I slipped and uh, you, I showed a councilman where the, I was in the ER uh, getting painkillers, uh, devastated by the whole thing. And eventually uh, they put a judgment against me to evict me, to kidnap me out of my own home with my deed in my hand and my ID identification. Um, I spoke to Farrell's office and they said, look, that should have been over right there. You have your deed, you have your ID, you've been there since 2003, you owe no taxes, you owe nothing. And that's a problem for the developer, developers when you have a building that you have beautified the neighborhood and you have, have homeowners who have took care of their buildings and that is the building they want to take and steal. Um, I, it's been really tough because uh, they took me in uh, the, the slammer and uh, they held me for three hours and let me go. I didn't see, the, see a judge. All day, they came to my house three times uh, before that, trying to get me, get me out of there. I showed them my ID and my deed, but the third time they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, the third time now they got me out. Um, I am so sorry because when you have homeless homeowners, you have homeless tenants too. And I'm so sorry I couldn't help them. It's okay. Sorry. I'm so sorry the tenants have to suffer too. Because <laughs> they know if they took me out first with the deed, then they could take the tennis because now I'm separated from the house. And there's a, I'm so very sorry to say that happened to the tennis too. And now they want me to go into the homeless shelter when I worked so hard. I worked so hard. Seven days a week I worked. <laughs> to pay this, for my home. This issue is incredibly, <laughs> incredibly emotional. I understand that. I'd like for you to take some time with my <laughs> staff to see if she can be helpful. <laughs> they didn't tell me to go into a shelter after I paid all that money. I showed them my tax papers. So I showed them my 1040s that this is the house it has been paid for. I showed them everything and they just ignoring it. What, what borough are you in? Brooklyn. Okay. Flatbush, Flatlands area is where my home is. I walked back to home for, my, for me and my family. My father worked so hard. He's a senior citizen. Every order to show cause that I put into Supreme Court, they deny it, deny it, deny it, decline to sign it. And they have the sheriff, the sheriff, I'm sorry, the, the uh, marshal came into the house. So you said that the, the Brooklyn <laughs> District Attorney has your case? We, we uh, call him and they just look the other way. So now I have a criminal case for trespass. Mm -hmm. How could I trespass on my own property I paid for? I don't understand this. Let's, 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 um... But they made sure they separate me first because I had the proof of the deed and my ID who I am. Okay, let's, let's they separate me first and then they separated the tenants from the property. What I'd like to do is see how we can be helpful. I, and then I, I, I really look bad. I really appreciate your testimony and I can understand how emotional this must be for you and your father. Um, but if you can, my, my, my chief of staff is gonna take some time with you to see what we can do from this point going forward. Just give back the homeowners who pay for their home back. What is so hard about that? that what is we worked so hard for our property. We didn't, when you didn't want to, when they didn't want to come to our neighborhoods, when they had the crack valves and the needles all over the place and there was no flowers and there was just ashes in the properties. 
season. And in winter time, you see them uh, putting wood and, and fire for heat inside these homes that were abandoned. Nobody wanted to step in bed -Stuy. They didn't want to step in Flatbush. They didn't want Brooklyn. But now that we put all our sweat equity, all our money, all our interest into these buildings, into the property, put flowers and roses, yellow, blue, green, orange, outside. It looks so pretty. It's yummy for them to steal now. I'm tired. Give back these homeowners their homes. We pay taxes too. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Sir. Hello, my name is Kingsley Palmer. I'm going through the, the same scenario that she's going through. Okay. City Bank uh, bought a foreclosure against me. Okay, about uh, five five years ago. And during the process of them bought foreclosure, I got a paper that to show that they don't own the mortgage. I bought it and um, I showed it to the court. They didn't recognize none of that. And during the process, another company or, or mortgage company took it over. M, M something, uh, one second. Uh, M, L, M, Q. It's the same thing like um, Goldman Sachs or something like that. They took it over. And during the process of me going through back and forth with court, showing, you know, what's going on, they put my property up for sale and they said that they sold it or whatever. And when they, when, um, <clears throat> they sold it, I go the, um, I brought them back into the, um, to the Supreme Court with a harder to show cause, you know, me, you know, from the, from the civil court. And during the process of that, uh, civil court uh, get an order to evict me. So they evict me out of my, my house. They came and they arrest me, you know, for no, you know, for, for no apparent reason. You know what I mean? I have an order to show cause and a stay from Judge Deere, which I know that I don't want to say the word about him, but at least he gave, at least he gave me a stay. Even to this day, I still have a stay. I'm out of the house at this particular time. They put, they put up a open house sign on the door, right? I have pictures to show you on my phone, right? They took over the property and put a big sign. It's just nothing but disgrace. About six squad car came and arrested me. <laughs> and it's just, it's just been. Like we're prisoners. <laughs> yeah, prisoners. you know, be, I, I, I do construction. I, I, person? I do, I do construction. You know, you have up and down it's times. Crazy. You know I me mean? right now. You know I me. Mean? It's a, it's a little decent time. I'm working over uh, the Hudson Yard, and at the time I was going through the full course, uh, I was, you know, I was down on my luck, but. Uh, Modification, I try modification, that doesn't help. Nothing though, nothing don't really help. You know what I mean? Me and my wife, my wife knows she's just staying with friends and we, we, are, we are separated, you know what I mean? From, you know, from all of this going through back and forth and stuff like that. Because she work in Brooklyn, so. It's hard for a big bad to cry, but you know, it's kind of rough. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't imagine what the stress and anxiety is around the loss of a house, especially when it's through deed theft and or deed fraud. Um, I think that the, um, the next major hearing that we're going to have is around deed theft and deed fraud. Um, I, think that the, I think that the DA, um, who I've worked with around deed theft and deed fraud, um, we need to really collaborate. On, on that and lien sales. So I mentioned at the onset of the hearing that there are three things that are disproportionately affecting our communities as it relates to home ownership. One is the third party transfer program and that, that was today's hearing and we've heard some cases that you know were egregious and then there's deed theft and deed fraud and the uh, lien sale list. 
when you hear all of those, they sound the same when it's displacing homeowners and it's, it is absolutely a terrible scourge and it seems to be focused intentionally on minority communities, unfortunately. So while today's hearing was focused and centered around third party transfer, I am acutely aware of the disproportionately negative impact that deed theft is having and that, third part, that, and that the lien sale is having on displacing us from our properties. So I, I really want to say that I, I thank you for your testimony. I wish you didn't have to testify about these things. I know that tr uh, building wealth in this country is generally centered around, or the quickest way to doing that is through equity in your homes. And to be able to be separated from that is a traumatic and has a traumatic impact. Um, we are unfortunately coming to the end of this particular hearing. And your, your, your statements and testimonies are on the record and we're going to go back with this very apt staff and really review in the same way that we reviewed the third party transfer program uh, look at and give a thorough investigation to deed theft and deed fraud and the lien sale list and how its impact is in our communities they have an open house an open house and I, my all my stuff is there it's on the internet okay do you believe this is, is, the, um, is law enforcement allowing you to go back into the home to get your personal belongings? No, because I'm, I'm trespassing. Hmm? I'm, you know, I'm trespassing. They're homeless. They're homeless right now. Yes. And we, she has a criminal court. Because they're working, so, they're working with the so, cops to, 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 because they, you, you know, to, to, to un, get what they have to do. Un, unfortunately, in this particular hearing, it's a although I'm hearing it, organization. and I can understand the impact, we're un, I swear that we are unable the to LLC deal with that at this particular hearing, and I apologize for LLC. that. But I also understand the impact that it's having on yourself and your families. I really want to thank you for your testimony, and I can assure you that we will follow up Next with a subsequent hearing the that deals chains. directly with deed theft and deed fraud. <laughs> so thank you for your so testimony. You so for there's your nothing after this. this. <laughs> no, I said right we'll follow, we're going to absolutely follow up on what she's identified as deed theft and deed fraud and what he's identified as deed theft and deed fraud. He's homeless, she's homeless. I, this, is, We're in court. this hearing is about third party transfer, unfortunately. But this yeah, is a third party bank of assignment out of state. I, I, listen, this was a, this, let me explain how these hearings work so you understand. This was an oversight hearing to get to the nitty gritty. And what we've disclosed and understand today is that that program has not worked for certain homeowners. So the outcome of today's hearing was to really get an understanding of that program and whether it works or not. And we dissected that program in a way to see that there are parts of that program that absolutely don't work. And can I say this? We're all, we all have a satisfaction of a mortgage and we don't have any need. And the judges and the lawyers and the banks know how to play this game to still come at us. The and, same and way we had oversight closure. over third party transfer, we are going to do an oversight hearing over what you've just mentioned. When I'm saying that that just wasn't for today. I apologize. That, that? To, today's hearing, as it went out today, was focused and its intent was around third party transfer. That doesn't mean we don't care about what you're mentioning well, right I here didn't today. Say you don't, but the protection we leave in here, we still feel open and vulnerable. Because we don't did you, know. You where came we're today going. for third party transfer? This all correlates together. Did you come today for third party transfer? Yes, I did. And you're not satisfied with no, what I'm we've satisfied, disclosed? I'm satisfied, but I just need to know, leaving here today, because there, I was at the borough hall, leaving here today, Farrell, they did investigation, and we're still on our own. That's why. It's I, all connected. We're still on our own. It's when scary we leave here. So th because there is a mortgage level. issue, is anyone still here from Legal Aid Society? They don't do nothing. They, they don't do I, nothing. I have to use the tools at my disposal. I, uh, listen, listen, I understand that you have to be under tremendous stress and duress. And duress. I, unfortunately, in my powers are oversight over HPD and their third party transfer they program. They don't even contact you when you're on foreclosure. They don't even say. I want to make sure, I want to, I want to, I want to um, kind of temper what your expectations of today's hearing were. Now, I understand that you're passionate and your emotions are worthy of listening to, which we did today. Now we go back and assess what we heard today and plan a, court of a course of action that deals directly with that. I understand that you want immediate action to take place. Unfortunately, that's not what today's hearing was for. Today's hearing was to dissect that program and then regroup within our working group 
to make sure that this never happens to anybody else and to look at the in retrospect and begin to make some of the changes necessary. I'm sorry if your expectation that you would walk away. I wish that I could say something magical to make you feel better. That I, that I can't do today. But I will say that I have tremendous empathy for what yourself and your family and everybody that's testified here today. And I can assure you that I will take that same passion and go back and review this program, the third party transfer program, and begin to prepare some steps towards deed theft and deed fraud and the lien sale, which, which I, I'm not trying to separate. I'm just saying today's focus was on third party transfer. I just need somebody to really keep an eye right now with Judge Deere and that whole home that that's Myself and my state colleagues um, have had this conversation on several occasions. Down there. Please. Th thank you so much Please. for your testimony. And the referee lawyer. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Um, we have one, one last panel. I'd like to call Greg Whitman, mm -hmm. Simonis Harris, and Mr. T. Wright. I'm sorry? What's your name? Can you just do another one for me and I'll get you right up? Just make sure that you do it right now. No, just go. I want to, for the record, acknowledge uh, that my colleague Carmen Yeager has stayed this entire time, and I appreciate that. Yeah. You didn't have to Thank do you. that. You certainly can. So I'm going to ask you to remember to state your name in full before your testimony. Press the button when the red light illuminates. That means it is your time to speak. Uh, and we can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair Carnegie, Chair Yeager, General Counsel. Greg Waltman, uh, G1 Quantum Clean Energy Company, also specialized in, in other types of proprietary innovation. The heartfelt testimony today, T. It, it was just, you know, whether it be HPD, TPT, and, and these types of organizations, you know, it seems like TPT, they were, they were speaking a completely different language than the people that were testifying. And when you have that type of language barrier and no resources to address it, parsing down the Green New Deal scams and those narratives of wind farms to actually get the solar panels on the wall in the application and originating the contracts from New York become vital to restructuring the council's budgetary concerns as it pertains to legal aid, having the resources to address these issues. So I, I just wanted to, I know I'm, I'm parsing that all together there, but I've been on the other end of J.P. Morgan Chase and improperly formed bench trial monopolies, and I've seen how this all works. And, and for these people to suffer and to go through the hardship that they have, it, it just isn't appropriate. And obviously we have the capability to address it, and I remain steadfast in a promise to the council to execute on that obligation as it pertains to the solar wall and its reapplication. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is T. Wright. Um, my grandmother was 86 years old. She owned a house since 1959. Uh, it was a predatory lender that was basically stealing her mortgage payments, Fremont and Lytton. Um, there was a mortgage company, a broker by Platinum Mortgage, said that they would refinance and give us a seller, a buyer that would buy the house and then sell it back to us. Um, it became a class action lawsuit in which there were um, court orders made by Karen Smith. Um, Karen Smith appointed me the point person for the 63 other people that had their home stolen. Um, I got in contact with Eric Adams, Hakeem Jeffries, and Cameron Cameron, and they all gave me letters of support. 
Uh, because I was um, the, made the point person and advocated for the ones who had their homes stolen, my case was subsequently moved from the class action lawsuit and moved to Judge Milton Tingling for over seven years being adjourned. After I put in for 50 million judicial relief to the administrative judge, um, Judge um, Milton Tingling was then made a county clerk and the case was transferred again. This case has went from 111 Street, um, 80 Center Street, 60 Center Street, back to 80 Center Street, back to 60 Center Street, 360 Adams, 141 Livingston Street, and before 17 judges in which there are court orders in which they are violating. I had to in turn put into foreclosure on the bankruptcy court in order to stop the mortgage fraud case. There's uh, court orders that are final judgments against the straw buyer, Ledu Mandana, and also all the banks involved. The Department of Justice arrested the, the um, lawyer that they gave my grandmother. The Department of Justice arrested the broker that they gave my grandmother. Also, when the straw buyer sold my house in 2014, I made the Department of Justice aware in which they said that all of the straw buyers, including Ledu Mandana, was supposed to be arrested by the DA's office, but was not, and asked me to go to the um, Kenneth Thompson, Kenneth Thompson would have them, these people arrested. Went to Kenneth Thompson. Mr. Farrell, uh, the DA, was going to do a joint investigation with the Manhattan attorney, uh, but I haven't heard from him since 2015. Um, it's, it's just funny that Judge Deere um, did not give uh, the man a stay. The lady was arrested and taken out of her home. They tried to arrest me as well, but through the grace of God, people seen what was going on and intervened and stopped it. Um, this art, there's an Article 64 to take people's homes, which is of the um, black people's homes of foreclosure. It's very ironic that all Judge Deere, foreclosure, the, all these, and the law that they just put out, S1688S, deals with deed theft, and that's with Eric Adams, Miss Montgomery's, and um, Tremaine Wright, same last name as mine. So I was just wondering, when you go to court and your case is adjourned for seven years, and you go to court and you have judgments against the mortgage companies. You have foreclosures against the straw buyer, but yet they still give them court orders and illegally evicted me out of my home. I've been fighting since 2005. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother died behind this mortgage fraud. Under conspiracy law, if a person dies behind a conspiracy, the people involved can be put to death, and that's by law. I don't know where, where can you go? I went to the mayor department, the mayor knows about this, deputy commissioner, attorney general, DA's office, Jamani. I went all over, even as you go to um, the more, the, where they give you a pro bono lawyer. He was a lawyer for 10 years doing real estate on Friday. On Monday, he's a criminal lawyer, he can't take my case. I paid a lawyer in the beginning of this to take care of the case, he dropped the case. I had to put in motions myself from 2007 till now. And even with court orders against them, even with foreclosures against them, even with the FBI and the Department of Justice arresting people, and I have these orders, and I have these FBI paperwork and Department of Justice, and presented them in court, and nothing happened. But what does happen is the opposing side gets an illegal eviction to evict me out of my home. Bankruptcy court, done that too. Every court you can name in New York City, I've been there for over 14 years. And yes, it's a, a conspiracy. These, all these entities work together. The banks, the lawyers, the judges, they're all complicit in this. It's completely obvious and simple. If you have paperwork showing that people are doing corruption, why would the judges allow them to get court orders in their name? If you have a $1.5 million house and somebody's coming at your house and they don't have any rights to it, why do you think they're coming? Because it's worth $1.5 million, point blank period. It's all about money, period. TPT, third party transfer, nah. That's third party theft. That's what it is. It's out to steal black people's homes, period. It's not to help anybody. Who is it helping? The investors. How can the investors could get all these different loans, but the homeowners can't? Why is um, HUD giving these people all these preferential documentations and all these contracts to just one certain person without any bids? It's obvious. It's obvious. I would like to get my docket numbers ranging back from 2005, 
the Wait, department. Did you, did you submit that to me? Yes, I submitted that. So you don't have you don't have to read okay. them out loud. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for you. your testimony. Yes, um, I am the, uh, my name is Simonas Harris. I am the property owner of 1782 Nostrand Avenue since 1997 to present. And I will say present because nobody will get my home. I refinanced the property with Flushing Savings Bank in 2004. And, and, um, And I had this loan with Flushing for over 10 years, and I was never in arrears. Then after Hurricane Sandy, I was never in arrears, so Hurricane Sandy came and gave them a good reason to try and scam me. So after Hurricane Sandy, I was hounded by Flushing Savings Bank. Flushing Savings Bank started hounding me and telling me that um, they are offering deferred payments to all their clients and they're offering them two months to a year. I told them I didn't want it, but they, never, they would never leave me. I couldn't understand why. My mom was sick in Canada, and I wanted to go off. So I said, I don't want them making any problems when I'm away. So I took two months. That was a big mistake. They gave me an agreement that I was supposed to pay the two months divided into six parts over a period of six months, one-sixth of the two months on each month. But automatically or, or willfully, they never put the amount to be paid. How much the monthly payment was, was never included in the agreement. So I tried to call the bank. I thought I was really scammed. I could never find the person who gave me the agreement. We have it in writing, it's notarized and everything. I could not find that person. I'm not even going for my script because I'm trying to cut short. Okay, finally, after three months, I started making time and a half what I usually make because I don't want to get messed up now. Because I'm figuring, let me make extra payment so that when I find this person or this person surface, resurface, I will have good money there to cover extra months. Okay, this person resurfaced after three months, and he sent me an email stating that, Ms. Harris, you are in current standing with your new agreement, and you have three payments left. That's three out of the six. I felt very good. Then he disappeared again. Couldn't find him, and nobody in the bank, no matter how many calls you make and who you talk to, nobody seemed to know anything about this agreement, nobody but my property was marked to be taken. And they were gonna use Hurricane Sandy. They are not HUD, but they're gonna use Hurricane Sandy to offer me an agreement because I was never in arrears, had nothing in arrears that they could get me for, so they, they plot this one. And everybody on my block right now, most of them, their buildings are gone. I am standing because I've been fighting. I started out with attorneys, and they said, oh, you have overwhelming evidence. This is one, two, three. Then I noticed they're holding hands and they're going for lunch with the attorney representing the bank. And then cold water was thrown on my case. So I had to dismiss several of them. Okay, I continued until um, they, they now, um, we went into court. They did pre-foreclosure, illegal pre-foreclosure. And before that, I went to the bank and uh, I spoke with the head person there, and he told me that he was going to look into my case because he couldn't understand why I paid so much money and I'm facing foreclosure. And he was very happy that we came and we did not behave bad or anything like that. Then I got scared because that mean a lot of other people had been coming there and cursing them out for the same thing. So I was really scared then. He said he would look into my case and he would correct it and get back to me. And the person who offered me the agreement was not there. He said he made a lot of mistake on other people's mortgages and he's not there anymore. And that is Christopher Rowe. And the main one, um, Thomas Ravert, he is the main person who was in charge. After that meeting, but at the meeting where I had a witness and he brought his secretary inside the meeting room, he was only interested 
to tell me how much equity is in my property and that I need to sell because I have a lot of equity and he could provide me with good buyers. I said, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I've been using my property to help my community, to help my college mates with their children so that they don't leave them into corners or with people who cannot take care of them and they get killed, so they brought them to me. So um, after that, they, they, they pre foreclosure so they had me in court, went into court. The judge said, I don't see Miss Harris overpaid her mortgage, so why is she here? I see where she made extra payments and she have a lot of money down. Anyway, that she set um, a mediation meeting. I got a call from the mediation meeting while the bank and everybody was already there. Even though the judge said I was to make sure I was there and I kept calling the mediator, he never responded to me. But they made a meeting and they met with the bank behind my back. So I, you know, I made sure that we had another meet, we had another arrangement for another meeting. So I was at that meeting. At that meeting, they came with a new and a doctored agreement. This agreement is not for two months to be paid over a period of six months. This agreement was an agreement that you wouldn't pay for July and August, but you'd start paying September. But what they did when they got the payments, they didn't have a deferral because they placed payment in July, August, September. So you know that something is going to be wrong right there. Because the two months that should have been blank, they filled them in with payments. And they are getting all this extra money. And every month they had me um, with collections. So I couldn't understand what is happening. But anyway, I made the payments and uh, went to mediation. And they brought a new agreement for three months to be paid back over a period of 12 months. Now they got caught right there because they had, now they had merged the first agreement with the second agreement, the doctored agreement, and they signed for me. So I went ahead and one ex-judge told me to get a certified CPA accountant to go through, and we did that. And we did the forensics, so everything came back where I never owed them any money on the first agreement which I signed. The second I knew nothing of, I didn't owe them on anything on that either. So they went in, but people with money and power, they do what they have to do. So, um, so after that, they, um, one moment, the, the, the mediation meeting where they said they would let me pay up the extra money for the months that were missed, that came to naught. Never heard anything of it after that. And they finally met with the judge and they used their power and their money and they foreclosed on me for $891.19. And I had even offered to pay them off the whole mortgage. They wouldn't accept it because I have equity in my property and I am not worthy to have my property, so I must sell it. Sell it because that was their aim. And I would not, so they decided to punish me. So I had another property with um, Flushing Bank and they just went ahead and started doing some bogus business on that property also that was not in arrears. So they sent me a payment um, and a, a letter that that property also um, owed water and so. Now, whether they used the people to mess that up, I don't know, but when I called the EP, they found that there was a leak. So the person in the restaurant, his bill was huge, so he had stopped making the payments. Because we had made an agreement so he would make the payments, because I wasn't on that location. Okay. So I, paid this, I asked them to escrow the payments over a year. They wouldn't. They demanded three payments. So I paid them for the couple months now that that property was in arrears. And I paid them all the water bill, 43000 in total. And they got all of it. They never showed us how they escrowed it, how they worked it out. We never got anything. They still had me in foreclosure. And without getting foreclosure, they foreclosed. They changed my deed. I'm not worried about that because I know I must get that back. I'm not even worried about that. I'm going to move on because after that, with the first property, 1782, 
I got an, um, a friend of mine said, I lost my daughter. And she left a four-year-old little girl very traumatized because she witnessed the murder. And meanwhile, I was grieving. Everybody came to scam me. I can write books. I can call names. I have all my record. I silently, in my grief, made sure I document everything and collected everything. So um, this person um, called herself a pastor, but I realized after putting the chips together that this person is also a criminal. Took me to this attorney, Audrey A. Thomas, and she was supposed to file a lawsuit against Flushing Bank for the fraud and forgery and all the wrongdoings and as a predatory lender, and she didn't do that. She waited, let us believe she was filing the lawsuit. She waited until the last moment she um, put me in bankruptcy. She knew nothing about bankruptcy or how to file bankruptcy. I picked that up so clearly right there. And, um, and guess what she did? But one property, because I had some properties under my name, I helped other people to get properties. I had family properties. They didn't move them from under me because they know I would never take a dollar. I would prefer to give them one or two. So they trusted me, and that has been helping me up to now. So this attorney, she did not file the lawsuit. She put me in bankruptcy. She had a great, massive plan. And oh, wow, it was going to hang her high like Naaman and the gallows. OK, so she, the property wow. she wanted now, which is a double property with a church, church hall. We just borrowed thousands and renovated this property. She didn't put that one in the bankruptcy. I'm grieving now. Sometimes I'm just crying without even knowing that I'm crying. Because Wait, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to follow you, but is this yes. a th is the second property a third party transfer property or is it the deed flushing deed? now have changed the deed um, with referees deed because they got the interim and I realized what was happening they didn't know I didn't expose my knowledge so they didn't know that I was sensible or anything like that they're going to take this woman's properties so I I watched them do what they had to do but I warned them so they went ahead and they used referees deed and changed the two properties on the flushing. And I had cop prop so they wanted everything. Cause here it is, this woman have these properties and they're gonna take them. So um I, I don't wanna rush you, but we have a few more people. Now I just want to get to this part because I have something coming up this week which I want you all to know. Um so she moved into that property, she broke the locks. The night she was moving into my property, she had me in her office until like we in the morning hours, making excuses. And we saw, I saw my life flash before me because there were young guys who were supposed to kill us, myself, Harry, and my little four-year-old granddaughter who just lost her mom, who was grieving and she's still traumatized. I have to be running to the doctor, to the therapy, everything. And she had us in her office all that night and we're there waiting on her because we're not thinking people so crazy to do these things. And we got home. But when I, I said, my God, you saved my life tonight. Okay. She moved in. She broke the locks. She had us in the office so we would not be in Brooklyn. We would be in Queens at her office so that when she have her staff moving her stuff because she was being evicted from one office and from where she was living, she had no clients because she had been scamming a lot of people. But I didn't know that, and I don't think the lady who took me to her knew that. So she broke and entered the, another property now on Rogers Avenue and took it over. When the police came after, her daughters told them that she rented the upstairs. And the police came and said, okay, lock off the first floor and the basement. She made herself a 20 years lease with phantom names on it. And the worst part about it, which really hurt, and I don't want to start crying today because it had been hurting for a long, long time. We went to the attorney general, we were sent because crimes were committed, and they said, take it to the DA's office. And lo and behold, the very person assigned to the case was the one working with this woman. She was their tattletale for the DA's office. Mm -hmm. And they were helping her. So I couldn't get any justice there because they had the 20 years lease from day one, which I could not see. I got a glimpse of it 
from the grievance committee and realized that this woman made her company, strength of a woman, the owner. So when we filed paper in landlord and tenant court, because we got no justice there, even though they're doing drugs, the woman is sleeping in my bed, all my belongings are in this building, my business let, let, let me ask you. Let me ask you, outside of uh, a very heart-wrenching testimony, is there something that you think from a city council perspective and from a committee of housing and buildings perspective that I can do? Yes. I, can I, can she answer, please? Yes. yes, but I just want to give this last piece. I'm finishing right now because I'm cutting it real short. I have this attorney on Thursday to be evicted. We got eviction in the courts in one month because it was so clear that the person's name who she put on her 20 years lease with not a penny in rent or mortgage or anything, sleeping in my bed, using my fridge, my everything, using my hall for catering and for everything, she did not even do her research and get a right name on it. We have our corporation papers. I have my deed. And she's telling them because she's an attorney who uses her power and authority that she's the owner. And my case would come to nothing. This is the part. My case would come to nothing because she knew people like Trump in high positions and in our, with authority. And my case would come to, I said, no, watch me. And um, so, Michael Spanakos is the main one who has been defending her. Everybody would have helped me a long time and clear all these up because she has tainted all my property. What she was doing was under the table. Allegedly, she boasts about it. These are her words. Taking money from the banks on my properties and selling me out. So I was supposed to lose everything. And she told me, you're going to lose everything and you have a lot to lose if you don't work with me. Let me stay in tell, your place. Tell me, tell me how I can help you. <laughs> And uh, uh, there are so many angles. There are so many angles. So let me do this. In the interest of time, I will meet with you at the end of this, and we'll figure out how I can be helpful. But, but the, the best part, one last word. She'll I, be evicted I don't want you to give Thursday. one last word, because there are several yes. other people who'd like to speak. She'll be evicted this Thursday. And Thank she you. has been this. Uh, Thank you for I'm, your testimony. I didn't get the final if she's disbarred. I'm going to get a final yes. with you later. OK. Thank you. Good, good evening. Good evening. Well, uh, he didn't pick up my notice for the city council testimony. So my name is Tio Chino. I'm a third resident, uh, third generation resident at 640 Riverside Drive. 640 and 640 Riverside Drive are HPD, UHAB, poster boy building for the TPT program since 2000. We are on their literature up there saying, look at the success of the TPT program. 640 and 640 Riverside Drive are it. We entered the TPT program in 2003. Uh, our building is 32BJ, our super live on premises. We're very good to our employee. And from 2003 to 2019, I was on the tenant association board. My task was to comb through the monthly management report. So on my, in my packet here, you will find a summary of the management report from 2000 to about 2017. Uh, getting those monthly reports from UHAB was a pain. They were supposed to send it to us on a monthly basis. Basically, I had to beg for them to send them to us. And they would come in every six months in batches of six or seven, if I was lucky. Our sponsor, you have, has used every trick on the book to hide their incompetence. The tenants are too difficult. The tenants are not cohesive. The tenants are not united. The tenants are not listening. That's what we've been hearing for 16 years. We have been blamed for everything. Yes, we are challenging, but not unreasonable. Every time they came with a new proposal, we looked at it, we debated, we discussed it, and we gave them answer. The one they didn't like, they ignored it. For 30 years before you have came into the picture, we have lived and band together to make the best of our community. You heard many tenants here who had the same similar story throughout New York. Three minutes is really too short to go over 17 years worth of lie. So this is about HPD and the total lack of women Low, total lack of oversight over the TPT program. So we approach our councilman, Mark Levine, when he took office on the first day. I mean, we have to thank Robert Jackson for his help. So we went to Mark Levine. We had all the detail. And he knew exactly what the situation was with HPD, but has done nothing but lip service. He should have known that something was amiss with HPD and could have launched this investigation long time ago, four, five, six years ago. 
I even went to Councilman Torres when I met him in the street outside the Alexandria Ocasio event. And I told him, I need your help because we have a problem with HPD. Instead, of, instead he took HPD literally stealing building from rifle owner to have something happen today. We are here because peop, HPD went as far as stealing building. We were not, we're not in that case. We have good things to say about TPT, but I will skip it because, well. In July 2018, the lack of oversight was so blatant, was so blatantly apparent because we notify our sponsor and HPD that one of the board member and previous president was renting his unit on Airbnb and paying and nothing happened. He was paying for a house in Connecticut and he's still in the building as a, la as a rightful land uh, tenant. Our sponsor claimed that we were losing money. However, the management report does not show that. Either UHAB was giving us false management report, or UHAB is unable to decipher their own statement. Either way, they're lying. It's true that in 2003, we were burning about $20,000 a month in, the, in cash, and the rent collection did not enable us to manage the building effectively. This is not due because of the rent roll, but simply because we were in various rent strike. You have an HPD always refuse to sit down and go over the line item of those maintenance report. They always claim that the building was losing money through the report. In 2013, 640 Riverside Drive Tenant Association sent 41 questions to HPD. You have them in the packet. We're still waiting for an answer. That was, uh, no, 2018, I'm sorry. On June 15, 2018, the tenant got together and sent them 41 questions where they gave us about less than two weeks to get together. So that was one. How many hardworking New Yorkers have invested in HDFC apartment coming out of the TPT program and have lost their investment? We heard it today. How many of those buildings are in forced closure today and returning to the TPT program? If city council is generally want to investigate the TPT program, I am available to lead or participate in any investigating committee the council would like to form to answer those questions. The link of all the document is available on my Twitter feed, at Tio Chino. I'm available to take any question, but that is, so I only have one councilman in front of me, Mr. Corky. <laughs> yes, I think. So if you have any question on my knowledge. I, 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 I don't have any questions for this hearing, but I would like to sit with you going forward to see if we can, uh, listen, it's, it's my only goal is to make sure that both homeowners and tenants are protected under the third party transfer program and it's not disproportionately a program that transfers home ownership arbitrarily to, to tenancy, right? Uh, we so, agree. So and I we, mean, Delwood was our, our, our contractor. Now we have MDG, our contractor, who came up seven years ago saying we were going to do some work a certain way. And now it's like a complete change of, change of scope of work. We said, uh, oh, we're, oh, it's a beautiful building. We're not going to do a shit rock. We're not going to do sprinkler. We're going to do this and that according to the rule. And now it's like everything has been shit rock. They wanted to get us to do a, a sprinkler system. I know it's a controversial one, but the idea was the discussion was one way. And uh, Nelson here was part of those discussion. And I have to say, they have been there. HPD has been there, but they have never been listening. That's what I have to say. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Annie Wilson, and uh, I'm speaking on uh, a parallel with the third-party transfer that involves an HPD building. You have, unfortunately, has uh, failed their mission. I had uh, been a tenant organizer that led the building to becoming a part of the You Have program along with other buildings as part of an 11 building parcel in 2002. I've been residing there since 1984. And uh, I was looking forward to the renovation of the building. Given that of the 11 buildings, this building had the least amount of work to be done, around $160,000 in the scope of work, and then around 100,000 in the weatherization program. Well, to fast forward, there's been $6 million spent on the renovation. In the past two years, the building was flipped into a third-party transfer, but not as of the HPD program, but into the inclusionary zoning program. And uh, a developer was selected without a bidding process, and uh, our building had been 
uh, once the most viable of all the pro all the buildings in the program. I and there was a fire in 2004. <clears throat> you have kept the insurance money, and there was an enormous amount of decay in the building and disruption with the Tenants Association uh, by the activities by UHAB and their preference for you know, a particular family. Um, so unfortunately, I have to say that I do believe that they promoted as much deterioration as possible to benefit from whatever their percentage is, from whatever loan and so forth. So come 2014, 2015, with the vacate order that our tenants union had corrected the violation towards, uh, you have refused to process the removal vacate order as owner sponsor. And that is when we were told, oh, well, you have these debts coming in now. Uh, we're going to like have to foreclose on the building. But we have this developer who's going to come in, save the day, renovate everything. You all go back. Hey, I was the first person to sign and uh, moved to a relocation apartment. Two years later, so we're looking at 2016, uh-oh, problem. Uh, we've moved these residents all around up here. We've taken your equity. We took a $960,000 loan without stakeholder consent. Oh, really? Called up HPD, Kim Darga, how can you do this? No notice, no, um, no consent, $960,000 in addition to $5 million on this so-called uh, inclusionary zoning program? Well, okay. I don't think that should be allowed. And I could go on and on, but the point is, at this stage, you have is suing me. And um, I had refused to return under the existing conditions, under the type of renovation they had completed, and the lack of security system as per the scope. And of course, there's the equity issues. So we went into negotiation to get a fair arrangement, which included possibly going to another place and I accepted their arrangements. There were two arrangements last year I had accepted, but they took off the table. And then I worked with the developer and said, well, can we just put in the security system? You know, maybe I'll just go back. And uh, that system has not been installed, and you have began to sue me in December. I've had my fifth hearing on Friday, and uh, I've got flipped to the, uh, to the, the trial part. Uh, you have lawyers at each hearing have been different lawyers that mislead the judge. And in this case, they claimed that they had um, received in the morning a agreement. So I asked to see this agreement. I couldn't see it. Why? Well, because all parties had not approved. Well, am I not a party to this? Well, I'd like to see this agreement. Anyway, the judge was kind of frustrated with having been there already in his part as many times as we had. He flipped it to the next part. And at this stage, I'm. Uh, as for my neighbors, I want to say that my immediate neighbor quit. My neighbor across the hall passed away in, during the negotiations. Um, when we talk about racism and the loss of equity in this building in particular, there were four individuals, uh, three were men of color that lost their equity. And um, I feel like you have has really deceived me. I feel like they've been extremely cruel. And I hope that they'll understand that they need to come up with a fair arrangement. Um, keep to their word, and uh, I feel extremely harassed. I've been extremely depressed. I've, I'm asthmatic. I've wound up in a hospital. I mean, I can't tell you. Um, this is the only place I had. And uh, I am willing to participate in any type of investigation. I have all my documents. I've kept everything in its semi-order, except for all the, some of the recordings. I mean, they're in completely, you know, all the hard documents I can provide to you. And I'd be very happy to help sketch uh, some kind of policy whereby there is oversight, where there is accountability. When there's a problem, the residents can go somewhere. So we can solve the problems immediately before they become larger problems. And uh, I'll leave it at that for now. There are probably other details I wanted to touch on. I did talk about the no bidding. Um, I guess I did cover pretty much all I wanted to say, and I hope you'll want to work with me towards making sure no one ever has to go through anything like this again. Thank well, you. as I mentioned, that is clearly my goal and the goal of this committee. Um, I, I'm very sorry for what you've had to experience through this process. Yeah. Um, but I will say to you that the information that you've given to me and Tino has given to me on the, on the, on the developer portion of this uh, is, is great insight. And I think that that's something that we're going to take back and really look at 
oversight over uh, the developers who are a part of the, the, these programs that have demonstrated uh, incomplete work, no work at all, uh, with, with, with tremendous loans taken out. Quite frankly, this is not, that's not the first time I heard this as part of the third party transfer, or it was part of the HT, HDFC uh, process. Um, and it's, it's incredibly disturbing when we talk about the amount of money that's being leveraged yeah. to bring things up to a livable standard mm -hmm. and not meeting that. So there's certainly something we can do from a council perspective to ensure that, that, you know, that, that people, are, that developers are doing that. And, I, and I have my commitment to do that. My, my colleague had to step out, but I'm sure he would give his commitment from uh, the oversight perspective. Sir, there's a little well. detail I wanted to add looking at my notes, if you'll let me. Um, with regard to the sales of the units, now that the building has been put into a transition HDFC governance made of UHAB employees, the four units that were sold, and this information um, was disclosed because an elected uh, had managed to get the accounting a couple of months ago uh, for the operation of the building that I had requested so that I could make a better decision. And as it turns out, the four units totaling $435,087 is not accounted for in the uh, operating uh, spreadsheet for the building. And I have since found that you have kept that money. I do not think that should be allowed, whereby there is a program whereby the so-called sponsor developer can actually keep the money from the sales that could have been part of the payback for the $960,000 loan. And um, the sister building in this program on 10th Street, I hear they did the same thing. And I think I really had to tell you that. And uh, that there had been also a, cons a contract between the um, inclusionary zoning developer and UHAB. And when I had met um, the staff at the uh, Letitia Jane's office when she was the public advocate, they could not get that contract. Now there's some litigation by a couple that were illegally evicted by UHAB and that particular family, in this case it's the Dawson family that were given all these units. And um, there was a release of that document, the contract between UHAB and the inclusionary zoning developer that uh, at, in fact shows that there was a, an amount of $845,000 and 43 that went to UHAB from BNN. That contract was October 1st, 2015. So I couldn't get it. Now it's been disclosed. And those are the details I forgot to tell you. So thank you. No, thank you for that. So we have uh, one last testimony. Um, okay. uh, thank you for being here today. <laughs> My name is Reverend Dr. Michael Strong, and, and that, you know, there's a lot been said about a lot of things going on in our communities that are very, very disheartening to the people that live there. And I have some tips here that I passed on regarding some evidence that big banks are, you know, being, uh, their foreclosures are illegal because of their giving, uh, loans and ownership of enforcement of interest, that the modifications are not valid, and the creditors is sealed because the loans, the money that they've given, there's no names on them. And uh, these are being done constantly. Probably not just, I have it here about Kings County, but it's probably not just in Kings County, but you know, many parts of the city that these foreclosures uh, you know, are happening to homeowners. And, you know, I really appreciate what I've heard today, what you've done with many committee members here today. And I'm, I'm definitely want to get involved with any uh, committees that are developed to help change these circumstances because they are really devastating and heartbreaking to many of our residents throughout the city of New York. And I thank you and I commend you and all your other for doing what you're doing. Uh, thank you. So I, I want to just say that this was a, a long hearing, but I think it was well worth it to, to attempt to hear from, the, from everyone that we possibly could and get a better understanding of how HDFCs are working in lieu of actually coming out to every single HDFC. Uh, this allows for us not to make that trek, but to hear. So I'd like to thank 
the coalition members that stayed. I'd like to thank all of the thank all the advocates, people who are working on the ground to ensure that the quality of life is above standard for people who've chosen HDFCs as a, as a way of life. Um, this hearing demonstrates uh, the city's need to do better. Um, I hope that's what we illustrated with our, in, uh, uh, I didn't want to say interrogation, but <laughs> with our questioning of HPD. Um, this is not one of those kind of hearings where we did that and we're going to walk away, we're going to go back. I worked with uh, the Office of Investigation, which was a, a grueling process. And as you can see, we were incredibly prepared to, to address the way that HPD has operated, especially around the third party transfer program. You have my commitment and the commitment from my colleague to go forward and make this right. So we didn't have the need to be right today. We had the need to make things right. right. And that's what we committed to going forward. So thank you all for coming. Um, unfortunately, I had planned to stay around for a little while, but it's gotten so late. I have another commitment, so I have to run out. That's not a testament to the fact that I'm not committed to making sure uh, that the quality of life of, of residents in HDFCs is above standard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is the part where I say this hearing is adjourned. I, I gotta run, I'm sorry.